Okay, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> and welcome to our afternoon session of the Responsibility to Protect in Theory and Practice Conference. I hope you can all hear me. <clears throat> For this session, I've noticed that quite a few people have switched to uh, Gathertown to participate in this session, which is great. So hello to all of you who are now over in Gathertown. Um, and there are some on YouTube as well. Um, this session is on the conceptual challenges and theoretical boundaries of the responsibility to protect. And our panel chair today is Kate Ferguson, co-executive director and head of research and policy at Protection Approaches. We are very thankful for her chairing our session today. I just want to mention one quick thing, um, and that is the uh, program says that we have Kai, Michael Kenkel and Christina Stefan um, as part of the programme today, but unfortunately for personal reasons they've had to withdraw and so they will not be participating in the conference um, today. So, I will hand over to Kate Ferguson to introduce the panel and to get us started. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Can you see me? I can hear you. Um, no. I, I can. I can see you now. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. I have no idea if anyone can. Yeah, we can hear you and see you. All good. Um, pleasure it is to. Um, chair this panel and participate in um, in this conference. Um, lovely to see your faces. Oh, I'm sorry. I wish very much we were all together. Uh, um, but yeah, what a treat to kind of hear you all over the last day or so. Um, for those of you that don't know me, Kate Ferguson, and um, and did you just introduce me, Patrick? I couldn't. I did introduce you briefly, yeah. Because my um, um, connection here has been. <clears throat> yeah, we are having a few audio issues this afternoon, so I'm very much hoping that it's going to be. Um, thing itself. But we are here to talk about my favourite topic, <laughs> which is the conceptual challenges <laughs> um, and theoretical boundaries, um, wherever they may lie, on the responsibility to protect. And we've got a fantastic panel here, Oliver and Marie, it's lovely. Um, Yeah, so sorry, Kate. We lost you for a very yeah, we lost you for a very quick second there. Um, Who else might be? Um, <laughs> I hate <laughs> online talking. The joys of virtual conferences, <laughs> it's it, isn't it? <laughs> but then I think you answered a question that I asked that five minutes ago. So we're going to go from the order on the panel sheet. So first of all, we've got Chloe. <laughs> no, I can't wait till we're, we're, we're together again and it's just normal. Um, okay, so I was just going to run through um, who's doing what. We're going to have Chloe, who finished her PhD in York in 2019. She's going to be talking about R2P and we are laughing like this. <laughs> I might just stop talking and just hand over to Chloe and see if my connection gets better and then we can go from there and then I'll introduce the rest of you as and when. Please keep your remarks to 15 minutes because um, it would be fantastic if we're able to have really um, lovely conversations and question and answer. So Chloe, hopefully your signal is behaving far better than Martin seems to be. <laughs> okay, thanks Kate. Hopefully if the screen is yours. 
Thank you. I was a bit premature there. Um, can everyone hear me all right, Patrick? Am I okay? Yes, you're fine. You're fine. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, that was good. You warmed up the room, Kate, so thanks for that. Um, so hello and thank you for having me contribute to this fantastic group of scholars and practitioners and otherwise what I would say genius and caring people since we all work on human protection. Um, this presentation is actually based now on two different draft articles I'm working on. So when I submitted my abstract for the conference, for this conference, it was one article, a bit too much in one article. So one is on how UNHCR understands R2P and the extent to which it uses the norm as leverage in terms of its advocacy for states to accept more refugees. Um, and the other is about how R2P um, has been internalized or not in the UK, but particularly in this article through the Home Office. So I'm just concentrating on the Home Office because that is the department working directly on protection of refugees and in the Syrian context, those refugees that are fleeing mass atrocities. Okay, so essentially this is a story about how two international protection norms, R2P and the resettlement norm within international refugee law, how those two protection norms interact and link in theory and practice. So though the second paper on the Home Office takes a broader view in terms of including asylum, since there's a lot of hot topic news right now um, in terms of the UK's um, introduced new, at least new in writing policy um, on asylum, um, that will be a broader article in terms of incorporating the UK's obligations under refugee law as well as under R2P. So there is a necessary component before we get to the two actual case studies that I'm actually here to discuss today. Um, and that's just the theory aspect. Um, <laughs> how R2P and refugees and their protection link together. This was initially explored in an article I did for GR2P in 2017, but since then I had finished the PhD and there was a lot more information um, to put out. So I've built upon the theories further in this article. So what's really important is that the relationship between the theory on how these norms link and the empirical case study of how these norms link in actual practice. So it's between the theory and the practice that is very important. So basically there are critical conceptual gaps in linking the two norms in theory, yet that is not necessarily the reason why the link is not made in practice, which would have sufficed as a pretty justifiable reason, um, at least on paper. But that is not entirely the case, which reveals how we need to further consider the limits um, on pushback against international human rights based norms. So the overall point is that the empirical case study can reveal a lot more about a norm's actual health and trajectory than theory alone. And obviously no one's arguing that that isn't the case, but this goes to a criticism in the constructivist literature um, that there have been too few rigorous empirical studies to support the theories, right? And evidence that internalization um, of norms. And I would also posit that there are a few empirical case studies that look at norm compliance from a critical constructivist lens in liberal states, and least of all in powerful liberal states. So those states sitting as permanent members of the UN Security Council tasked with maintaining international peace and security. Mm -hmm. There are three or four that I can think of offhand. Um, one on the US and the Convention Against Torture by Sakink, um, another on, on the kind of identity of UK, France, and Germany by Brockheimer, Kurtz, and Jung, and and then uh, one uh, that Ralph uh, Jason does on uh, UK pragmatic constructivism, along with one of my favorite articles that I use a lot from Jason and Jess on um, the UK uh, and Syria, the resolutions, decision making and the UK is a pen holder. Um, so this research is building on those case studies. So the case study that I've used doesn't only add to those few cases, but it brings to light additional necessary considerations about norm health and measuring the overall limits of contestation to a norm before that norm may begin to degenerate. Okay, so in 2013, Ban Ki-moon, we all know, stated that Syria had become the biggest peace and security challenge in the world. Um, we know the conflict began in March 2011, and by 2018, over almost half a million had died, while over 12 million people, more than half of Syria's total population, had been displaced, either within Syria or abroad. Now, while states proximate to Syria have been hosting approximately 71% of the total 7 million Syrian refugees, European countries have been hosting approximately 14 
14% combined, with Germany and Sweden accepting the most. Now, the fact that wealthy European states had avoided and continue to avoid sharing a proportionate number of Syrian refugees fueled criticism, particularly that European states were not committed to their responsibility to protect in practice. But that statement required deeper understanding about how RTP links to refugee protection in theory and practice, which was one of the central questions answered in the original research that's now discussed and built upon in these articles. So the existing scholarship largely focuses on how RTP and refugees link in theory from a normative perspective, but this does not answer why the link is not made in practice. So the broader research aimed to evaluate how the RTP framework influenced resettlement in the UK and advocacy by UNHCR for states to increase resettlement of Syrian refugees during the key time period of 2014 to 2016. Now that period was key because it covers the peak in the European refugee crisis, but it also marks a time when the UK's resettlement policies underwent the most change and in fact increased and um, and expanded. So the research first undertook a critical analysis of the theoretical link between RTP and refugees because it underpins the empirical case. Um, and this is because the analysis revealed those critical conceptual gaps between the two frameworks that would provide a rationale for the link to be avoided in practice. Um, and second, the empirical phase of the research included a discourse analysis of official statements followed by interviews with elites in order to answer how the UK is using resettlement of Syrian refugees as a method of discharging its responsibility to protect populations from mass atrocities in Syria. So the idea was to somehow get at what motivated the resettlement programs, what sources of responsibility were relied on um, that prompted those uh, programs. Now, UNHCR advocates to states to share responsibility for Syrian refugees. So how that organization relies on R2P as a tool of advocacy is part of the inquiry to understanding the link between the two in practice and understanding what sources of responsibility they rely on or avoid um, for implementation or leveraging that commitment to refugees um, gives you know, deeper insight around the kind of contestation that R2P continues to face. And then also potentially information on its overall normative trajectory, um, and including, unfortunately, um, uh, quite a, a real risk of degeneration. Um, and that's because the reasons for avoiding the link, either due to the real conceptual gaps or maybe for political reasons, um, are going to potentially inform that norm's health from a life cycle point of view. Okay, so the impasse over the use of force in Syria and the fact that R2P requires states to use appropriate diplomatic, humanitarian and other peaceful means to help protect populations from mass atrocities ignited this consideration of alternative responses in Syria during that refugee crisis in 2015. So um, humanitarian and other peaceful means are catch-all phrases for discharging such state responsibilities. They're very useful when there's no international consensus on, on action, um, as we've seen, so states can do these on their own and in cooperation with other states. So until the refugee crisis, R2P and the international refugee protection regime were mostly seen as separate protection frameworks for two obvious reasons. R2P is about protection from mass atrocities and international refugee law is largely about protection from persecution. So a much uh, 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 broader, depending on how you look at it, um, sort of trigger. Second, RTP is recent soft law with some hard law components, particularly Pillar 1. But in contrast, international refugee law is hard law dating back to the early 20th century. It gives refugees a legal right to seek asylum on the territories of state parties to the convention. Um, and, you know, and this is why I found during the uh, interview stage that there was some pushback from refugee practitioners in terms of fears around R2P soft law aspects and its political sensitivities and how those might negatively impact this hard law quality of refugee law, though that's pretty contested as well, particularly from uh, the Home Office in the UK. Um, but despite these differences, both protection frameworks do overlap, um, most obviously in cases where mass atrocities cause forced displacement that then result in uh, mass flows of refugees. Uh, just a quick word that the research is mostly focused on resettlement within the context of R2P because it, there, there's a bit more equality between them because that is a norm um, within international refugee law. So it kind of sheds that problem with the hard law aspect. These are two norms. Um, and just to anyone who doesn't know what resettlement is, it's just a norm within that um, regime 
that only occurs after a determination that an individual or group meets the definition of a refugee. I don't need to say the refugee definition. I'm pretty sure everyone was here and that was covered by uh, Brendan this morning. So um, suffice to say that refugee protection certainly fits within R2P as a peaceful and humanitarian method, but it's not compulsory because once refugees cross an international border, they're no longer facing mass atrocities in a manifestly failing state unless new atrocities develop in the host state or they are returned um, back to the manifestly failing state, which is obviously illegal and known as refoulement. Um, and we know that this, of course, continues to happen. So there might be something there for further research in terms of um, um, violating um, RTP obligations, since they're somewhat amorphous and minimal. Uh, the fact is, is, is illegally refouling uh, might be where we can shoehorn a bit more responsibility. Um, okay, the other thing is, is R2P requires um, states to help protect. It's not really active protection. The words are pretty um, minimal. Um, so the question is, um, you know, the interesting part I should say is then what does UNHCR see and what motivates the Home Office and more broadly the UK when it implemented its largest resettlement program to date, which was the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Program, which then became the Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Program. So it expanded expanded um, to the whole MENA region um, in terms of people affected by the Syrian crisis. So there is detailed analysis of this link in the article, but I don't have time to go into that today. Some of you have probably heard it from me before anyway. Um, in terms of the UK, remember the UK prefers resettlement over asylum as determined by the research, but we can also look at the latest immigration proposal. Um, there's a real um, I would say knee-jerk response to asylum, even though asylum is the hard law aspect of the Refugee Convention. This is a, a true violation um, to not allow access to your territory as a state party for somebody to claim asylum uh, is a real uh, violation of the obligation. In terms of resettlement, that resettlement is not um, the hard law aspect. It is something that states sort of agreed to do um, normatively it's in the preamble of the convention so um, largely in the Home Office, there is a real uh, misunderstanding uh, over the legal obligations under the Convention. Anyway, RTP did not shape the establishment or the expansion of the UK's resettlement program for Syrians. Um, interviewees in the Home Office shared the same vision of responsibility and success in Syria as other government respondents, which was namely regime change, political transition, and a return of refugees so that we could have peace. Um, but they did not have any knowledge of RTP's existence at all even after becoming jointly responsible with DFID, which was DFID at the time, uh, for the expanded Syrian resettlement program. Officials agreed that resettlement could be a humanitarian or peaceful means, but the common response was that it's not really useful, it doesn't end the human slaughter, and R2P demands a response in the manifestly failing state, which excludes resettlement since it's a response to the host state. Um, and then it was, it was really civil society advocacy and public pressure, which led to uh, David Cameron's establishment of the SVPR program in 2014. And again, after pictures of Aylan Curdy came out um, and further advocacy and public pressure, the program was expanded. Um, and you know, this all comes from the case study. In terms of UNHCR, the UK's commitment to R2P, which has been publicly, you know, publicly uh, uh, referred to repeatedly, was not used as leverage in the advocacy around increasing resettlements for Syrians. Instead, the research revealed that UNHCR is contesting the application of R2P to its advocacy around increasing resettlement, and the evidence was dem basically demonstrated that the very organization responsible for refugee protection at the international level does not envision a link between their work in R2P and practice, even though the organization's practice manuals clearly make a link between those fleeing violence and conflict, meaning the definition of refugees in practice for UNHCR is a broader definition than the one we get from the convention. Um, so RTP is largely avoided in favor of using the norms around established norms within the UNHCR sort of world um, of solidarity, cooperation, responsibility. These were seen as holding more sway for getting states to host refugees. They wanted to, you know, stick with what was known, not upset officials um, by mentioning R2P. Um, I can't get into all the other reasons because there's not time, um, but certainly 
feel free to ask me about that. Okay, so there's some theoretical implications arising from the findings and the broader research. Um, so as I said, the research adopted a critical constructivist lens, particularly Wiener's meanings in use and Akaria's localization theory. Uh, Welsh said back in 2014 at a conference, I believe hosted by Leeds, that the accepted and contested aspects of a norm are further revealed by how actors resist particular features of forward alternative approaches to the norm. And this very much informs the analysis in the case study on the UK. So importantly, um, Diedelhoff and Zimmerman argue that there are limits on contestation, particularly where contestation transforms from constitutive to degenerative. And they, namely, they put out there are two to evaluating whether a norm will undergo degeneration. And one is applicatory um, contestation, which can strengthen a norm. Well, um, and uh, Christina, unfortunately, isn't here, but she's done a lot of work on that. Um, uh, in, in contrast to justificatory um, um, contestation, which goes to the validity of the norm and you know, will lead to weakening and potential degeneration. Um, but this research threw up some problems in the sense that um, that there are more than there's more than one kind of applicatory um, contestation, and that you know the scholarship needs to clarify the limits even within applicatory contestation, which can also mask norm degeneration. It's not only the justificatory contestation that may result in norm decline, but certain kinds of applicatory contestation, which depends on the underlying rationales and the context for the particular contestation. So that's the theoretical contribution of the article is to further refine uh, those limits on applicatory contestation. So in, in this empirical case, it refines those behaviors that constitute contestation and that fine line. So here, non-neutral forms of applicatory contestation to norms may result in similar trajectories towards degeneration as those norms undergoing um, the justificatory contestation. So it helps refine how scholars evaluate the health of international norms as they localize institutionally, in this case through UNHCR and in national context context such as the UK. Um, so that is um, a very important distinction, I think, um, to be made. So UNHCR is contesting R2P's application to its practice of refugee protection. Um, there is support for R2P, but it's seen as a separate framework. But this, that, you know, that sounds pretty neutral in terms of contestation. Two minutes, thanks, Kate. Um, because it, it, you know, we think, oh, it just doesn't apply here. But the research dug deeper to understand why it doesn't apply beyond it being just another framework. Um, and it revealed that the, the contestation is actually pretty degenerative because the interviews revealed that part of the reason for localizing R2P separately is due to states' political sensitivities around R2P, unfortunately. This suggests that the reasons behind a norm's applicatory contestation, such as avoiding it for political reasons, i.e. silence, and not purely in good faith over its meaning, may be relevant to looking at a norm's potential degeneration. In terms of the UK, the research concludes that the complete absence of any knowledge around R2P and its relationship to resettlement um, might not be an active resistance or forwarding of a different meaning. Um, but this brings up issues about, um, you know, a cross-government approach to responding to mass atrocities. And I'll just go on to the conclusion now. Um, so where does that leave us? I think two obvious recommendations are to better educate the UK on its R2P and how all of its responses to Syria are ways of discharging R2P as a way of knocking down some of the political fears that uh, around R2P while also helping to build more consensus on its peaceful aspects towards international consensus on responses, but also um, to, to help R2P along as a norm. Um, as we've heard from a lot of the speakers, there is pushback about a around R2P, it still can't really shake its military intervention aspect off. And the UK's understanding of R2P to be that is not helpful. Um, in that sense. And also, as Kate, and finally, as Kate and other sub, uh, civil society organizations have stated, the responses need to be integrated across all relevant government departments. And that means that the Home Office needs to consider itself more than a national agency, given that it oversees refugees coming to the UK, often from RTP situations, whether they're, it's via asylum or resettlement. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. Oh, I see. Um, Chloe, that was tremendous. Crystal clear as...
um, hope now my voice is um, my shaky introduction with bad signal, but that was really fantastic, Chloe. Thank you so much. Um, but now be on to Oliver and Marie. Um, who are is from the Center for Conference Development Peace Building, where Oliver is head of research and Marie is a researcher, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much um, to both. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Patrick. I hope people can hear and see us. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, we were. Thanks very much. It's been great to, to be here and be part of this conference. Thanks again for inviting us. Um, what we've got planned here in the next few minutes um, is, is quite simple, um, perhaps, and, and, and actually works quite well with what um, Chloe just, um, just discussed as well, because it builds on a similar literature. Um, from Sikking to Acheria and others on norm contestation and transformation. So essentially what we try to do in this paper is, 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 come, is, is come together from two different projects that are currently ongoing. One is a, a longer bookish manuscript that, that I've been working on for a while that looks more at the legal and, and philosophical elements around the notion of responsibility and how it's used in the R2P vernacular. And then the other project is a, is a three-year um, um, research project we have here at the CCDP, the Center on Conflict Development and Peacebuilding, funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation, together with my colleagues Keith Kraus, uh, Kazushiga Kobayashi, and uh, Jing Zhuhuan, on looking at Chinese, Russian, and Japanese peacebuilding perspectives. So there very much we are looking at exactly the same literature that, that Chloe has now been referring to. Um, and what we just wanted to do, almost like a little bit of a think piece um, for this conference here, is to try and link up um, some of the elements of both of those projects um, to be able to, to perhaps say a few things also about norm contestation and coherence across the various UN languages, particularly um, looking at China and Russia and Arabic and others, where obviously um, a lot of R2P debate is being happening. But for those of us, at least, who don't speak those languages fluently, we might not necessarily be all that aware of how um, the, the R2P debate is being held in those, in those particular linguistic circles. Um, and again, we're not going to go into a lot of the, the philosophical details here, but, but just, you know, the one version of how we would approach this is simply to say that there's always a speech act involved, there's various layers of meaning every time uh, a statement is made by an official on R2P. Um, and again, we're not going to go into either John Austin here or, or Skinner or, or, or too much of this, but there is obviously always coming with the locutionary act, an illocutionary and a perlocutionary force behind the speech act that is a application or at least um, usage of, of R2P. And I think this goes very much, um, this is something that we very much have to um, worry about on the one hand when we talk about peace building, which is one of the projects that we have there. So by, if you say that or somebody makes the statement that, that we need to build peace in a particular society, that again immediately suggests also that we need to mobilize a certain set of institutions, perhaps the peace building, UN peace building architecture, which would be the elocutionary part of this. And then on the same hand, the same side, though, we are, we are also implying that there's a certain vision of perhaps the liberal peace, big question mark, um, that is part of how we want that society to look like, um, which would then obviously be the kind of perlocutionary part of this of this speech act. And I think the same kind of um, uh, game can be played also with the notion of responsibility in R2P. So if the UN body or somebody says that we need to recall a state's responsibility to protect its population from mass atrocity crimes, then immediately there is the elocutionary element that we're implying that there is a certain set of consequences, be they sanctions, be they intervention, that come that state's way in case those um, it is deemed that that responsibility is not upheld. And perhaps even then also the perlocutionary act in terms of, well, suggesting quite strongly perhaps that the right to non-interference in its internal affairs at this point becomes mute um, by making reference to the R2P vocabulary. So, so this is 
just a little bit of, of a background to how we would be approaching this. Um, and I think for the kind of complex terms that we're dealing with, be it peace building, be it R2P, um, it's, it's actually within the ambiguity and the, the vagueness of those terms itself that comes a lot of the norm contestation and, and coherence, perhaps, question mark, that we're trying to unpack amongst uh, across the different languages that we're looking at. So why am I saying vagueness and ambiguity? Well, um, the word responsibility on the one hand is perhaps like the color blue. Um, we can say that blue is vague because I could I don't yet know whether when I say I support the blue football team, whether I mean the light blue of Man City or the dark blue of Chelsea. Um, but at the same time, I also might have ambiguity in the term because when I say the blues, um, it could be that I'm talking about the Chelsea football team. It could also be that I'm talking about my depressed state <laughs> after Saturday, maybe because I'm not a Chelsea supporter. So again, we have both ambiguity and vagueness in the term. And I think responsibility is certainly another one like this. Because on the one hand, we see, especially in R2P circles, that there are a variety of different notions of responsibility at play here. So already in Pillar 1 or Article 138, we would have the kind of retrospective type of responsibility that is closer to an accountability notion versus then in Pillar 2 or Article 139 of the original UN World Summit outcome document, you have more of a prospective notion of responsibility. Plus, again, and we're not going to go into this here, all the different other variations of collective, shared, individual, corporate responsibility, role or virtue responsibility, I'll stop there, <laughs> that are all at swing, I would say, um, in the way R2P is, is, is being expressed. And there's a, there's a literature also um, there, also in, in, in political theory, um, that, has, that has gone into this and saying that almost as many different notions of responsibility involved here as there are people using it. So I think that's something that we wanted to, to unpack a little bit, but not going again into our Western corpus of, of theory, but to, to simply play the game with some of, my, uh, some of our CCDP colleagues who are from other parts of the world who speak fluent Chinese, Russian and, and, and Arabic and otherwise, and have discussions with them in terms of how the word R2P is being translated on the one hand in the official UN documents, but on the other hand, also perhaps then in the political statements made by officials from those countries. Um, so that's really a little bit what we're what we're trying to, to look at. I've always said in, in previous work, the responsibility project is not the same as a duty to protect, it's perhaps not the same as an obligation to protect. Um, but what do we know in other languages, Marie, uh, about how people and, and, and officials see that? <laughs> Um, so, yes, the ambiguity just mentioned is uh, most obvious in, in German translation of the 2005 World Outcome Summit documents. Um, so, also, German is not an official language. It keeps cropping up as the other in, in the UN document repository. Um, so, there is a responsibility to of the international community expressed in Article 139 is translated as Pflicht, which means duty, rather than responsibility. Um, a distinction that has been the subject of much debate um, in recent moral philosophy, but it has received scant attention, at least as far as we know, uh, in the R2P literature. So the, the vocabulary of Verpflichtung then comes up more than 30 times in the, two, in the 2009 UNSG's uh, report on implementing R2P, yet there is no talk of duty in the English version. Taking a cue from such observation, which lie at the art of the forthcoming monograph, uh, the purpose of the paper we have been preparing for this conference, as Oliver was explaining, is um, well, it has immediately modest ambitions, uh, namely to start comparing with the help of our CCDP colleagues, uh, who, as Oliver was saying, are fluent in all UN languages, the ways in which the notion of responsibility has been translated in Arabic, um, Chinese, Russian, French, and Spanish. Uh, forthcoming papers with some of this colleague will then begin to unpacking the empirical context of this terminology across these linguistic spheres, notably Chinese and Russian, while Oliver's monograph goes into the ethical debates related to the work undertaken by notions of responsibility, duty, and obligation in articulating and justifying our interpersonal and collective position and actions vis-a-vis -vis claims entailing normative dimensions. So we found uh, various um, variation in, in meanings and translation across UN languages. Uh, the Spanish appears to be closest to the English. So, in, for example, in the 2005 outcome document, the term responsibility is used consistently throughout Article 139 and 138. 
uh, in French already a difference uh, of interpretation appears uh, with the use of the word incombé in Article 139. Incombé appears again in the 2009 SG report on implementing R2P no less than 14 times. Uh, the use of the verb incombé is not insignificant. Uh, it has a certain depth to it because it is inherently linked to the notion of burden or responsibility falling on to, upon someone or an obligation, whether it be a moral or legal one. The French language could have offered a variety of other words and phrasing to, to explain the and have the same meaning, such as il revient à, il est de la responsabilité de l'état de. So we wonder why the result to the word incombé. Um, perhaps, like the German version, there was a unwitting prolocutionary ambition to convey a sense of obligation on the part of the international community to act in the face of mass atrocity crimes, question mark. Um, interestingly, while there is more consistency in UN documents, um, as Oliver was saying before, the difference between duty and responsibility is blurred in French political discourse, uh, where in fact the two terms are used uh, interchangeably. For example, when going through political statements pronounced at the National Assembly in the context of the French military operation in Libya, uh, one can hence read, il était du devoir de la France et de la communauté internationale d'assumer leur responsabilité vis-à-vis -vis des peuples arabes et plus de liberté. Uh, so this interpretation is much stronger than what is generally expressed in UN documents and therefore comes closer to the German translation with its emphasis on a duty to uphold the responsibility. Um, the Arabic translations, according to our colleagues, are slightly different. While responsibility is cons consistently translated as masulila, a term that is often equated with accountability or liability, and thus with notion of retrospective responsibility, the R2P formulation dodges this particular bullet by simply asserting that it falls upon the state and the international community to protect populations. So in that sense, the translation, particularly in Article 139, is close to the French version, but without the normative dimension implied by the word incombé. Uh, thanks, Marie. And, and just very briefly moving on to Russian and Chinese, I think in the Russian version, it's, it's this di differentiation between responsibility and duty is even more striking because, again, having had long discussions with our colleagues here, um, it, it, throughout all the R2P um, documents, the Russian version actually says duty to protect. It uses the word objazhanosht rather than the word responsibility, which exists in Russian and is used, for instance, in the context of corporate social responsibility. So the Russian language makes the distinction, but in all the in all the the, the official texts um, of 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 um, of by the I guess UN interpreters, UN translators, it is so it, it ends up amounting to a duty to protect. Um, and this is something I think we want to look at further with our colleagues by also looking at how statements made out of Moscow are being formulated, whether there is a clear understanding and differentiation amongst those officials between the duty and the responsibility, whether they feel this is something that we have to um, bear in mind. It certainly is striking when you then take this Russian version of the primary duty of the state as expressed perhaps in pillar one. Um, when it comes out, and we started looking at this, um, some of the documents related in the, and the statements made in the 2014 crisis around Ukraine, where you actually then have, if you take it to be a responsibility, uh, the duty to protect, I'm sorry, um, a quite a strong unilateral view of saying Russian military actions were justified because of a duty to protect Russian citizens, Russian passport holders, Russian compatriots in Ukraine. Um, so when you start trying to translate it back from, from those statements. Um, it's actually quite striking. And then finally, the Chinese um, version as well. We had some, some, um, some good discussions with our colleagues here already. They seem to be actually quite more, more sensitive and new, nuanced to these differentiations. Um, they use the word responsibility systematically throughout most of um, the Chinese translations, but also statements coming out of Beijing. Um, but often they, again, they tend to use it mostly um, in relation to pillar one, and so the state's responsibility to protect while using, again, perhaps more softer terms, um, expressing more the liability right of the international community to voluntarily come to the help of suffering populations um, when, they, when they talk about what the international community um, could be doing. Again, I think it's interesting, we were in New York recently, just before the COVID lockdown, also seeing how the Chinese um, delegations are, are having a much more prominent role in some of the 
language that is being suggested for new um, um, for new UN resolutions and other documents. Um, and I think this is something that, again, we have to look at further in terms of what kind of language they're actually um, suggesting. So this, in a way, just as a nutshell here to, to wrap up, is a little bit where we're trying to come together with, on the one hand, this kind of legal and <laughs> philosophical semantics, and on the other hand, um, the bigger projects on coherence and, cost and, const uh, and, and contestation on the way norms are being transformed. Because on the one hand, we could say that, well, it's it's a Western <laughs> discourse, perhaps couched in the liberal piece. We're certainly having it always in these circles, very much also in an Anglophone <laughs> mindset. Um, but perhaps we are slightly too ignorant or maybe even arrogant in, in assuming that, you know, what comes out of <laughs> some of these other major powers and their capitals um, is kind of the same notion that we would have. So, I mean, there's a big discussion happening and there's a large literature in, in the descriptive ethics and the sociological branch of ethics on the way responsibility as a concept um, has been more and more um, um, pronounced in popular usage throughout the, 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 the late um, part, later decades of the 20th century and into the 21st century. Um, it's very much perhaps also attributed to our, the complexities of society that we're trying to, to deal with, that attributions of intent and blame are much more difficult, therefore talking of duties and obligations, at least from an ethical point of view, from a, um, um, is from a philosophical, much harder to articulate. Um, which, on the one hand, perhaps tells us why responsibility is <laughs> is a popular term. Yes, we're all kind of responsible for all sorts of things, including climate change and, 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 and corporate social responsibility, and you name it. But at the same time, there is this ambiguity and this this vagueness involved um, that we at least want to want to unpack a little bit, and and therefore maybe also make that contribution to the norm um, literature that Chloe was talking about. Because on the one hand, we're saying, well, maybe there is the global norm of R two P that is being projected onto other countries. But again, how much do we know in terms of how Beijing, Moscow, and others themselves are articulating these notions? Um, and potentially also projecting their own version back onto the global debate um, and therefore you know, changing the content, so to speak, of the norm um, in the process. And this is certainly something where R2P is one case or a case study of. It's something we're looking at in more detail in, in for peace building per se. Um, but that certainly, I think, is trying to also <laughs> take it take it from the other's perspective for once and see how other linguistic and <laughs> maybe even cultural circles and philosophical circles make sense of um, our vocabulary, which may or may not be <laughs> compatible and coherent, but certainly I think there are differentiations we already found that are worth um, exploring further. So we're very much looking forward to also hearing what, what some of our uh, participants think of this um, and in which ways we could take this further. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, so much and hopefully now I'm coming through finally a bit clearer um, but that was really I mean just a tremendous paper really fascinating I love this sense of there being as many um, concepts or interpretations of responsibility as there are people um, engaging in in the idea and I just really look forward to hearing where your research takes you really fascinating and I'm sure there'll be many many questions um, finally then but by no means least we go to um, Ben who I have had the very great pleasure of working with and knowing for um, really some time great to see you Ben um, Ben is an associate lecturer at Plymouth he's completing his PhD at the University of Leeds um, he also is part of the extended protection approaches family and I have worked with Ben written with Ben shared my ideas and learned so much from Ben over such a long time and he's now going to talk about my favourite topic, atrocity prevention and UK foreign policy. See how this is when my internet behaves itself. It's on more familiar grounds now. So Ben, the floor, the screen is yours, 15 minutes. Really looking forward to hearing what you're going to say. Thank, thank you, Kate. Can everyone hear me okay? Excellent. Yes, perfect. I have to say that that's quite a build up, Kate. Thank you. Hopefully I can live up to it in some small part. It's it's lovely to see some familiar faces as well. So I shall dive straight into my presentation. So essentially my paper looks at UK atrocity prevention policy. The question of how the UK's government's commitment to R2P, specifically pillars two and three, 
is integrated across its foreign policy work. So it's overarching diplomatic development and defence activities. And the case of the UK is a, a particularly interesting one, not only as a P5 member state with veto power at the UN Security Council, but it has also been a long-standing advocate of R2P all the way back to uh, the ICIS report of 2001 and the adoption of R2P at the World Summit in 2005, uh, but also the extent of its commitment and the incorporation of R2P and atrocity prevention into its national foreign policy making architecture has been the subject of considerable domestic scrutiny by parliament and by civil society over the last five to 10 years. And this scrutiny has left quite a paper trail of sorts that begins to tell us quite a lot about how the UK government actually understands and implements its commitment to R2P. So it's worth making two brief observations at the outset in terms of the current state of the literature. And in essence, despite the vast scholarship that we now have on R2P, the literature on how states have actually internalized R2P within their domestic foreign policy making structures is relatively limited. Now, the general exceptions to this overall neglect are primarily focused on the United States, specifically Obama era reforms of Presidential Study Directive 10, the creation of the Atrocities Prevention Board, which I think in 2019 was reformed uh, as the Atrocity Early Warning Task Force. But much of the focus is on the US and those sort of internal bureaucratic structures that were created. Uh, the literature on the UK approach is comparatively limited. Uh, so Jason Ralph's 2014 UNA report uh, is still essential reading on this topic. Uh, but it obviously predates a number of recent developments. Uh, we also have more recent articles by Chloe uh, on the UK's understanding of R2P in relation to Syria from 2014 to 2016 uh, in the International Journal of Human Rights. And we have Kate's recent article on the UK's response to the Rohingya crisis in 2017 in Global Responsibility to Protect Journal. And both of these articles also speak to broader issues of UK atrocity prevention policy, as well as those two specific cases. Uh, we also have a very recent policy brief by Kate written for the Royal United Services Institute, which is highly recommended. Um, but that is essentially it in terms of the literature looking at inside the UK, the domestic sphere. So this paper aims to contribute further to what is likely to be a developing body of scholarship in this area. And to do this, this paper of mine draws on Amitabhachai's model of norm localization. Uh, the theoretical equivalent of what is usually conceptualized in policy terms by Alex Bellamy is the insertion of an atrocity prevention lens into existing government policies, programs, and frameworks. Now, in simple terms, Achai's model provides a framework for investigating norm diffusion, which stresses the agency of local norm takers through a dynamic process of congruence building between transnational norms, in this case R2P, and localized beliefs and practices. And this model involves relatively non-linear stages of pre-localization characterized by resistance and contestation, local initiative through insider proponents, uh, typically via acts of entrepreneurship and framing, uh, adaptation through grafting and pruning, and a gradual reconstitution of localized norms through institutional outcomes of task expansion and procedural innovation. And that's where we obtain a reconstitution of a localized norm. So I use this framework not to look at the use of R2P in specific cases by the UK, but to explore the prior and sometimes conflicting matter of overarching UK policy. And this is set out across a range of public statements in recent years, most notably the FCO's 2019 policy paper on the UK approach to preventing mass atrocities. Uh, a substantial amount of material, however, is not in the public domain. So I also draw on a number of freedom of information requests that have been submitted to various government departments, uh, some of which are still under review. Now, in brief, the argument that I present is that the UK's approach to R2P should be characterized as one of partial localization. 
And there are five elements to this. There's an on contested, ongoing, and I should emphasize a relatively non-linear process. First of all, UK policy has been increasingly reframed by both government actors and civil society as a commitment to atrocity prevention rather than R2P. Second, this commitment has been grafted onto a pre-existing UK foreign policy agenda of tackling conflict and instability overseas, what can be viewed as a local conflict prevention and stabilization norm. Third, this grafting process has led to a conceptual pruning of the UK's approach, which focuses narrowly on conflict-related atrocities and entirely discounts peacetime atrocity situations. Fourth, beyond this initial rhetorical grafting, there is no discernible evidence that the UK's conflict prevention and stabilization toolkit has been substantively reconstituted. And then fifth, these minimal changes represent a tactical adaptation of R2P by the UK government, constituting an incomplete process of partial norm localization. So that is the argument in brief. Obviously, the paper explores this in greater depth through a more detailed mapping of the various conceptual, institutional and operational dimensions of UK policy. So again, in very brief terms, we can see these processes of reframing and grafting through the evolution of UK policy on R2P and atrocity prevention over the last decade. Very broadly speaking, this dates from the introduction of the now defunct Building Stability Overseas Strategy in 2011, all the way through most recently to the government's integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy which is explicit in framing atrocity prevention as part of the UK's broader work on tackling conflict and instability overseas. Now, the conceptual element of the paper looks at both causes and the consequences of this problematic conceptual association, which is essentially marked by contestation over three elements, the first of which is an outdated conflation of atrocity prevention with conflict prevention. The second is a view of R2P and atrocity prevention, less so, as being relatively controversial and worthy of downplaying. So this leads to the, the well-worn idea of doing R2P, but not actually calling it R2P. And the third is a relative absence of domestic political will. So like any agenda issue, R2P and atrocity prevention require dedicated ministerial support in order to push it forward. So we could uh, take a look at William Hague's commitments, his norm entrepreneurship on PSVI, for example, as a, as a prime example of this. In terms of the institutional arrangements through which oversight, direction and coordination of UK atrocity prevention policy is exercised, this is essentially split across ministerial and departmental responsibilities. So with regard to the former, uh, we can note that atrocity prevention has been considered as a, quote, distinct area of work for Foreign Office Minister Lord Ahmed since 2017. And allegedly, prior to this, Baroness Anlay and previously James Dudridge MP, going all the way back to about 2015. Now, there are two main issues here, aside from the overall folding of atrocity prevention into the ministerial portfolio for UN and multilateral issues. One of these is that this remains entirely separate from the conflict prevention portfolio held by Foreign Office Minister James Cleverley. So there's an unusual degree of, of conceptual distinction in terms of ministerial portfolios rather than the overarching conflation that we see elsewhere. And the other issue is the relative lack of prioritisation or of convening authority in institutional terms, with atrocity prevention essentially only being one aspect of an overburdened junior ministerial post that is not part of the UK national security setup. And we also see this lack of internal convening authority with regard to departmental responsibility within the FCO. So, while this appears to currently be under review due to the merger of the FCO and DFID into the new Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, 
Uh, this has traditionally been located with a head of the FCO's Director of Multilateral Policy. And their work, primarily through their role as the UK's permanent focal point on R2P since about 2014, has focused on external engagement with other states, rather than being part of a, a cross-government institutional structure for atrocity prevention work that would convene relevant officials from other government departments, such as FCDO, uh, DFID, as was, uh, the MOD, the Stabilisation Unit, the National Security Secretariat, and elsewhere. So the paper also examines the extent to which atrocity prevention is operationalised, primarily, although not exclusively, through the UK government's own self-identified toolkit of measures, uh, and this is laid out in particular in the 2019 policy paper that it released. Uh, this section of the presentation is quite heavy on the acronyms, uh, so I won't dive into those too much, but essentially we have a range of prediction, prevention and response tools here. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I just want to focus on two elements in particular. Now, the first concerns the targeted thematic and country-specific UK programming that is carried out through the Conflict Stability and Security Fund. So the CSSF is a much vaunted uh, £1.2 billion cross-government fund that, quote, supports and delivers uh, activity to tackle instability and to prevent conflicts that threaten UK interests. And it does so via niche thematic and country-specific programmes. Now, the CSSF is particularly interesting because it is the financial support that it provides for the UN Joint Office on Genocide Prevention and R2P through its multilateral programme on championing UK values, which remains the only explicit evidence of atrocity prevention and R2P being embedded into day-to-day -day UK foreign policy work. So you won't find reference to R2P or atrocity prevention essentially anywhere else throughout the range of programmes and tools that the UK delivers. So the only other exception to that sweeping statement is with some of the UK's multilateral diplomacy. So the UK has always been very active in promoting, advocating for R2P at the United Nations, particularly within the Security Council. And that goes all the way back to earliest resolutions referencing the World Summit Outcome document on uh, Darfur in 2006 and the Protection of Civilians Agenda. Uh, the UK has also been active in terms of its membership of the R2P Group of Friends, uh, the Focal Point Network, and the lesser-known International Atrocity Prevention Working Group. So, what we have in summary in terms of its explicit atrocity prevention work, is that the UK government retains a narrow understanding of atrocity prevention as a primarily multilateral activity. And it's one that is realised through support for the concept of R2P and pursued almost exclusively by the United Nations. Now, in terms of its implicit atrocity prevention policy, UK foreign policy work often contributes significantly to both structural and direct prevention through the, the range of tools listed in its prevention toolkit. But this contribution is an unintended and indirect effect of its pre-existing conflict prevention, stabilisation, and even more indirectly, its human rights work. So this partial localization of an atrocity prevention lens therefore has ongoing policy implications so it results in a range of conceptual blind spots limited institutional oversight and continued operational incoherence and this is why we see various diverging and inappropriate meanings and in use of r2p and associated norm clusters employed by the uk in recent years as discussed in the existing literature so we end up with a relatively disjointed inconsistent ad hoc responses to Syria, Myanmar, Xinjiang and elsewhere that we've seen in recent years. Uh, I should end though by reiterating that localization is modeled as a dynamic process. 
So we can either take the pessimistic view that the UK's partial localization of R2P is evidence of its status as a, as a hollow norm, as Aidan Hayer refers to it, in which it does little to compel any change in state behavior. Or we could take the more optimistic view uh, that it essentially remains very much a work in progress. So this is the argument that norms develop over time and that they are essentially what we make of them. And that is me finished. That was fantastic. Ever crammed with detail and yeah. clarity. Sorry, Kate, I think we're well, losing your audio. Right now. So while Kate reconnects there, I can see she's just reconnecting. I can hear you now. Are you there, Kate? No. Oh, no, reconnecting. OK, um, so there's a question that's just been posted on Gather Town, which I think might be good to start off with. Uh, yeah, um, the question in the chat, Kate says, uh, from uh, Francisco Lobo on Gather Town. He would like to ask the panel's opinion um, on the 2018 declaration by the UK government about a right or permission of humanitarian intervention without mentioning the responsibility to protect at all. And this was in the context of the airstrikes against Syria mm -hmm. after the use of chemical weapons. Um, as soon as Kate's back, I'll hand over back over to her. But um, Chloe, would you like to start off with that if you have any opinions on that one? Yeah, I, I would love to answer that question. I didn't get to really go over that today, but that this came out of a lot of the interviews I was doing and, and the research. Um, the UK is is under the notion that um, there is a separate uh, norm of humanitarian intervention that comes from the Kosovo experience and that that is separate to R2P. And essentially in, in my research, um, one of the findings was that that was used as a fallback when there wasn't enough consensus to have that military or you know regime change in the political transition with consensus at the UN Security Council. So the idea, and this was largely um, came out of Parliament really, in the sense that Parliament was the only um, department that I interviewed that was very vocal about the conflation with military intervention for R2P and these calls for this is our R2P, it's an obligation to do that. Um, and then if you look at a lot of the discourse um, at the time, just before the strikes, um, the idea was that since they couldn't find consensus at the Security Council using R2P, which goes to kind of what Ben was saying about this being something in New York and Geneva, because they couldn't find that consensus, instead they sort of modified R2P to only be where there's consensus. But the the obvious problem there is that it's consensus over what their political objectives are, not necessarily in terms of protecting populations from mass atrocities. Now, that might protect populations, um, but when they're impossible, as Ralph and, and uh, as Jason and Jess say, then, you know, it, it's no action. So they very much believe, um, from, from my research, what I found, that there is a separate humanitarian intervention norm that comes from Kosovo, that R2P did not displace that, um, that those two operate in different situations, i.e. when there's no consensus. <laughs> um, so in terms of the, the, you know, there are some real problems in international law in terms of the airstrikes um, against Syria, because that was not by consent of the state to help, even though it, the idea is, is it might be against non-state actor, there was no invitation by the regime to do that. Um, so, you know, from an international lawyer's perspective, we would say that that was a violation of the use of force. Um, hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think Kate is back with a good connection. Um, well, we'll, we'll see. If, we'll see if we are. I'm so I'm sorry. I've honestly not known anything like this the whole year of this online working. Um, I'm really 
so apologetic. And Ben, I did want to say just what a fabulous paper that was. Um, and yeah, I really look forward to kind of some side chat on 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 that. Although maybe you take a slightly more pessimistic view of um, future in the UK than I do. Right. Let us see if anyone has any questions that they would like to um, go direct. I believe you can raise your hand in this function chat, and then Patrick will magically put the camera on you. Um, if not, I have many questions for all of the panelists because I thought it was just a great, a great collection of um, remarks. Um, oh, Ben, shall we go to you? Yes, I, I was. <laughs> if everyone, has, I was, I was just going to build on on Chloe's comments about the previous question. If everyone's happy for me to, please do. Please I mean, do. I, I was essentially going to agree with with Chloe. I, one other thing I was going to say was from from some of the reading that I've done in terms of the UK's historical approach to R2P, it is very much the case that when they were negotiating R2P at the World Summit in 2005, the UK government explicitly saw that, uh, saw R2P as being a continuation of what's often known as the Blair Doctrine. So the Chicago speech that he delivered in support of the Kosovo intervention in 1999. Um, so the UK saw it, bizarrely, the UK saw R2P as a continuation of unilateral humanitarian intervention. It saw it very much as the same thing at, at the time, but it also, within those negotiations, the reason why uh, it negotiated R2P in the way that it did is that it didn't want the paragraphs on R2P to explicitly rule out the possibility of humanitarian, unilateral humanitarian intervention. So it very much, although it tied R2P to the Security Council, it was silent on what would happen if the Security Council was blocked. So the UK government's position was very much the case of that it didn't want to see an explicit ruling out of its ability to engage in unilateral humanitarian intervention. And it's very much the case that since then it hasn't linked R2P with UHI uh, to add another acronym to the mix. It's sought to keep R2P entirely separate from unilateral humanitarian intervention. The interesting thing with taking a broader approach of atrocity prevention is that unilateral intervention could be part of the UK's broader atrocity prevention toolkit, even if it isn't part of its R2P toolkit. So it's this is potentially one of the things that it may want to work through. The UK government at the moment is silent on how humanitarian intervention fits into its atrocity prevention work more broadly. Partly because we don't want them to answer it, because if they think about it, then they'll have to put it in, and we don't want them to put it in at all. Um, yeah. Can, can we just jump in on this briefly as well, um, Kate? Please do. <laughs> Thanks. Much no, it's just it's great. It's a great question actually from Francisco, and we're just listening here to to both um, to both also and and we're wondering. I mean, on the one hand, I think there's a lot to say for the continuity um, and and where some of this comes from. So so certainly agreeing with with both Ben and, and Chloe on this, but but I think one of the, the big spanners in the works were probably also the the fallout from the Libya debacle, um, after which certain P5 members, especially Russia and, and China in a way as well. Um, I've been very much um, allergic to using R2P vocabulary in any Syria-related um, matters. And, and maybe, and again, this is perhaps pure speculation on our side here, but maybe to an extent it's also that the, the current UK government, or the, the recent UK government statements are very much sensitized to that. And we're perhaps quite simply just trying to find a way of... <laughs> Of, of reframing it in such a way that that the humanitarian intervention idea is still there, but but not immediately being vetoed or otherwise, um, you know, otherwise uh, shot down by quite literally by by using the the R two P vocabulary. But again, this is perhaps pure speculation on our part. Here. <laughs> Thanks. Could I could I just jump in on that just for one moment too? 
is I just wanted to clarify as well that it was it was different across um, the department. So Parliament was pretty open about connecting R2P to intervention, um, but the FCO was very, didn't want to talk about R2P at all because I, I was repeatedly told, no, there can be no military intervention. We do not want a Libya. Um, you know, it was very much R2P was seen as a constraint on policy. It was like, we're not going to connect anything to R2P because then we'll be asked to do that in every conflict. And each one is unique and has its own sort of, uh, you know, available policy responses, which was interesting because it showed as well that there was not an understanding that R2P was flexible to to the circumstance, that that was the whole point of it. Um, so just to say that with the FCO that, you know, they, they wanted only a diplomatic uh, response, not a military response. But yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, well, the floor is open if any of our participants, um, listeners, would like to raise their hand. Patrick, let's go to you. Yeah, if you don't mind me um, asking a question. Uh, thank you to all panellists. They were all really, really fascinating papers. Um, I have a question for um, Oliver and, um, <coughs> and Marie. Um, I'm sorry if I missed if you mentioned this in your paper, but when you were talking about the different words used in different languages, it was really fascinating. And um, I was just wondering if you had thought about how this may be applied to uh, the concept of responsibility in Article 24 of the UN Charter, for example, um, where it says that states are conferred prime responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security. And whether there are any differences or similarities there with what you picked up in, in, your, in your research. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Um, it's one of the ones that we've also been looking at precisely because a lot of, at least at the time when I was interviewing members of the ICIWS Commission, they kept going back to Article 24 of saying this is where they got their inspiration from um, and why responsibility crept into the vocabulary at all. Um, um, and I think I, I can't off the top of my head now say, say concretely for all six mm -hmm. languages, but for most of them, it is the word responsibility in there. Um, there is there is not much talk of a duty, but I have to, especially on the Russian now. I'm 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 slightly hesitant, so I'll have to I'll have to dig that one up for you. But um, but it's interesting to see certainly how how there was a certain vocabulary that was being picked up from the charter, <laughs> that then kind of made it to the rounds here. And it was it was actually at the time I was already in Geneva. <laughs> now I'm outing myself here. Back in the day, 20 years ago, and there was a Geneva consultation of the ICIWS. Um, and according to Cornelio Samaruga and others, that was the one where the word responsibility was tabled for the first time um, and then came in. But um, I, I'd have to, yeah, apologies, I'd have to, we'd have to check. Mm. On the Russian, I'm not quite sure what it says. On the others, I'm pretty sure it's the same. It's the word responsibility. But um, yeah, <laughs> the Russian, I'd have to check. Thanks so much. Um, really looking forward to this linguistic study of R2P um, and what it means for us. Um, I have a question um, to Ben. Um, I'm really interested to know what you and how you and I haven't talked about this surprises me, but I would really like to know what you think the integrated review and the merger and the various um, inquiries and evidence sessions um that i'm sure you have also been following like me very closely sort of why what you think we can glean of a new direction um and and whether you know the kind of question that you ended on of whether r2p and if you'll allow me i'll put atrocity prevention in that bracket too because i do think they're treated um differently in in the uk um as a hollow norm or are we a work in progress and going in a good direction? Like, where would your judgment be right now? Um, thank you. That's, I mean, it's a, it's a great question, Kate. I, I think it depends which day you ask me. It depends how optimistic or pessimistic I am. Um, I'm all, I'd like to say I'm always cautiously optimistic. I think, so the integrated review is a starting point, which, which was the UK's, for anyone who's not aware, is the UK's broader review of foreign policy. Uh, that it conducted over the last 12 months, which it advertised as being the largest review of, of UK foreign policy since the end of the Cold War. Um, it, it has atrocity, it literally mentions atrocity prevention, which 
the mere inclusion of two words, I think, is actually potentially highly significant, even though it is literally just a subset of one sentence. Um, because it really does show that the government is is thinking in those terms that atrocity prevention does constitute part of its broader conflict prevention and stabilisation work. Now, as I mentioned in the paper, that's that's a problematic conceptual association to tie atrocities with conflict so explicitly, but it's still the only place that at the moment seems to appear to offer the opportunity to put that reference in. So I think that provides a very much, a, certainly in theoretical terms, of, uh, provides very much of a, a key point for, for framing and grafting atrocity prevention into the UK's broader work. Um, in terms of how that's spun out from being a, from being a, an overarching policy document in terms of institutional infrastructure with the reorganization of the Foreign Office, I mean, it, it's difficult without being in amongst those conversations. I'm sure yourself, Kate, in London, probably hear more than, than I do sat uh, hundreds of miles away. But it, it's particularly interesting that you have a revamped multilateral policy directorate, but you also have the creation now, of, I think, of a conflict stabilization and mediation directorate, which sounds as if it would be a better place to sit atrocity prevention work in future. You also have an Open Societies and Human Rights Directorate, which, again, atrocity prevention sort of sits across those two. It is both conflict prevention and human rights work, as well as having that multilateral dimension. So it's really difficult to see exactly how or where it should fit within those three parts of the Foreign Office. And that is before you get to the question of how anything that goes on within the Foreign Office links to. Uh, the Ministry of Defence or the National Security Secretariat, let alone uh, the Home Office, as Chloe talks about quite right in terms of how they develop their understanding of the UK's broader commitment. So it'd be really interesting to see how this plays out in institutional terms over the next sort of six to 12 months and whether you're also going to get any sort of strategic direction setting through an overarching UK atrocity prevention strategy, which I think would help to guide all of that work. So I think it obviously needs more than just that single line in the integrated review. What you need is that sort of strategic thinking that takes it forward in terms of how do we embed this within and across government departments. Um, in terms of the various inquiries and everything, obviously, I mean, the, the simple thing to say is that, that that pressure from civil society and that scrutiny is utterly essential to moving that forward, having that continued uh, scrutiny and accountability for what the UK government is doing. I'm not quite sure if you committed to a, um, yes, it's going to be positive or not, but that's that's quite fine. I will not hold you to it. Um, and yes, um, two words were very hard fought for. Um, maybe moving on to, um, oh, Marie, you have a question. Um, yes, it was just to to go back to uh, Patrick's question. We we just checked, and um, and it is responsibility that is used in Article Twenty Four for for in Russian. So it is interesting because they only came up with the notion of duty later. Um, mm. So yes, yeah, just wanted okay. to feel that. Thank yeah. you so much for that live checking for us. Um, fabulous. Um, also, no. I'm sure that that's something all of us research will go away. Research is one of the best research. <laughs> Well, you know, these these days I'm so much more civil society than academic. I know no other way. Um, I have a question for Chloe. Um, if we have no other hands up in the chat, because I don't want to keep talking too much. But um, Chloe, I mean, I you know how fascinated I am by your research. But but tuning into the um, panels over the last day and a half, you know, really reminds me of, of the academic contestation and discussion about R2P as a preventative principle and that actually sort of, you know, on, on the outside in, in practice, I, I take that for granted a lot. But I wonder if you could sort of reflect on some of those conversations and discussions within the academic literature about what that might mean or if there is any answer there for UK responsibilities towards refugees from... Um, afflicted states and other um states you know not not just the uk 
and whether there is some somewhere um, within that literature, either for us in in practice to draw on, or actually, um, it's it's a kind of new frontier of research that you're pushing forward. Um, thanks, Kate. Do you mean if there's something in the literature about practicing R2P um, in in prevention terms in in relation to refugees? Is that what you mean? In terms of granting, not necessarily, not necessarily about, about refugees, but kind of that discussion around the the principle is being preventative, um, and so whether there are kind of uh, I don't know, sort of um, either other dimensions of how R2P has been replicated or kind of like looked at, I don't know, maybe through the stuff on women, peace and security and R2P or kind mm -hmm. of the stuff looking at the first pillar and how that is up, up, upheld. Um, mm -hmm. Because I was just, I've just been really struck over the last day and a half about this kind of contestation about how preventative R2P really was intended to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you've driven the nail right in that kind of place. I haven't quite rectified yet. Um, when I was originally doing the research, I, I, it, it, there was a bit of a problem with sort of if you commit to the response side, you're sort of forsaking the prevention side a bit and vice versa. I, I couldn't help but through the process of the research start to feel that some attention had moved from response because it was seen as impossible to some degree, but it's only uh, anecdotal really i don't have any evidence of that um i don't i don't really know is the short answer i mean i'd, I'd have to think about that and reflect upon that a little bit but i'd be interested in having that conversation with you um over coffee or wine at one of these <laughs> vens live um <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think um, I think that's something for me to to reflect on a little bit. Unless there's something specific that you're really getting at. <laughs> no, 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 it's a, it's a genuine yes. um, open question that I would really like the answer to. But that's why it sort of isn't well formed <laughs> because I sort of was just thinking out loud. But I think tying the work that you're doing and also the questions that Ben is looking at and this moment in UK foreign policy development, we're actually now atrocity prevention is described publicly by the government as being prevention first and upstream which is gaslighting to those of us that have been trying to persuade them that for so long i do wonder if there's a space for you to make your recommendations um in in, in that way i don't know it's really really fascinating there's a great yeah. question here Oh, no, sorry, do you come back? No, do you, please, Chloe. Yeah, I think I'll just follow up a little bit on that, as I think you're right. There's something to build there. And part of that is, I think, sort of getting the... Because I, I think one of the big problems... Um, was this fear of R2P as a constraint. So the, the the lack of political will was intentional to some degree because of the toxicity of, of R2P. So perhaps bringing in that preventive side is a safe kind of way of at the end of the day i think the uk has to learn that what they're doing already is r2p and it would settle their feelings about it but it's still not necessarily enough right um ultimately but so that reflects a little bit on on some of the limitations of r2p really but it, at the end of the day it's what bellamy says right it's it's broad consensus minimal duties so, but yeah, I'd, I'll reflect on that more and leave it now. No, 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 it's just interesting, isn't it? Um, I think yeah. Jess and, and Dean, when they were talking about some really exciting work that, that we're doing together on pushing the frontiers of, of R2P and kind of building on the work that I think, you know, you and others have done on, on refugees and R2P, but also women, peace and security and R2P and really looking at the populations that kind of... Mm are implicitly but maybe not explicitly within even within our space considered to be um covered or, or or protected there is a question in in the chat um ben um for for you um, in your perspective what factors that cause the norm clusters of the uk government to r2p maybe what are the factors is it related to the problem of non-robustness if R2P itself, which could lead to Hare's argument, R2P is a hollow norm, or is it a more political dynamic in UK politics? That sounds like it's coming from a fellow international relations scholar that you will understand more than I do, Ben. So I will leave that with you. Okay, thanks, Kate. I think it's, I mean, is, is it a cop-out to say it's a combination of the two? I think 
R2P's inherent malleability is both is both a strength and a weakness. Um, but it is one of the reasons why when it interacts with with the internal political dynamics of, of the UK political system, um, I think this is why you end up with it essentially saying that it's it's already doing R2P but not calling it R2P, um, which is a problem where we actually, you know, as scholars and activists, we might say, you know, please attach the R2P label to some of the stuff that you're doing. Um, that would be extremely helpful. Um, I'm reminded, and I, I wish I could think of the quote rather more precisely, but I think the government's response in 2018 to the Foreign Affairs Committee's recommendation that it develop an atrocity prevention strategy it comes out with these lines about why a strategy is not necessary for the uk and it essentially starts talking about um duplication of resources um and other elements where it's essentially saying that it's already doing enough work targeted in this area um so i think the struggle is is that is that perennial one of trying to demonstrate why the work that the UK already does and the way that it thinks about that work is not actually sufficient. And that's where the malleability of R2P is useful because it enables those of us that the, want the UK to do more in this respect can actually start to reframe things around R2P and atrocity prevention. Um, I'm hoping that answers the question slightly. Well, I know Zane, would you like to come back and respond and, and push on a bit further? No, you, I think let, you're let off the hook, Ben. Um, <laughs> do we have any other questions? Oh, no, thanks. So good. I think you did it. You did a good job then, Ben. Um, well, maybe then I shall um, abuse my position and give each of you a minute to answer an impossible question, which is really kind of, you know, this this panel is about conceptual frontiers and boundaries and sort of the limits and, and opportunities that R2P holds. You know, we're coming up to now 16 years, um, which I'm a historian, not an international relations scholar, so I take a longer view on things. Where do the next 15 years hold? Kind of what are the conceptual boundaries? Like what is this conference going to be talking about in 15 years time? The new scholars coming up that are going to be pushing at those boundaries like where do you think we can go in in this next era which i know takes some academics out of their comfort zone um, but i'm going to put you on the spot because i'm allowed to then you're on my screen first so unfortunately i'm going to you first then i'll go to chloe then i'll go to oliver and um marie well thanks thanks for that question kate <laughs> my pleasure. Um, give me some give me some ideas I'm uh, so just just plucking one thought out of my head. One one of the one of the elements that I've been looking at in some of my other research is is the more sort of the legal aspects of it in terms of the fact that R two P was was very strictly delimited to these four crimes. Um, but I think one thing that we've seen, and I see it with my own PhD research on North Korea, which was very much seen as a non traditional R two P case in the earlier years. It was it was deliberately not talked about in some cases. Why I mention this is because the tying of R2P to crimes against humanity in particular is that it's it's really quite a wide legal category that envisages a whole range of acts, a whole range of crimes that were not thought about by uh, the originators of R2P in terms of ICIS and the World Summit negotiators. And you can see this, you know, the, the legal notion of crimes against humanity being expanded uh, so that you have R2P being, being applied not only to sort of traditional genocidal cases like the Rohingya, but you also have it applied to the prison camps of North Korea, you have it applied to Xinjiang now, which is very much a sort of a non-traditional R2P case, it's much more widely accepted now. You have it applied to the drugs war in the Philippines, uh, you also have the notion of crimes against humanity applied to uh, Australian and European refugee policy. So I think in terms of an expansion of the conceptual boundaries, I think this notion of what these crimes cover and what R2P therefore covers will continue to widen. And I think that's going to be an ongoing conversation of exactly Love. what R2P covers. Yeah. 
I think that sounds if we can if we can get on that track or continue on that track I think we'll be all for the good Chloe over to you give us your 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 great ideas sorry uh, I was still muted um Thank you. <laughs> While I put my thoughts together, I would say two things. One, accountability. And I mean accountability for pushback, right? So I think that norms take time, but we need to look at how powerful liberal states, liberal democracies specifically, and how they conceptualize and practice human rights-based norms like R2P, because a lot of the way they understand and practice those just feeds right into the contestation of less powerful states. And we, we need to have a accountability for the pushback against human rights, right? And really have a real conversation about how the, the most powerful are um, practicing. So, you know, if we get away with it, doing it the way we want to do it, um, then why shouldn't they to some degree? So while while we can blame, uh, you know, the obstinance of, of Russia and China at the Security Council, we also have to be accountable, uh, you know, as the P3 in terms of our own self-interested way of, of drafting resolutions and, and uh, practicing and conceptualizing all different human rights. So that's one, accountability. Um, Two, I'm going to stop. I'm going to Chloe. Oh. I'm going to stop you and only give you one because I know that we're coming up to our time, and I want to um, give time to um, yeah. Oliver and Marie. But I think that accountability is a fabulous one, and I think we can flip it. And the, the obstacle to overcome in order to pursue it is consistency. Um, and I think that if that can be a goal for us, then that is, yeah, that is fantastic. Marie, mm -hmm. Oliver. Where would you send us in the next 15 years of R2P? Well, I think I would answer with another question. And this question would be, will we still be talking about R2P in 15 years? <laughs> because if if R2P is becoming such a taboo and, and, and is not going to be used as such, and we're just going to play around with the words of responsibility uh, rather than using R2P per se, then the question is, will we still be talking about R2P in 15 years? And I'll let you... I'm, I'm probably I'm probably just as as negative. I I'll I'll out myself here, but the, the upcoming book manuscript I'm playing with a subtitle calling the rise and fall of a good idea, um, but I'm not quite sure that's going to go down well with the publishers. But but no, but I think I think what I find interesting is is precisely how there was a you know there was a moment when um, when in a way Kofi Annan came came about and and in 2005 and and reclaimed that territory because. The ICIWS, as we all know, didn't have a good time of it. It coincided with 9/11 and, and and invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, and it wasn't nobody. Everyone was talking war on terror. Nobody wanted to talk about this stuff, and it was really Kofi Annan who brought it back to the table. And there was a certain momentum. It, it echoed also with the human security debate and others. Um, and again, human security in many of our circles here, also in government circles, is on the way out too. Now it's all about it's about preventing and and countering violent extremism, and it's about uh, it's it's a different vocabulary altogether. So what I find interesting, as in general terms, is how these these notions have a shelf life, um, and they are there. They're a vehicle that allow us to pursue a conversation. There are certain essentials, perhaps, of this conversation that we will continue having in 15 years' time. In, obviously, we will continue talking about mass atrocities and preventing them and and how to deal with them. But perhaps it won't be in R2P terms. It'll be in something else. What that is, we <laughs> we don't know. Um, but I think it's 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 the content that we're interested in here. Um, but but often it's the it's the vehicle that allows us to make something of that content um, that 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 we also need to focus on. And I, I find that very intriguing. <laughs> the the semantic yes, aspect. Yes, I, I think that's 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 exactly right. And one of the many reasons that all of us will look forward to reading um, your research that comes out of your paper. Um, I'm sure that some of us on this call, whatever happens, will still be talking about RCP in 15 years. Um, but yes, let's really try and keep our focus on the content. Um, and it's part of, I suppose, a big fight for the juncture that we're at of what human rights protections look like in a post-pandemic world. Um, it has been such a pleasure to be with you. I'm so, so, so sorry and upset for having such terrible internet signal throughout the first half of this session. Um, and for interrupting what otherwise were just three fabulous papers. I wish we were together. The last thing I'm going to do and abuse my position, even though we're four minutes over, so I'm also being a terrible timekeeper, um, is I'm gonna put a link in the chat to a seminar series that we will be hosting in 
with our partners at the European Centre for the Responsibility to Protect um, over the remainder of 2021, exploring really some of these questions. Um, and our first event is going to be looking at how European states can, or, or if they can, domesticate their own responsibilities to protect in their domestic and in their foreign policies. So I'm sure we'll touch actually on aspects of all of the fabulous papers um, we had today. Um, and other than that, enjoy the remainder of the conference. Thank you ever so much for joining. A virtual round of applause for all of the fabulous panelists and for the organizers. I wish now we could go and have some cold white wine in the sunshine, but alas, we just have to melt into the internet ether. Um, but look forward to seeing your faces soon. Thank you.
unmute myself. There we go. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome back to panel nine on lessons from responses to responsibility to protect situations. Our panel chair for this session is Jeff Gifkins from the University of Manchester. Um, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Okay, great. Hi, um, thanks, Patrick. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, yes, I've got a, a great looking panel. I'm diving into some case studies as well as looking at rebuilding. Um, so I'll just introduce the, uh, the panellists briefly and then um, hand over to them without taking up their time. Um, so we're starting off with uh, Masha kovic Dai from the University of Ljubljana uh, and then Agata Letkowska uh, from the Institute of Law Studies at the Polish Academy of Sciences. Then up we have um, Adewale Adeboye from the West African R2P Coalition. Uh, and then finally, last but not least, a joint paper from Cecilia Idika Kalu and Eloha On Anogi. Uh, and they are respectively from the University of Massachusetts, Lowell, and the University of London. Um, so we've got 15 minutes per paper. You're familiar with this, um, this pattern by now. Um, and I'll give you a, a gentle reminder in the text at, um, at two minutes left. Uh, and that'll leave us um, 30 minutes for discussion after our four uh, papers. Um, yeah, so without further ado, could I hand over to Masha? Huh. So, are you, do you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Uh, I'm having some trouble with this. So. <laughs> I, I did a practice run in the practice session, everything worked okay, but here it seems like it won't, it'll give me a little bit of trouble. So let me try this again, the sharing of the screen. Um, okay, so this should work now. You see my screen, my PowerPoint presentation? Okay, perfect, thank you. So welcome again uh, to our conference today and to the second day. And we've heard some really interesting discussions already so far. Um, so I hope that mine can at least to some extent um, trigger some of your interest after a long day of discussions. Um, I've decided to look into what is the role for R2P in the post-conflict rebuilding process, especially because I was wondering um, how can we kind of connect together what was written in the ICISS report on the responsibility to rebuild and then what was adopted by the states in the 2005 World Summit outcome, outcome document. And as you already know, there's no discussion on the responsibility to rebuild in that in the outcome document, but I still thought that there must be a way that we could include responsibility to protect also, I mean, the responsibility to protect and its preventive elements also in this post-conflict rebuilding process. And specifically why I thought that was necessary is because when we looked at different conflicts, also when, um, when the conflict is done and when, the, when there's been ceasefire agreements and peace building or peace treaties have been signed, there's still um, the emotions among the population and various groups are still kind, uh, are still high, and there's still a lot of um, polarization um, around. And so um, there's still a threat that the conflict that the conflict might ignite again. And so um, there is, I believe, there is a need for for some kind of a preventive action and preventive elements also in this process. And, and there's a recent, a very recent news that came in the last few months um, out from Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is a really, I think, a nice example why we need to think about R2P also in the post-conflict process is this news that came out in the media that there's apparently the exist, there exists um, a document on redrawing uh, the Bosnian borders along ethnic lines and actually more than 25 years after the genocide in Srebrenica, there's still this idea that the solution is not okay and that, you know, and also the fear what these kind of ideas might bring um, 
among the population and you know restart a conflict that was really really difficult and very difficult to conclude or find um, a solution to it and um, most of the literature focuses on the prevention of the r2p um, the i mean on the prevention of the four r2p um, atrocity for R2P crimes in the first place, so that how do we prevent them from even happening? But there's, I feel, a little less focus on really, you know, how to um, prevent them from re-happening again. Um, and so how to include them in these past conflicts rebuilding the debates. And not just the example of, um, of um, um, of this example of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also history in general has shown us that there are parts of the world that are repeatedly um, grounds for armed conflict, maybe every 50 years, maybe every 100 years, and that even the emotions uh, from previous conflicts can be very quickly reignited and they come back up and um, uh, contribute to, to, to the conflict. And so when I look at the, at the text, or when we look at the text of the paragraph 138 of, of the um, 2005 uh, summit outcome document, we see that there's no real um, time limit um, as to when the responsibility to protect should be, uh, should be used, this principle should be used. Um, and so it's, it's, um, it's an obligation or it's a responsibility that the states have continuously. So they need to continuously protect uh, their population. This, this is an ongoing responsibility in all kind of circumstances, uh, in all kind of circumstances, yes. And, when, and it was kind of even um, confirmed earlier today in the presentation of, from Adrian Gallagher, who said that, I mean, who kind of showed that R2P crimes can also happen in states with high, really uh we're never really in a situation where we can you know sit still and say this does not happen here where we are and um we really need to ensure that these uh, preventive elements of r2p which i'm sure i do not need to um go into further detail into them here these are just some some examples of them that they need to be respected at all times and We've talked about this also yesterday at the presentations. This is not just something that states have to um, exercise externally in the sense that they have to look at other states, whether other states are um, fulfilling these um, preventive elements and are respecting human rights, um, have a, a lively civil society, independent press, are educating people, training people, have a justice, a working functioning justice system, and so on. But they also have to ensure that this is, um, this is these preventive elements are uh, fulfilled inside the states, in their state alone. And we said these here on the slide, I've just pointed out a few of them because I thought it'd be interesting for my further, um, further um, discussion or further presentation. But there's also a lot of other preventive tools. I mean, Simon Adams already talked about those yesterday in his, um, his um, keynote. To, he, he said that they are working on these to, to, to show them to the government of what all can be done, what kind of action can be all done to ensure that um, we protect the society from these um, four um, RTP crimes. And we need to really ensure, on, it's on all of us, it is to ensure that we continuously call off call on our governments to use these preventive tools and that these preventive tools and elements are actually functioning in every state. And when we look then at the post-conflict rebuilding, um, we notice that generally states who have suffered uh, massive crimes, who have suffered these violations, the four or two P crimes, are actually very eager to create all sorts of barriers so that these crimes won't reoccur. But um, the question that I've had, and, and this is what I'll be looking into is, is are they actually really taking the necessary steps to set up such barriers? And for that, I actually decided to look into 
the case of Libya and the Libyan, Libyan rebuilding process that is right now going on, because Libya was one of the cases with the R2P, um, uh, where the Security Council adopted the R2P resolution um, to, to, um, to take action. But um, 10 years, well, nearly 10 years later, we are still talking about Libya and we're still not, we're hardly starting um, a rebuilding process. Um, there was um, an important conference um, that took place in January really last year, uh, January 2020, the Berlin Conference on Libya, that was where the Secretary General, together with Germany and 11 other countries, um, decided to create, or like together, they created a new political impetus and rally and rallied the international support to find a solution for the conflict in Libya uh, to prevent um, and to actually provide um, preconditions for a, for a very Libyan-led and Libyan-owned owned, owned political process that can or would end all the hostilities and finally bring lasting peace to, to the country. And as part of this uh, Berlin conference, a document was prepared and issued as to what would be the roadmap or as to what needs to be uh, carried out, which actions, activities should be done to ensure this um, lasting peace. And so just to summarize some of them, there was calls to measure and dismantle armed groups and militias. There was a call for arms embargo, of course, support for a transparent, inclusive, and effective political process. They set up a Libyan political dialogue forum, which is right currently just have just decided on the new uh, members of the of the um, council uh, and the, the or the presidency council and the prime minister. Uh, there will be elections in December for the House of Representatives. Um, they've also called on to restore and respect the integrity and uh, unity of the Libyan executive, um, uh, legislative, judiciary, and other institutions. Also, integrity and unity of other sovereign institutions in Libya, respect for humanitarian law, human rights law. There's the monitoring of hate speech, which has been an issue in Libya, and also setting up um, a strict follow-up process, all under the auspice of the uh, United Nations support mission to Libya and generally other uh, international organizations such as the European Union, the African Union, and the League of Arab States. So since my time is kind of running out, I, I, I prepared a very short presentation, so I won't go into further details of this process, but what I did notice is that um, there was no, uh, no direct call, no direct mention of R2P in these documents. And I do feel that, to conclude, that R2P preventive action in post-conflict rebuilding is essential because it prevents further uprising in conflict and conflict reignition. It sends a message to the international community that there is a um, real intention for rebuilding and for maintaining or at least like achieving the, the, the peace and security in the area. It also acts as a learning element for the rest of the world for reconciliation, reconstruction, and healing um, as sort of an example of good practices but um as i said mentioned before this at least this case of libya there has been no mention of the r2p crimes and i do believe that um this this should be addressed in these in these discussions because mostly i mean we talked earlier today in one of the presentations that the question kind of posed on is, are we acting, are we taking R2P preventive um, action, even if we're not specifically calling it R2P? And in my opinion, I think that at least a reference to the four R2P crimes should have been made, because then it can actually, then we can connect all these um, rebuilding processes and all these preventive activities taking place within this uh, rebuilding processes, we can connect them to the R2P. And so to, to 
conclude, I believe that in this case, at least in my opinion, that the post-conflict rebuilding process in Libya lacks, lacks the, this RTP preventive action. And that since considering what has taken place in Libya, that um, refer, referral to these four R2P crimes should be included in the rebuilding process. Um, thank you for now, and I'm welcome for questions later on. Perfect. Thanks, thanks so much, Marsha. Um, and you're under 15 minutes too, which is unheard of at <laughs> conferences. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Um, okay, so next up we have Agata. Um, yes, we can see you there. Um, are you ready to switch on your, your things, Agata? I guess I do, although I didn't know if I'm visible. We can we can see and hear you. Oh great! Then I'm ready to start. Great. Okay. Um, in my paper, um, I would like to answer the question: um, What is the scope of the uh, RTP in face of the uh, right to self determination of the persecuted nation? Um, in the face of the uh, right to self determination of the persecuted nation, um, I believe that it is an extremely um, important topic. But highly unexplored. Uh, it both uh, sets the limits um, of the RTP uh, intervention as well as proves an existence uh, of an important party for states undertaking intervention in the framework of RTP, uh, which standpoint should be taken into account in every stage of the intervention. In my further analysis, um, I will rely mostly on the report of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty. In the first place, um, I would like to uh, explain how I will understand the right to self-determination. Of course, it was broadly recognized during the era of decolonization in support of uh, people struggling for self-determination. And today, outside the colonial context, the right to self-determination is discussed usually in relation to national or ethnic minorities which may claim the right of secession from the parent state. Contrary to this, um, I would like to go back to the original meaning for the term right to self-determination as understood in the late 18th and early 19th century. Self-determination was viewed then in a more universal way as the national and political unity of the state. Thus, uh, it was not an entire nation forming a state which was entitled to the right to self-determination, it was an entire nation which was uh, entitled to the right to self-determination. In such a universal understanding, a right to self-determination not only means that all people can freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development, as well as possess a uh, right to have effective representation. It implies, first and foremost, that the nation which possesses all of these rights provides the substance to the status. In turn, it involves that the unimpeded realization of the right to self-determination is indispensable for the proper functioning of the effective government. The nation has the right to choose its representation, to determine the political and economic system it feels most comfortable with, and the choices cannot be questioned or undermined by any internal and external efforts. And, as we all know, the effective government is often considered to be the most important criterion of statehood, indicative of the genuine creation of the state. Thus, when the nation is prohibited from the realization of its right to self-determination, since the state's government or the political system are forcefully imposed on the nation, even eventually, even the statehood may be undermined. This is exactly the situation of Belarus. I am aware of the different sociological and historical debates about the origin of people living in Belarus, which question the notion of the Belarusian nation. And nevertheless, there are also numerous research uh, which support the existence of the Belarusian nation. I didn't have time to dwell into this discussion, but for further analysis, I will assume that there is the Belarusian nation indeed. So, 
uh, the Belarusian nation has the right to self-determination within the boundaries of its state, Belarus. It has the right to choose its representation, its government, and decide about the political, economic, and social system it wants to establish in its state. Nevertheless, it is prohibited to do so, since the group of people which possesses control over the state institutions, army, and other coercive organizations, with President Alexander Lukashenko in its lead, has the physical power to impede the realization of their right to self-determination. In addition, they also uh, has uh, received support from the abroad, mainly from Russia. Uh, during past presidential elections, the Belarusian nation clearly stated that it no longer views President Lukashenko as its representative. Despite the official results of the elections, a number of observers claimed that the elections were falsified. Some independent monitoring groups reported the overwhelming victory of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. However, majority of states, instead of recognizing her as a new president of Belarus, they called for the new elections. Only Lithuania recognized Tikhanovskaya as the new president of Belarus. Uh, the alleged falsification of the presidential elections caused the mass protest in all major cities in Belarus last summer. Uh, Lukashenko regime replied the mass violations of fundamental human rights. Uh, on the streets, police used unnecessary force uh, against peaceful protesters, including rubber bullets, water cannons, and stun grenades. It also happened that the police fired live ammunition. Uh, one of the protesters was run over by the police vehicle in Minsk. Some claimed that the police hunted for individuals. Consequently, protesters, activists, and journalists were arbitrarily detained. Thousands of people were arrested. The Tunis described torture and other examples of ill treatment in detention centers. People were beaten, forced to lay down or kneel on dirt at the naked, to mention just a few examples of less brutal instances of treatment. According to the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the events that unfolded before and immediately after the elections have led to a human crisis of unprecedented dimension in the country. Moreover, the situation is further deteriorating. According to the latest UN High Commissioner report, criminal charges were increasingly brought in the context of protest. According to official resources, between 9 August and 30 November, more than 1,000 criminal cases were opened against peaceful protesters, opposition members and supporters, journalists, human rights defenders, lawyers, peaceful protesters and persons crit critical of the government. On 15 October, the general prosecutor announced that for criminal cases involving breaching public order, prosecutors would immediately initiate criminal proceedings and call for the maximum sentence. I could invoke many more examples from the report, but my point is that cases like the regrettable death of Vitold Ashurov or the arrest of Raman Pritasevich are just the top of the iceberg. We all know very well uh, what, that one of the fundamental principles of the responsibility to protect is that where a population is suffering uh, serious harm as a result of internal war, insurgency, repression, or state failure, and the state in question is unwilling or unable to halt or avert it, the principle of non-intervention yields to the in international responsibility to protect. Without a question, uh, the, uh, the nation of Belarus is suffering serious harm due to the ongoing repressions of the state of Paritis. Lukashenko regime is not only not going to stop the persecutions, but it is also going to hit harder into opposition uh, opponents like the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights report proved. Consequently, it seems that the responsibility to protect is applicable to this case without any doubt. We are all also aware that the responsibility to protect addresses three specific responsibilities. Firstly, the responsibility to prevent, to address the root and direct causes of man-made crises, putting population at risk. Secondly, the responsibility to react. And thirdly, responsibility to rebuild. Uh, when it comes to the responsibility to prevent, uh, the report of the International Commission on Intervention in State Sovereignty pointed out that the international community has at its disposal some policy measures that are capable of making the difference, the so-called preventive toolbox, starting from political and the diplomacy measures through economic and legal steps, ending up on military ones. 
Thus, in most difficult situations, these measures may take the form of the direct coercive steps, such as economic sanctions or the consensual preventive deployment of international forces, such as the UN Preventive Deployment Force. Nevertheless, the indispensable condition to use any of the measures from the toolbox is the political will. Since Alexander Lukashenko became the president of Belarus in 1994, it is true that Europe regularly condemned the violations of human rights in that state, but it also seems that the Western states somehow got used to the existence of this vast dictatorship in Europe. In the past, from time to time, Lukashenko permitted for some manifestations of apparent freedom. He allowed the members of the opposition to win seats in 2016 parliamentary elections. At the same time, he freed all political prisoners and relaxed visa restrictions. He also did not support Russian actions in Crimea and Ukraine and demanded lower prices on Russian oil. In response, the EU and the USA lifted many of their most restrictive sanctions. Because both the EU and the USA believe that the promise of economic concessions can change the situation in Belarus, also in other fields of economy. Nevertheless, there were never signs that the last dictator in Europe suddenly seeks to become a diplomat, bind his state with the European Convention of Human Rights, and sets new standards of the rule of law. All these manifestations of liberty were just the small screen to receive some economic benefits. Thus, the international community failed to fulfill its responsibility to prevent mass violations of human rights. So now let's turn to the responsibility to react. According to the uh, report of the International Commission on International uh, on Intervention in State Sovereignty, coercive measures may include political, economic, or judicial measures, and in extreme cases, they may also include military action. So I'll start with this most extreme one. The commission sets a few criteria which allow for the military action. One of them is the just cause, which means that military intervention for human protection purposes is justified in two broad sets of circumstances, namely in order to halt or avert a large scale loss of life or a large scale ethnic cleansing. So far, there were no media reports um, that any of these two um, circumstances occurred. They were also not mentioned in the report of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and also she did not mention them before the um, Human Rights Council. Thus, the condition to, under, to undertake these most extreme measures uh, are not complied. So, uh, as the International Commission suggests, the coercive measures short of military intervention, including in particular various types of political, economic, and military sanctions, should be applied as part of the responsibility to react strategy. I don't want to dwell into different types of sanctions or specific measures that should be applied because it is not my, it is not my goal today. Rather, I would like to focus on the way that it should be applied. The report of the International Commission mentions rights to self-determination three times, but neither of them uh, addresses the problem of how the right to self-determination should be taken into account when uh, realizing the responsibility to protect. I also look for some indications in this regard in the report of the UN Secretary General implementing the responsibility to protect, but also this act that doesn't refer to the right to self-determination. Why is it important at all? As mentioned before, the responsibility to protect may be applied to a variety of situations, including internal armed conflicts, insurgency, or situations where uh, international crimes are committed. However, most often the responsibility to protect could come useful in cases when the government denies the right to self-determination of a nation by persecuting it and violating its rights. Thus, this nation, an entity which provides substance to the statehood, as claimed before, is still there, but it cannot pursue its legitimate rights and have its proper representation. In the report of the International Commission, the responsibility to react embraces different kinds of intervention, which is understood as action taken against the state or its leaders without its or their consent for purposes which are claimed to be humanitarian or protective. Even if the intervention within the framework of responsibility to react is taken without the consent of the state's government, it seems obvious that such an intervention cannot be taken against the will of the nation, 
which has the right to self-determination and the right to decide about the future of the political community it forms, a state. Otherwise, the intervention within the framework of responsibility to protect would be nothing more than another attempt by powerful states to impose its will on the fragile nation in a politically complicated situation. What would it mean? No coercive measures, especially those far-reaching that could influence and irreversibly touch the state's economy or society without the consultation with the, state's with the nation's representation. No military sanctions, I don't mean the military intervention, without the consent of the nation. No exclusion from the international bodies without the attempt to replace the representation of the previous government with the delegation of the nation. No talks about the new constitutional laws, even temporary ones, without the deciding voice of the nation. Obviously, taking the decisions about sanctions in New York or Brussels in the company of Western states without trying to reach any persecuted, maybe conspiratorial representation of the nation is far easier. But in my mind, that is not the way the responsibility to protect and especially the responsibility to react should be enforced. On the other hand, I strongly believe that the political will and feeling of responsibility to react to mass and flagrant violations of human rights should also mean that world leaders should listen to such nation as it knows best internal situation and can report about state's needs on a regular basis. It doesn't mean that sanctions are supposed now to be a wish list of the persecuted nation, but they should be established at least after discussion with the best informed people. The very last pillar of responsibility to prevent, the responsibility to rebuild, cannot do without the nation that forms a state on every stage. The International Commission suggests that this element of the doctrine is needed, is needed particularly after a military intervention. I don't agree with that. It is needed in every case when the state finds itself in a moment of transformation of its political and economic system. A state like Belarus, after the turn to democracy, will need as well as a state after the military intervention. Non-corrupt or properly functioning judicial system, return of sustainability, including access to health, education, and basic services, and reform in other areas, eradicating corruption, promoting good governance, and long-term economic regeneration of the country. Thank you. And sorry for being a little bit over the time. Well, that, that was perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Agata. Um, yeah, fantastic. Very interesting. Um, so next up on the list, we have um, Adewale, who I think I saw earlier on the um, list, but I can't see at the moment. Um, Adewale, are you here? And is there anyone who's heard from him? Um, I briefly saw him on Gather Town just a little while ago, but um, unfortunately he seems to have disappeared. He, he dropped off this list. I, I wonder if he's yeah. having, um, you know, connection Possibly. difficulties. Um, so we move to um, our fourth paper then. Um, and then perhaps come back to him if he is able to, to rejoin. Um, so the next paper is, is Cecilia and Aloha. Um, Cecilia, are we expecting your co-author or, you, or are you presenting for the pair of you? I'll be presenting for the pair of us. Just just yourself. Okay, fantastic. Are you are you okay to jump in now? Yes, please. Great. Thanks very much. Over Hello everyone. Thanks for having me on this panel. Um, please give me a second. Let me share my presentation. Of course, that's fine.
Great, we can okay. see your, your presentation now. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm Cecilia Idikakalu from the University of Massachusetts Law. Unfortunately, my co-presenter and author, Eloho Onoge, cannot be here. She sent her warm regards. Um, from 2019, Eloha and I began a, a work looking at R2P within the context of Northeastern Nigeria and um, West Africa at large with the conflicts that are ongoing and the results of um, humanitarian challenges and human rights challenges. And we came up with um, structures on how R2P could be implemented and be useful within the context. However, our work has evolved over time and is still evolving. And it's one of the reasons why I appreciate your um, comments and insights. As against the general, um, the universal approach of responsibility to protect as um, a UN concept and how it plays out in different contexts, given sovereignty of nations, we're looking at it this time around from a kind of bottom-up approach that has more to do with um, implementation and usefulness, regardless of um, nomenclature, the, how it is named or what it is called, but to take the ideas and the ideals and make it useful and see how we can bridge that gap to make it useful in spite of the, the challenges of context to the West African situation of conflict, especially as driven by insurgency and Boko Haram um, ISWA and SAR and other terrorist groups and insecurity challenges, including headsmen in the area right now. So given that um, um, context, I'll just dive into it. We're, talking, we're, we're, we're looking at how um, we can fine tune foreign policy to fight insecurity on um, humanitarian and humanitarian intervention challenges in using Nigeria as a case study. The, we'll look at the questions and the, the problems that the study tries to address and the uh, theoretical approach with which we look at it, the, the methods that we have applied and then our, our general preliminary findings. So before I talk about the research problem, like I said, specifically we examine human rights infractions and foreign policy by the governments in power, um, taking into account sovereignty and look, taking, protecting their own sovereignty and the response of global powers to the humanitarian issues given um, national sovereignty, especially in Nigeria. Over the last decade, um, over 4,000 lives have been lost not just to Boko Haram, but to the terrorist groups I mentioned in Northeastern Nigeria. Hundreds of thousands have been displaced as we speak and um, hundreds have, of women have suffered sexual violence of the most gruesome kind. Unfortunately, which, what underlies this study is the fact that the unlike globally noted and named conflicts and wars, um, there is a massive loss of human lives without the labeling of a war, but more lives have been lost in um, different con conflict settings around the world. Boko Haram has used more women for, as suicide bombers than any other terrorist group in history ever, apart from the LTTE. And apart from suicide bombing, um, still utilizes women as weapons of war in different context. Uh, again, that's a background to um, stud to our study. So we look at Boko Haram's tactics and insecurity in Nigeria currently. Boko Haram being the, a case in point, but largely speaking to other insurgent groups and the activities of, um, of you know, those that perpetrate acts that cause insecurity and have, and have led to so many loss of lives, including the current headsmen um, infiltrating different parts of the nation, of the state. And then we look at the complex nature of humanitarian intervention and um, foreign policy that would speak to atrocity prevention that may lead to crimes against humanity. What kind of intervention as expressed, especially by the West, 
have we seen so far? And how does that tie to tie into the responsibility to protect? We 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 use um the you said and the interventions of um the Department of State of the United um, the United States DOD and Amnesty International as expressions of interventions in this context so far. And so we also look at the gendered impact on human rights violation and vulnerable groups because we are, we are um, in our research, we're looking at marginalized and vulnerable groups directly, and women are representative of that in our study. We asked the question, what is the agenda for response by Amnesty International and USAID on human rights issues from the insurgency in northeastern Nigeria, and how is this being deployed? We also, we also consider what will a coordinated framework to manage the twin challenges from terrorism and the government in power in the localization of human rights? Um, how will these interventions look like? Because there's a challenge of the insurgency and there's the challenge of um, not a lack of effort, but a lack of outcome and results in stemming the tide of human rights abuse, loss of lives and crisis in, in Nigeria so far. So, and we also see a, a protection of the idea of sovereignty with the continuous narrative and framing of government efforts for over a decade with, uh, uh, you know, a speedily declining situation in terms of loss of lives of 4, 000, over 4,000 and counting. And it is still not yet named, um, it, you know, crimes against humanity. It is still not named as a situation that will categorically be um, put forward as you know a situation that requires intervention at, under R2P. So how do we engage in such a way that um, rights will be protected and this um, protection will be implemented by some way, shape, or form? What will a coordinated framework in in that direction look like? In considering this, um, our methodology is using a case study. Sorry, excuse me. I think um, my slides, okay, sorry. I need to talk about the theoretical approach, the theoretical framework first before I go to our methodology. The reason why we chose this framework to work with is because it accounts for addressing um, humanitarian issues, addressing issues that have to do with vulnerable groups in in um, precarious situations that are mostly described by the global south, that do not have the kind of context that we have in the west and in some other parts of the world. Specifically, when we look at Western Africa and Nigeria, one is the deep deprivation and the poverty that you find that is difficult to to navigate exactly how that plays out and affects the lives of people, especially when matched with other or compared with other global contexts. So to be able to come up with a framework that we can begin to look at addressing um, protection issues in this context, we believe that you should, we should come at it from a lens or a perspective that has a localized approach and has and we can use the capabilities approach. You can look at the work of um, in human rights of Cohen Feta, and he had talked about this in detail and described how a coordinated um, framework that uses local research from the local perspective that engages with the perspective of learning as the basis, the, the perspective of um, learning and documentation of issues from the perspective of the local can inform appropriate um, ways to approach, address, understand, and also proper solutions for their situations. In this case, atrocity pre prevention. Amatea Sen um, has over time you know, giving us one of the most seminal studies and theories that, that gives us a good platform to also engage when we talk about global um, concepts and solutions and allow us to cascade it to the local context of many nations that are way on the other 
part of the spectrum of um, being less privileged and understand how we can make solutions that will match their needs from that capabilities approach that gives them some form of agency and gives them some form of um, definition to prove to driving solutions that will work within that context. While this is not new to many of us, we are saying in this study the the gap we're trying to see is how we can make atrocity prevention and the whole concept of R2P not just theoretical um, um, ideas and pillars that will you know will keep should I say recirculating the knowledge we have about it and the arguments around it, but to some extent begin to make it implementable in spite of the challenges, especially of sovereignty, which we see inhibiting um, um, human atrocity preventions in many places. So we do this by um, using a case study of Northeastern Nigeria and um, we have we we did a method in different comparison of these agencies that I described as expressions of interventions within um, the humanitarian crisis in Nigeria so far, and how their policy and interventions look in this context. What other ways the United States and other global powers are stepping in to actually show a coordinated attempt at stemming the tide? of human rights issues outside of the context or you know in tandem with the united nations and on their own so we look at how this works out while we also do a phenomenological um study and interviews to get primary data on on the experiences of these marginalized groups with um, terrorism with the mass deaths and lots of lives with displacement and other loss of rights that they have experienced, especially the, the numbers that are, are dying by the day in this, in this area. So our preliminary findings from um, archive, archival research studying um, documents online and, and looking at so far the studies and um, research intervention models that the the US and um, Amnesty International have used to find a disjunction so far between foreign policy and human rights in Nigeria. That is to say, there is, is um, there's a slight, there, there is a gap that needs to be filled that can actually make the, the billions of dollars that are being invested useful to stem the tide, to stop at, at, at atrocity prevention as much as war cannot be reached directly. And they have, actually done a lot in terms of offering support to the to the to the military and invested in governance and in the government by so many ways we have listed in the paper but for the purpose of this um, presentation this is a summary we see that we have all of these levels of intervention but it is it, there's still a lot to be done to come to the grassroots level and actually um, stop or stem the tide of abuses that are still ongoing. And then we look at how we um, fine tuning of policy, of foreign policy and human rights intervention for um, atrocity prevention can actually be done and play out by actually engaging with um, local groups. This to some extent is already ongoing. However, they are not, a, a lot of them are not the drivers of what is going on. There's still a bit of the overlap or the imposing of what um, intervention should look like and what um, is what should be done to help people that deal with local contexts of abuse and how that abuse looks given the cultural context. Things like reintegration, things like um, dealing with the stigma and of abuse and things like um, giving people you know, an opportunity to live, to have a, a, be upskilled and capacitated to have a new lease of life and actually have the opportunity, even in displacement, to access, you know, benefits of a better quality of life. But, but primary to this is the idea of stopping or stemming the tide of the mass loss of lives and death given this context and how local intelligence can be factored into this to 
um, provide the insight that we need to, to, to actually lead us to manifest details of atrocity prevention beyond theory, but making it into practice. I think that, that's what I'll describe as the core of our work, bringing it to practice as the whole global idea of respons the responsibility to protect and the norms that surround it is still evolving as we know it is. But the challenges that we find, in, especially in our clients, they're not just evolving, they're degenerating by the day. And we hope we don't look back a year or two years later and say, oh, actually, we have lost millions of lives, more, way more than the Rwandan ge genocide we, we still keep referring to. But because this was not declared as an outright, outright war, we just watched the lives bleed away decade after decade without any assertive form of intervention or action. So I'll, I'll round up there in concluding. We look at um, basically this is what I've described, stopping the attrition effect at human rights because it's, it's a slow and gradual attrition. We won't even call it slow anymore because the first time we started at this was two years ago. And like we know, the, the conflict started way over 10 years ago. It was about um, five years ago that 300 girls were kidnapped at the same time from a school in, in Chibok in Nigeria. And there was the global outcry. Um, till date, we don't have all those girls back yet. But after then, we have witnessed um, several other kidnappings in similar measure. And it is no longer news anymore, much like the loss of lives. It's no longer making the news. Um, and there is no, and because the, the lack of media outcry is, is just a part of the whole um, situation. We have people on the other side, you know, making, you, you say it is doing a lot, but we're saying that the tide has to be stemmed at with um, greater seriousness and alacrity, at, you know, engaging as much as we can beyond, in addition to the billions of dollars, a local knowledge and engagement that will stem the tide. So I'll stop there for now. And once more, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Patrick Butchard and um, Dr. Jess and your team for giving me this opportunity. I really do appreciate it. I welcome your questions and um, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sibelia. And um, yeah, everybody stuck very well to time. So thank you for that. Um, I, I can't see Adewale in the list. Um, at this stage. So I think we move to questions um, and if he arrives shortly, we can add him in, but um, yeah, otherwise we can just, um, yeah, focus on questions. Um, so if uh, if you would like to ask a question, can I just ask you to either, um, you can write it in the chat um, here or in Gather Town. Um, I think Patrick's monitoring Gather Town questions as well. Um, and, or raise your hand if you if there's anything you would like to ask. Um, so over to questions. Great. Um, jo Joanna, um, I can see you there with your hand up. Yeah, if you'd like to go. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I just have a question for um for the speaker number one. Um so the, the lady who talked about Libya, um uh, she said there was a big uh, very important conference in January 2020 regarding the Libya um sponsored by the UN. Um, does she have any information about how is the situation right now? Did this roadmap work? Um, is there a civil war still going on? Um, so if she has any information about the, the, the current situation in Libya and, uh, and her, her, her opinion about it. Thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. So we've got another um, hand up. Um, so we'll take a couple of questions and then we'll go back to the panel. Uh, so we've got Pina next. Thank you, Jess. Um, I I have two quick questions, actually. The first one is to um, Cecilia, and I wanted to ask her 
uh, in terms of the policies in general? What about the internal policies in the case of Nigeria? So how do you think that we can reflect on this? And the other question is to Agata, and I would like to ask her, how do you think that placing the case of Belarus uh, under the title of uh, self-determination of peoples in relation to R2P would help? Do you think that this is um, this would prove productive or counterproductive in terms of making things more open to controversy? And I would like to thank all panelists for their great presentations. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank, thank you, Pena. Um, are there any other questions at this time? Um, maybe people need a little bit more time to think. So shall we go back to the, uh, the panel then? So there was a question for each of the speakers. Um, perhaps we should go in order of, of presentation. So if we could start with uh, Masha. Yes, hello. Do you hear me and see me? Okay, perfect. Yes, so um, I mentioned the Berlin Conference in Libya, which took place in January in 2020. And at that conference, there was um, 11 countries met together. So among others, China, France, Russia, United Kingdom, Germany, US, Egypt, United Arab Emirates, Italy, Congo, and a few others. And they actually, as I said, they created up this roadmap, this actually this whole process, rebuilding process with suggestions on what needs to be done. So right now, currently, this step is underway. And mostly they've been meeting quite often um, every month uh, to discuss the, the steps that need to be taken. And actually the first steps or the, what they're actually working on right now or through what they're meeting is the Libyan Political Dialogue Forum where they're setting up um, the, the Libyan institutions. So they've already met a few times on that and they've already had let me just find the exact details. They already had elections uh, for the um, for the presidency council. So they actually uh, elected three um, members of the presidency council, and also the um, the current uh, prime minister, or what they call it, the prime minister for now. And from here on, they're now preparing the elections to be carried out in December. So there is supposed to be these democratic elections. Um, as as of, um, we'll see if that is still kind of questionable, questionable or still, um, we don't know whether these elections will really take place place or not. Um, so that's that's where the situation is right now. The last time they met was in uh, at the end of May, only a few days ago, um, where they where they actually had these um, these elections for the for the presidency council and the separate elections for the head of the government um, among the participants. Um, and we'll see now from how it'll go on. Yeah. So that's where the state is right now. But they are actually meeting every every month, so it seems quite promising that something might might come out of this. Great. Thank you. Um, could we go to Agata? Agata, if you'd like to respond uh, to... Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, of course. Um, well, I actually think that it could be quite productive because I th uh, think, as I said in my presentation, that uh, it feels like the international community seems to remind itself about Belarus just uh, when there is, are... And the situation of human rights is uh, very much deteriorating in the country and the situation is not good all the time. So I think that um, the responsibility to protect uh, should not work uh, only uh, in times of the very heavy crises, but uh, the responsibility should be uh, bared by the uh, international community all the time. So I think that applying uh, RCP to, to, the, to Belarus uh, should be like a reminder, like the uh, kind of alarm to the international community that it should work uh, all the time and it should um, remember also about the uh, support uh, for the nation and not only uh, about imposing next sanctions because this is not 
all uh, that is required and this is not only responsibility it has towards uh, the uh, the Belarusians. So, so yes, I think it's, it, it can be quite productive in Zurich migration. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. And if we could go to Cecilia um, with your honest question. Okay, thank you, Peya. Um, regrettably, the internal policies by the government does not seem to be doing much. Um, I hate to say, it, but it's been over a decade or more since the challenges be began, at least in full swing. And from then till now, all we've been seeing is a recycling of ideas and people in power with minimal results or none at all. Instead, a deterioration of the crisis is what, what has been the trend. The, the lack of or very poor governance is a critical part of this discussion. And that is why, like the example I gave with the kidnapped girls and ongoing kidnapping of students and closure of schools, because students can't go to school, over 600 schools have been closed because the, 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 the insurgents have made a habit of kidnapping students from schools, especially girls. And we don't see anything being done about it over time. We have you can look at three or four um, government agencies that are at play that would expect some form of result or action from, you know, based on their activities, the army, the armed forces, the civilian joint tax force, which is a combination of government agencies that have been trying to stem the tide within the northeastern Nigeria, FEMA, the federal um, emergency management that you would, is tipped in attempting to meet the humanitarian aid gap and works with um, non-profits, global and local, non-profits being the fourth one I was going to talk about, to try and build um, some capacity for the people in, in, um, in distress and in this context. But you see, of all of this, um, for, for the military, the Joint Tax Force, we keep seeing the recurrence of violence. In, um, we could even call it an exponent because it seems to be growing. Sometimes it ebbs and it increases again and um, we've not seen much change. For the FEMA, they rely on government funding, but also a lot of um, the humanitarian intervention from um, non-INGOs, non-profits, local, um, global bodies have been really, really um, the source of um, support for what we have for um, IDP camps and the, the thousands and growing numbers that are living there with the increased um, violence, everything from um, from healthcare kits to just sanitary packs to food to you know the barest minimum have been provided by these groups because we do not see a lot happening from the government um, angle. You know I could go on about it, but I would I'll still share our paper to get your comments and get um, further insight because we included this before. Um, after the conference. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you for that. May I add just one thing that I forgot to mention earlier? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, just to answer the question of Joanna, I did want to say or point attention to that all these talks are being kind of led by the United Nations uh, support mission in Libya. So there is this overview and support from them in all these discussions that are currently going on. But unfortunately, there is um, quite some negative um, activity going on too. And the, and the fact is that the militias, they continue to uh, provide um, or continue to engage in human trafficking still and enslavement of migrants um, and other asylum seekers that are trying to find their way over the Mediterranean to the European Union. So we can still see that these militias are still strong and that this the 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 attempts to this this arm aren't haven't been as successful as they're hoping them to be. Great, thank you. Um, do other people have questions? Either um, you can raise your hand or you can um, type them in the chat, whatever you prefer. Uh, we do have time for another round of questions.
Um, while, you, while you're thinking then, I had a question uh, for Masha. Um, so you said that the um, you haven't found, so discussion of R2P or the four crime is missing in the, the documents that you've analysed um, on Libya. Um, so why why do you think that is? Do you have a sense of, of why those those terms and concepts are being avoided? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, it could be looked in in two ways because there are there is there are calls for um, human rights protections. There are calls for it's for respect of um, humanitarian law. There are all these um, these calls are in there that are also part of the R two P debate and part of these R two P preventive actions. So, I mean, it could be also in one way interpreted that it is included in this in these talks in these documents. Through through that through that uh, perspective, but for me it seems like, or that's that's only my opinion, is that there there is really no direct um, uh, discussion or mention of the four crimes, and unless we have that or no direct discussion or mention of R two P, the word responsibility to protect, and if we don't have that, I find it then hard to extend these preventive measures also on, onto these crimes. But as I said, that is particularly my, my opinion. Why that is, why that is happening, I, I don't really have an argument. I mean, I maybe, I, or I mean, it could be the reason that it's just right now, we don't, like majority of the people don't see that R2P is something that you we should be really considering from that perspective in the rebuilding process. The majority of the literature still sees that we have to prevent that in this first place from it even happening. And once we've done that, then let's focus on other things in the rebuilding process. And these are like we're setting up the institutions that are gonna work, that are gonna ensure that these crimes might not happen or will not happen again. So I think that might be the reason why that is not included, but it's, Purely just my opinion, yeah. Okay, thank you. I guess I wondered if um, um, it was because there has been some backlash following the um, backlash against R2P through the Libyan case. I guess I wondered if there was some um, effect from that in that particular situation. It, it, it could have been as well, yeah. That, you know, they just don't want to, they, they don't want to use that in, in the in here as well as it's been yeah considered as you mentioned also like uh, mm -hmm. um, the overstepping of the RTP mandate and uh, taking down the regime or changing the regime through through the RTP but they do not want to really really use it in in this in these discussions at all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I can see um, hands there. So Pina, would you like to come in? Thank you, Jess. I just wanted to add on what Masha has just said about Libya and in, in relation to your question. Uh, when we were researching on the Libyan intervention from the EU perspective, we were studying the uh, statements of France, the UK, and um, we also looked at the, at the statements of um, the US, etc. So in, in general terms, in their references regarding the justification of the intervention, even France, which is a staunch supporter of R2P in different milieus, even for Cyclone Nargis, it was putting forward the argument for the uh, responsibility to protect. They did not necessarily refer to R2P in any case. Like in the resolution, there was reference to paragraph 138, but we didn't see the Security Council invoking the international community's responsibility. And um, in that regard, in counter statements as well, we didn't see such reference. They were talking about Gaddafi's regime. They were talking about democracy. They were talking about um, freeing the Libyan people, et cetera. So even in terms of their justification, despite the fact that Russia later on, in terms of vetoing the uh, decisions on Syria in the Security Council, saying that this is what Libya did, uh, like, the R2P language was not there. Of course, this doesn't mean that Libya was not an R2P case, but in terms of implementation and in terms of the mentality to operate on Libya, I don't think that R2P is there from the very beginning. Thank you.
Sorry, Jess, will you unmute then? You're muted, Jess. Sorry, that was my bad. Um, I was just saying that I, I couldn't hear Vasilka, but you're welcome to um, ask your question. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jess. Um, I just wanted to comment actually on this situation with Libya. I think perhaps an important dimension of this entire situation is also the fact that the European Union member states have been immensely affected by the huge um, migration influxes happening through the Mediterranean Sea and the responsibilities engaged by especially the southern European states, uh, Italy, Malta, and so on. So perhaps the reason why um, even uh, European um, P5 uh, uh, states wish to detract from R2P languages in order not to engage any kind of responsibility of the European countries, the EU, but also the UK, until it was still a part of the European Union in saving lives at sea. The um, UN Human Rights Committee recently decided in uh, two famous decisions that actually there is a possibility to even establish this jurisdictional link of the European states for saving lives at the high seas, so even outside of their territorial jurisdiction. So, this is a landmark decision because no other judicial or quasi-judicial body has ever interpreted um, jurisdiction in such a broad manner. And um, that even further possibly, um, let's say, um, dissuades <laughs> the European states to use any kind of responsibility language when it comes to saving uh, people from Libya. So it is just a comment, it's not a question. Okay. Great, thanks, thanks for that, Mazzucca. Um, are there any other comments or questions before we go back to the panel? No, okay. Um, then perhaps we could go back to the panel um, for perhaps, yeah, responding to those comments and then um, and any sort of closing final remarks that you have to share. Uh, if we go through in order, uh, starting with Marsha. Sorry, this is so slow. The system is so slow before I press and it all turns on. Um, anyway, yeah, I don't really have any more comments, but I do think that the, the comment that Vasilka mentioned is is really on point and um, it might that might be one of the reasons as well. I think it's a very um, possible <laughs> um, reason, yeah. So thank you for that addition. <laughs> Great, uh, thanks, Marsha. Um, Agata, do you have any, any final um, comments or reflections? Um, I just wanted to thank for my co-panelists and for, for the uh, question because I think it was a very good one and reflective and I will take it into account and while preparing the text for the publication and thank you for the opportunity to be here. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It's really interesting. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and Cecilia, do you have any, any final comments? Yeah, very, very briefly, I I still struggle with the question of why, while um, responsibility to protect and its norms is debated or contested in various ways in terms of intervention and implementation, I dare say globally, what are the best ways that we can still engage to keep the spirit of these norms and these laws alive in, you know, actionable ways that will be relevant to people relevant to the world, you know, produce actual outcomes over time. 
So those are just my final thoughts and mm -hmm. open-ended questions. And really, thanks, thanks, um, Patrick, for your work and helping me be here. And to Jess, thanks. You're very welcome. Just on that last point, Cecilia, I, I'm a I'm a pragmatist when it comes to R2P, and um, I guess I remain optimistic for incremental change over time. Um, and I think, I mean, we can see that in terms of, you know, shifts from, you know, China's position on R2P, which is, you know, has changed considerably um, since R2P was um, was developed. Uh, and we can see it in, in Myanmar with, I think, the first real um, civilian movement, you know, really tied to R2P and with, with um, civilians calling uh, for action in the name of R2P. Uh, so I think there's, you know, there's there's change happening. Um, I think the 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 norm is um, is developing and deepening over time. But I mean, obviously not as fast as any of us would would like. And there needs to be a lot more um, a lot more action in this area. Um, so I think if there's no more um, questions, we might wrap up a little bit early. We we have run um, a bit a bit early because we were missing that that fourth paper. Um, yes, but um, thank you so much um, uh, to the to the three presenters that we had today, um, and we've got a little gap here now before the the next session. Um, great. Okay. So thanks thanks everyone. I'll see you soon.
Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final substantive uh, panel, um, apart from our keynotes. Um, welcome uh, to the panel on international courts and the responsibility to protect, which will be chaired by Blake Lawrenson from the University of Leeds. Uh, just before we start, I just want to note that um, this has been an international conference spanning many different time zones, and one of our panelists today, Raymond, is um, presenting at an exceptional hour in his uh, local um, local time zone. Uh, I think it's about half 11 where he is um, at night. So thank you very much for joining us. After this panel, we'll have a short break and then we'll go straight into um, our keynote with the two UN Secretary General Special Advisors. Um, but I'll introduce that session a little bit later on. I can see that some people are still joining us now. We've got some watching on YouTube and as usual, some taking part in Gather Town. Um, so Blake, over to you as chair. Hi everyone. And again, just to echo Patrick's thoughts, it's a pleasure to be chairing the final panel for what has been an excellent two day conference. We've seen some amazing scholarship being developed in the field and it's been a real pleasure to see these papers and I wish you all the best for the development of those papers. For this panel, we're going to turn our attention to some very interesting papers on international courts and the responsibility to protect. And we have three speakers, which I will now introduce before we proceed with the presentations. So the first speaker is Raymond Kunsun Lau, who is a lecturer in history at Hong Kong Baptist University. Our second speaker is Luciano Pisano, who is a lecturer of public international law at National University of Kodo. And then finally, we have our third speaker, who is Martin Menneke, who is an associate professor of international law at the University of Southern Denmark. You all have 15 minutes to present, and I will let you know when you have five minutes to go in the chat. So without further ado, we will begin with the first paper from Raymond on sequencing R2P and the ICC. Rethinking International Responses to Mass Atrocities in Africa. Raymond, you have 15 minutes and the floor is now yours. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, if I can ask, am I audible and visible to you all? Can you guys hear me and see me clearly? Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, once again for uh, Dr. Blake Lawrenson for uh, your very generous introduction, and thank you also uh, for uh, Patrick for giving me this opportunity to share uh, some of my uh, preliminary thoughts okay, on today's topic, uh, rethinking international responses to mass atrocities in uh, Africa through sequencing out to be in the ICC. Uh, okay, can you guys also see the PowerPoint slides? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Th thank you. Okay. So, uh, as for uh, today's topic, okay, sequencing uh, out to be nice to see, uh, but rethinking in national responses to mass atrocities in uh, Africa. So, uh, just uh, my starting point, okay, for today's presentation is against the backdrop of the Rwandan genocide in 1994. Uh, and the intervention in Kosovo in 1999, uh, there has been evidence of changing international expectations in terms of uh, responding to genocides and mass atrocities in a more effective and consistent manner. Again, given the shared uh, mission of how to be an ICC in terms of ending mass atrocities, there has been a tendency, uh, particularly among scholars and policymakers to frame R2P and the ICC as if they are always inseparable and mutually in re reinforcing. But uh, as I'm going to highlight in today's presentation, okay, these two, perhaps the most innovative uh, uh, response mechanism which have been born uh, in the past 20 years, R2P and the ICC, they have actually displayed some very fundamental differences in terms of their different motivating logics, different emphasis, and different instrumental logics. And in many ways, 
there has also been relatively little attention like being paid in terms of examining the precise relationship like between the R2P and the ICC. Okay, so what I'm trying to do okay, in today's presentation, I have two objectives. First is to, again, okay, making sense of how we can uh, make a better use of the international protection and punishment efforts in terms of addressing genocides and mass atrocities in a more effective and consistent manner. Second is by assuming that these two response mechanisms are not always uh, mutually reinforcing or complementary. This is also about understanding the principal causes of tension existing between the R2P and the ICC. Okay, and the argument that I'm trying to make uh, in today's presentation is situating the R2P and the ICC in what I call a protection first, justice later temporal sequence is crucial to manage the tension between the immediate imperative of saving lives and the important longer term prospects of punishing perpetrators and deterring uh, future atrocities. And in order to put my uh, argument in a more context specific manner, uh, what I'm also trying to argue here is that this protection first justice later approach tends to be uh, more effective in addressing genocides and martyr atrocities in Africa because of first, as I'm also I'm going to elaborate a bit more on this. Uh, the R2P, uh, its roots, its intellectual roots it could be found uh, are closely related to Africa. And second is there is a need for international policymakers to mitigate the growing African backlash against the ICC. And through the adoption of this protection first and justice data approach, by highlighting the importance of civilian protection first, this may help uh, mitigate okay, this growing African backlash against the IC, uh, International Criminal Court. So what I'm trying to do uh, for today, uh, 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 three things. So the first is we are going to have a very brief overview in terms of understanding the relationship between the R2P and the ICC uh, through examining two major schools of thoughts. Second is I'm going to highlight some of the fundamental difference and as well as the source of tension existing uh, between the R2P and the ICC. Third, um, uh, uh, last but not least, is I'm going to elaborate a little more about the rationale for adopting this protection first justice later approach in terms of addressing again, mass atrocities in Africa. Uh, in terms of understanding okay, the exact relationship uh, between uh, the R2P and ICC, uh, roughly speaking, okay, there are two major schools of thoughts okay, which uh, could be identified here. First is what I call the mutual reinforcement perspective. So according to this uh, schools of thoughts, so this is about uh, highlighting ICC as if uh, a coronary of R2P. In other words, uh, according to this school, okay, ICC is being treated as a powerful tool for the enforcement of the uh, R2P principle. And for, just for example, okay, Ban Ki-moon, the UN Secretary General, uh, in his uh, 2017 implement, implementing uh, the Responsibility to Protect report, he once suggests uh, ICC is an essential tool for the implementation of the uh, Responsibility to Protect principle. Uh, but the same token, okay, the ICC Chief Prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda, he, she also once uh, highlighted that the ICC, the court itself, okay, could be seen as a tool in the R2P toolbox. So in this sense, uh, according to this school of thoughts, this preventive aspect of R2P can actually help advancing the pursuit of international criminal justice. In other words, uh, R2P and ICC, their relationship, according to this school of thoughts, could be seen as uh, a strong, mutually complementary, or even dependent. Okay, the second school of thoughts is what I call the clash of two cultures uh, perspectives. 
So this is about highlighting again, the fundamental difference between the uh, political nature of the R2P as well as the legal or the judicial nature of the uh, ICC. So according to this school of thoughts, it is of utmost importance okay, to avoid the court being too closely associated with the uh, uh, R2P principle. And the, rest, the reason is because the court is not necessarily helpful for the R2P's effective uh, implementation, as well as the prevention of the imminent mass atrocities. Um, so these are basically the two major schools of thoughts which could be identified in terms of understanding this exact relationship between uh, the R2P and the ICC. And what I'm going to do next okay, is about uh, highlighting some of the fundamental differences okay, between these two response mechanisms. So notwithstanding uh, their shared mission of ending uh, mass atrocities, uh, there are some fundamental differences okay, which could be identified here. The first uh, fundamental difference is the different motiv motivating logics okay, between uh, R2P and the ICC. So at its core, okay, R2P is primarily concerned with saving lives uh, or civilians under uh, immediate danger and threat. Okay, while at the same time, okay, the ICC is primarily uh, motivated in terms of uh, prosecuting and therefore punishing perpetrators after the fact, according to uh, the mandate being given by the Rome Statute. Okay, in terms of uh, their different emphasis, okay, R2B is uh, concerned with mitigating the direct impact of violence on those vulnerable or affected populations, while the ICC is primarily uh, concerned with holding perpetrators accountable through uh, the implementation of the principle of individual criminal responsibility. So in terms of okay, their different instrumental logics, okay, R2B uh, could be seen as the, uh, could be understood okay, as highlighting the international society's readiness to save lives and protect vulnerable population. While well, the ICC as the world's very first uh, uh, permanent international judicial institutions. So it is about the courts attempting to carry out its judicial intervention in ongoing conflicts, or some call this in-conflict justice. So in terms of understanding the, 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 the crucial source of tensions between R2P and the ICC, there are three major sources of tension that can be identified here. First is the conflicting time frame. So what we're talking about here is two separate issues facing the national policymakers. First is about the issue of carrying out uh, intervention today in order to stop the immediate massive violations of human rights and the issue of upholding justice for perpetrators after the fact. In fact, there has been some uh, 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 inherent mismatch okay, between achieving this long-term and long uh, short-term and long-term humanitarian incomes. Okay, the second source of tension is the conflicting language. So the clues of the problem here is about whether addressing mass atrocity is being perceived as an international criminal justice problem or as an out-to-be be intervention problem. So here, perhaps the immediate danger that can be identified here is about relying or over-relying on the ICC in terms of its uh, prevention of the recurrence of atrocity crimes. Okay, the third source of attention is the conflicting institutions. So perhaps the most important point okay, being highlighted here is the uh, political driven function of the UN Security Council uh, and the judicial nature of the ICC and its concern with the IC, uh, with, with justice. Uh, so what I would like to talk about uh, last uh, is about the rationale of 
the adoption of this protection first justice later approach. So my uh, argument here basically is that situating civilian protection and perpetrator punishment in the proper temporal sequence would have a significant impact on outcomes. And the rationale here behind is, or the assumption, theoretical assumption behind is the path-dependent processes in politics. So this is about focusing on not just what, but when. So this is about highlighting the importance of the temporal ordering of R2B and ICC. So why this approach, in my opinion, tends to work uh, particularly uh, well in Africa? Uh, there are five particular reasons. First is this, uh, the R2P okay, has a lot to do okay, with the international community's failure to address the Rwandan genocide. And this is what uh, Jennifer Walsh called the Rwandan Rwanda effect. And second, as many of you may be aware of this, uh, the, the emergence and development of R2P, uh, its origins could be largely contributed to the Francis Ding's concept of sovereignty as responsibility. And we can also see uh, very obviously Kofi Annan's the then UN Secretary General, his efforts in terms of driving the emergence and the consolidation of the R2P principle before and after uh, 2001. And in terms of uh, the R2P, we, what we can see here is the very consistent uh, support okay, among the African countries. While at the same time, okay, the ICC okay, has somewhat suffering uh, what I call an African problem. As we can see, the turning point perhaps is 2009, okay, when uh, the Sudanese president, Elmer Bashir, okay, was uh, being uh, 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 subject okay, under uh, the ICC's uh, 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 arrest warrants. So what we're seeing here is a growing backlash uh, of the ICC among the African countries. So in this sense, uh, some of my concluding thoughts here is uh, the prospects for having a timely effective response in any given atrocity situation will ultimately depend on the uh, perception and the priorities of international policymakers. And so it is very important for us to be cautious by not overemphasizing the deterrent effect of the ICC. And the last point that I'm trying to make here is the why prevention again, remains the most important aspect of the RTP principle. As we can see, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, emphasis is being, in place, is, is being increasingly placed on the atrocity prevention of the RTP, but still, it is very important for us to understand that the deterrent potential of the international criminal justice cannot replace R2P or render R2P responses not necessary in addressing the atrocity situations. So this is uh, basically what I'm trying to uh, share for uh, today. So thank you very much once again for everyone's uh, attention. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, at the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your paper, Raymond. Really interesting ideas that you're putting forward. So I'm hoping people will have plenty of questions and very interesting discussions with you on that. And thank you for staying on time. We will now move to the second paper from Luciana Pisano, which is titled The Order and Provisional Me Measures in the Genocide Case, Revisiting the International Court of Justice's Contribution to R2P. So the floor is now yours. Thank you, Blake. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be uh, at the conference here from Argentina. I have a presentation to share. Uh, here. Okay. The ICJ's 2020 order on provisional measures in the case application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the Gambia the Mark, offers an excellent opportunity to explore RGP in action from a judicial perspective. I propose a reading of the 2020 order through the RGP lens. 
This reading is based on two ideas. First, in the order, the International Court of Justice yields a language closer to our to be than ever. And second, by submitting the dispute to the court, the Gambia has not only exercised a right under the Genocide Convention, but it also fulfilled its obligation to prevent genocide and as a member of the international community, its own R2P regarding the Rohingya. I will expose briefly these two ideas. The 2020 order is unique in the ICJ's case law on genocide for several reasons, one of which is its particular language. Why can we hope that the ICJ use a language close to R2P? In paragraph 52, we can read, the order we, we can read, the court observes that the provisions of the convention are intended to protect the members of a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group from acts of genocide. The key in my interpretation is, of course, the verb to protect. It's important to stress that the ICJ never used the verb to protect in its previous decisions on genocide. It's true that the court has recognized it in its 1951 advisory opinion that the object of the convention is to safeguard the very existence of certain human groups. And in, in its uh, 2007 judgment in the Bosnia versus Serbia case, the court reaffirmed that understanding and it added, the object and purpose of the convention as a whole is to prevent the intentional destruction of groups. So one can argue that the spirit of these decisions by the court is the same, and that there is no legal difference saying that the object and purpose of the genocide convention is to safeguard the existence of certain groups or to prevent the intentional destruction of those groups or to protect those groups from genocide. It is true, there is no legal difference, but in law, words matter. And the choice by the court is by no means superfluous from a conceptual point of view. The verb to protect is also absent in the convention itself. Why did the court use this verb? The verb to protect has some meaning in the context of provisional measures. In Article 41 of the court statute, uh, it's used the verb to preserve, but in, in the case law on provisional measures, the court used the words protect and protection. But in the 2020 order, there is a link between the protection as a function of provisional measure and the protection and as the object and purpose of the convention. You can see the first thing of uh, the protection in paragraph 56 of the order. The court says the function of provisional measures is to protect the respective rights of each party pending its final decision. And the rights claimed by the Gambia and for which is seeking protection, namely the rights of the Rohingya group in Myanmar and of its members to be protected from acts of genocide are plausible. We can see here this uh, particular meaning of the word protection in the context of provisional measures. But the second meaning that related to the object and purpose of the convention is that on paragraph 52 already quoted. The immediate origin of this linkage between the two meanings of the verb to protect, provisional measures and object and purpose of the genocide convention is in the application itself. In paragraph 126 of the application, the Gambia seeks to protect the rights of all members of the Rohingya group. And protection of the rights that are the subject of the present request for provisional measures, a first meaning, uh, protection as a function of provisional measures, coincides with the very object and purpose of the convention. 
the second meaning of the verb to protect. We have here the two meaning linked by the application in the case. So we can hold that the court has acknowledged that the object and purpose of the convention, of the genocide convention, is to protect the members of certain human groups from genocide. But we know that there is another source for a link between the verb to protect and the crime of genocide. Of course, the World Summit outcome document and its responsibility to protect populations from genocide in paragraph 138 and 139. Does the use by the court of the verb to protect mean that the court has embraced R2P? There is no evidence to support such a conclusion, but it will be a first step to that end. And it does mean that we can read the order through the R2P lens and the, the order itself is compatible with R2P. It's important to stress that since R2P is not a legal norm, the court does not need to address it by its name, but it, it can apply the norms of the concept grounded, for example, the Genocide Convention with a protective approach. This conclusion uh, leads us to the second idea I propose. Under the traditional view, the submission of a vicious before a court by a state is a right of that state. And Article 9 of the Genocide Convention recognizes this right to state party. I hold that there is a link between this right and the obligation to prevent genocide in Article 1 of the Convention. We all know that the ICJ, in its 2007 judgment, set up several criteria to assess whether a state has duly discharged the obligation to prevent genocide, which includes the capacity to influence the action of the perpetrator. The obligation to prevent genocide is an obligation erga omnes and regarding the Genocide Convention, an obligation erga omnes partes. According to the court, the obligation is not territorially limited by the convention. So one can argue that the Gambia, as a state party in the convention, has the obligation to prevent genocide against the Rohingya. But one can also argue that, for several reasons, its capacity to influence is virtually non-existent, and therefore there is no breach of its obligation to prevent. But the 2007 judgment reads, a state's capacity to influence will depending on its particular legal position vis-a-vis -vis the situations and persons facing the danger or the reality of genocide. A state party of the convention accepting the ICJ's jurisdiction under Article 9 could be in a legal position capable to prevent genocide through judicial settlement. Therefore, as other authors like Sean Singh and John Hayek already pointed out, the submission of the case before the court could be seen as a fulfillment by the Gambia of its obligation to prevent genocide against, against the Rohingya, and not only as the invocation of a right under the Genocide Convention. It is clear that the Gambia seeks through the traditional measures of the court protection for the Rohingya from genocide. Its actions could be seen as an exercise as a member of the international community of R2P. As Simon has pointed out, and he reminded us yesterday, the Gambia, the smallest country on the African continent, has already done more to uphold its responsibility to protect than the entire UN Security Council. End of quote. If we see the order on provisional measures and the whole case through the RTP lens, we can conclude that the case allows exploring the ICJ's contribution to RTP. That contribution could be twofold. First, as a judicial form of the responsibility of international community through Article 9 of the Convention and subject, of course, to the court's nature as a judicial organ. Since the obligations from the convention are obligations erga omnis partes, all state parties can submit a dispute if the conditions of Article 9 are met to the court. And especially as the Gambia did, they can request 
provisional measure. This is a manifestation of the collective dimension of RCP, the responsibility of the international community in action to the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. Second, we can see the court's contribution as a means to reach to a more precise interpretation of the scope and meaning of obligations of all states under the Genocide Convention, with their implications to R2P, following the path drawn by the court itself in the Bosnia versus Serbia case. The 2020 order is, in my opinion, a significant step on that path, not only because the court has used the verb to protect, but also because the court has considered in the same paragraph 52 of the order that there is a correlation between the rights of members of groups protected under the Genocide Convention and the obligations incumbent on state parties. In other words, that human beings have rights under the Convention. This is an idea, an idea that was implicit before, but now the court affirms it explicitly. The 2020 order shows us that in the search of a new approach to Pillar 3, the judicial dimension of R2P through the ICJ and the Genocide Convention could be seen a possible answer. Yes, this is a optimistic reading of the order and perhaps an idealistic view of the topic, but believing in R2P in these difficult times requires a bit of optimism. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luciano. Again, a really interesting paper on a very relevant and recent topic. Um, so last but certainly not least, we will move on to Martin Menike's paper, which is titled uh, Myanmar, the International Court of Justice and Responsibility to Protect. So the floor is now yours, 15 minutes. Thank you, Blake. And thank you also to Vasilka and uh, Patrick and their team for, for organizing this conference. Um, very, very good, really, that you were able to put this together in these difficult times. Very happy to be on this panel. Uh, when I first saw the program, I was a little afraid um, that this is the last panel and um, a bit difficult, maybe, but I'm really uh, happy with the first two presentations. I think this will be a very interesting discussion. I really enjoyed Raymond's and Luciano's a take on this situation. So I'll follow right from where Luciano left us with the same issue, this ICJ uh, matter between the Gambia and uh, Myanmar. Um, first, I, I just want to say at the outset that um, for me in, in doing research on this case, I was very interested in uh, looking at the uh, case from a practical perspective, to what extent it could uh, maybe help us to better understand how R2P could be um, applied in practice and implemented. And I think that has also been interesting in some of the other sessions to see how, how some of the other topics maybe uh, feed into this um, issue of impact of our research and, and how important that is, uh, I think, also in light of what, what Simon said yesterday in his session. Um, I wanted to go through three uh, general topics. One is uh, how RTP links to accountability, and that, of course, links my presentation also back to Raymond's. And then second, uh, how the R2P um, form links to the ICJ, and then finally look at this particular case with Myanmar and uh, the Gambia. Now, as Raymond already said, I think it's very obvious when you do um, just a little bit of research on this question, then it's impossible not to see that there is this postulated link between accountability and responsibility to protect. Whether you go through the, the main journal in our field, the global responsibility to protect, or whether you go through the um, annual reports by the UN Secretary General, or you look at the debates in the General Assembly, you can do a word search and there will always be something about impunity, the impunity gap, accountability, and how important this is to address in the context of R2P. What's maybe even more uh, striking is, as uh, we also heard already a little earlier, that there is a very, very big focus on the International Criminal Court in this regard. 
it is as if accountability basically means international criminal court. There is not so much on linkages between RTP and transitional justice, maybe, or how other processes that uh, could be relevant in such a situation uh, fit into the RTP framework where they contribute, where they maybe uh, raise tensions. But it is very much about the ICC. That is, of course, also very prominent in the um, interventions that have come from the uh, by now basically previous prosecutor of the ICC, Bafatu Bensuda, who has written on that and has also spoken to that, that she sees this clear connection between R2P and the ICC. Now, I, I think I would disagree actually on, 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 on a few points that, that Raymond made, and, and maybe we could come back to that in terms of whether there are so many conflicts between the two. I think the problem is, is more that there's a very single, narrow, uh, simplistic uh, road from R2P uh, to the ICC, and that has led to um, an over-focusing on this um, ICC uh, institution in our uh, field. Now, Myanmar is interesting because Myanmar has, of course, brought up a number of different um, accountability uh, matters and accountability matters, and that has maybe also helped then to uh, diversify a little bit uh, the conversation. Many of you will, of course, know that besides this ICJ case, um, there is also an ICC um, angle to the story, a very narrow and uh, fragile one that links um, to Bangladesh's uh, membership in the ICC Assembly of States parties and to the question of whether those who were forced to flee to Bangladesh can establish jurisdiction for the court and that would then open the doors for the ICC to look at certain acts, but not all obviously even in that uh, specific uh, um, campaign, uh, genocidal campaign against the Rohingya. But uh, that, is a, that is one aspect really, um, because there's others as well, and, and maybe Luciano can, can later speak to that. There's an uh, angle from Argentina where universal jurisdiction proceedings were started a couple of years ago, um, actually by the uh, uh, Rohingya diaspora that is based in the UK and that uh, found an uh, an avenue there and uh, is collaborating with one of the former UN special rapporteurs, uh, Tom Quintana, who's here on the photo and who is helping this universal jurisdiction uh, proceeding against Aung San Suu Kyi in uh, Argentina. There is this new um, independent inv investigative mechanism for Myanmar that is not prosecutorial and cannot do any cases, but is uh, evidence and is only paralleled by the Syria mechanism, and that is really a, a new creation for international criminal justice. And then you have also these various uh, domestic efforts that have been criticized roundly by many uh, civil society groups and Myanmar experts uh, for, for just being um, uh, smoke screens and efforts to, to please the international opinion, um, but not really to look into accountability. But all that is just to say, Myanmar gave them rise to a very wide discussion of uh, linking atrocities prevention of atrocities and accountability. And that led me then to, to look at the uh, International Court of Justice. And what, what I find really interesting and something to, to pass on and to reflect on uh, as, a, as, as a scholar in this field is that there is very, very little um, on the role of the International Court of Justice. In fact, to, uh, for example, look at the RTP, which, which many probably know and have used, which is, I don't know, over a thousand pages, over 50 different individual chapters. There is uh, nothing on the ICJ. The ICJ is not even listed in the index uh, as, as a necessary uh, subject to, to uh, go back to. Uh, there is one single article that I found that uh, has a very uh, theoretical um, uh, treatment of this issue, and that is written by uh, in Siberia, who, who is uh, based at the University of Oslo and who put out this book in 2013 on institutions in RTP, and there he has a chapter on the ICJ. But I wanted then to, to look um, a bit more closely at this matter, and of course also inspired by this uh, judgment that Luciano mentioned uh, a few moments ago uh, from 2007, which is really making it the more uh, surprising because this came two years after the World Summit Outcome document, where the ICJ stipulated that Article 1 of the Genocide Convention has this 
legal duty to prevent, which raises all sorts of questions in terms of how it relates to R2P, how they interrelate, and how they can uh, reinforce each other and how they play a role for each other. So um, when you look at the ICJ, there's a number of reasons why this relation will be difficult uh, with R2P. Some of you will know the ICJ, even though it is sometimes referred to as the World Court, has very limited uh, accessibility. It's based on consent, as so much in international law, obviously. And here the access is even narrower because it's through the UN Genocide Convention, because the other R2P crimes don't give um, access as there are no specific treaties uh, linking crimes against humanity, for example, to the ICJ. And as we all know, RTP is not a, a legally binding norm as such, so there's also no way to, to go with our research to the ICJ. So this makes it already rather narrow. It's a, it's a matter of genocide, and, and that is, of course, well known as a difficult issue uh, for international law uh, to work on. Um, then, I'm sorry, there's a little mix-up here in the slides. So then uh, the ICJ has... Uh, uh, is pretty notorious for um, being weak on uh, maybe evidence issues. It's not comparable to an international uh, criminal court. It does not have any standing for victims. It does not um, show, uh, for example, the difference of individual and collective uh, responsibility. Really sorry about the slides, guys. Um, I, uh, last point I want to mention as an issue is that um, the ICJ is also rather slow, and that, of course, can make it another uh, challenge to bring it together with uh, prevention in situations where atrocities are ongoing. But having said that, I think it's worthwhile for us to also look at the potential that the ICJ brings to the uh, RGP agenda. And that is that the ICJ is, of course, the, the highest UN court and uh, yields a very a specific legitimacy from that fact um, and may for that reason also provide a form that is uh, perceived very different by by many states than the ICC that of course uh, has come to to be uh, controversial in some quarters uh, and uh, will always uh, have that baggage. A um, second uh, uh, reason to consider the ICJ very carefully is as, as Luciano also already uh, talked about this question of standing at the ICJ um, because as the Gambia has demonstrated, it is possible for states that are not even directly affected by the situation to bring this to the court's attention. So there's no need for a Security Council referral. There's no question of veto being in the way. It's actually an interesting question of uh, unilateral exercise here of Pillar 3 of a state saying that uh, we need to exercise the international responsibility. And finally, the ICJ is also, importantly, um, equipped with this notion of provisional measures, which uh, are a very fast moving um, institute. Uh, when you see the Myanmar case, for example, the oral hearings took place in December 2019, and only not even a month later, the court had issued these uh, provisional measures, which are binding under international law and uh, imposed on uh, the respondent here being uh, Myanmar. Now, when we look at this particular case, there's, of course, many interesting angles to the uh, Myanmar case, um, what it meant maybe internally uh, in Myanmar. There's others on this on this uh, session that, that will be better placed to talk about that maybe. But at the, at the uh, ICJ, the, um, the provisional measures were very interesting because they um, raised um, the Rohingya that had been absent also from the pleading that Myanmar gave at the at the court in December 2019, really a name and a status. They were part of this uh, by order by the court. The, the court order is not just about the Gambia, but also about the Rohingya. And the court imposed on Myanmar to report every six months on its implementation of these provisional measures. That's important. Um, because in the past, when Bosnia had started the case against the, the former Serbia, of course, that happened. Uh, the institution is now is trying to um, have a better sense of where things are going by by asking for these reports. That is a very interesting new element that may have a, um, an important RTP uh, uh, element uh, with it. 
Uh, for now, they are, uh, however, uh, not public. Uh, that is a point of discussion. There's a lot of uh, experts that are uh, suggesting the court make this public to allow for uh, more scrutiny and more discussion. Now, these provisional measures do not at all uh, decide the subject. Uh, um, there's many questions that still would be decided in a much later phase on the substance, including whether uh, this all is actually amounting to genocide. And the ICJ could this time not rely, as in the past in the Bosnia case, on the findings of another tribunal, as it did in the case of Bosnia with the ICTY. But here it would be on its own, and that, that is really a big question where the ICJ would land with that. Um, impact uh, from an RTP perspective, maybe something we could return to in the in the Q&A, uh, has been perceived rather critically also by some civil society in the um, in uh, this field that uh, Myanmar, yes, had engaged with the process uh, very prominently, of course, with Aung San Suu Kyi being the agent for Myanmar, but um, afterwards uh, really maybe not um, protected the Rohingya in the spirit of the provisional order. Others have said that this has been more than Myanmar has shown in any of the other international engagements. For example, it, of course, uh, will not engage with the ICC as a non-member state, so that's something that's also interesting to keep an eye on, whether this is a, an important aspect of the RTP role the ICJ could play. Uh, at this point, there are many questions. I, I saw yesterday also that uh, Ronan Lee already raised that with Simon. Maybe we can come back to that here also. Again, there's uh, questions, very complicated legal questions. Who actually is right now Myanmar in uh, front of the ICJ? Um, the ICJ has no set case law on that, but there's other uh, parallel scenarios, like if you think Venezuela, Maduro, Guaido, for example, before some investment arbitral um, tribunals. So there is some uh, practice for this. I think in the end, it boils down to what the General Assembly does with uh, Myanmar and who they will accept in the fall session at the GA in New York in the Credential Committee for Myanmar. Um, Importantly, the IJJ will have no role regarding these uh, new atrocities that have taken place. And, and Blake, I'm about to finish. I know um, the uh, final matter I just wanted to raise, also maybe for further discussion, is that I think if you look beyond Myanmar, um, there are interesting questions here. So in the Myanmar case, three states have already signaled that they are considering to join the Gambia. The Netherlands, Canada, and the Maldives have all said that they might join formally this case, which of course is again interesting from an RTP perspective as a collective exercise of this matter. In other scenarios, it may not be an open avenue because countries like China have, for example, appended a reservation against their ratification of the Genocide Convention, which makes it impossible to go to the ICJ. But Ethiopia, for example, has no such reservation. So that's an interesting one to, to think about. And at the end, I just want to um, uh, highlight that uh, together with a colleague of mine, Ellen Steenskul from the Norwegian Holocaust Center, we just guest edited a special issue that some of you may find interesting. We didn't take the title from Ronan, but it's similar, the failure of RTP in uh, Myanmar that uh, will come out very soon and may be interesting. And I wrote actually my ICJ piece up for the special issue. And I'm happy to hear from you or any comments or questions you might have. Thank you. And thank you, Blake. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Another great presentation. I think you'll all share with me our thank you for everyone's questions. Um, sorry, for everyone's papers. Again, really interesting, a really strong way to finish the panels for today. We have uh, around 25 minutes. Please now feel free to raise any questions that you have for the panelists. I think we have a question already in the chat box. I don't know if um, you can all see it, um, but I'll read it out. Um, this is to Raymond. Um, have you studied what ICC documents relate to R2P? I know that the ICC ASP meetings, Omnibus include a reference to R2P. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the question. So that's for Raymond. Are there any other questions before Raymond responds?
No. Feel free to respond, Raymond. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Blake, uh, for again sharing this session. Uh, I'm just reading this question. Okay. Have you studied what ICC documents relate to RTP? I know that the ICC has been leaders. Uh, yeah, okay. I, I haven't actually studied comprehensively about the okay, document that you have mentioned. Okay? But uh, as far as I know, uh, uh, just like I have just uh, uh, highlighted okay, during my presentation, uh, it seems uh, there has been a tendency uh, for the uh, chief prosecutor, okay, like uh, O'Campbell and uh, uh, Fedusa, for them to... Uh, frame uh, the treat ICC as if something a very important uh, uh, instrument in the so-called out to be toolbox and like you said uh, this is something like out to be an ICC mutual reinforcement school uh, but perhaps in my the reason why I am uh, a little bit skeptical about this is because uh, there seems to be a, a tendency okay, for international policymakers to uh, treat the ICC uh, as if it can provide uh, immediate short-term uh, uh, protection okay, for civilians under immediate threat, while the ICC is mandated to try, investigate, and prosecute those individuals after the commission of the atrocities. But it seems like the ICC has been constantly being used as something like a conflict management tool, or uh, in its words, uh, 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 leverage for diplomacy. And this is something I am uh, a bit skeptical in terms of, as if something like the, the court is being instrumentalized okay, either by the uh, UN Security Council, like in the case of the four, in the case of Libya, uh, or or the, or the court can sometimes be also instrumentalized by the state party itself, like we can see in the case of uh, Uganda, for example. Right? Uh, so this is also the reason why I said, I'm not saying or what I'm not supposing how to be nice should be totally separated. Since I'm I'm not talking I'm not talking about privatizing how to build ICC, but I'm what I'm talking about here is about sequencing with its two response mechanism. And it seems to me, uh, given the fact that uh, African countries, they have been consistently uh, enthusiastic about committing themselves to r 2 p while at the same time, what we are seeing is African countries, they tend to be uh, increasingly skeptical about the court since they many uh, uh, African uh, government heads of states, they tend to see the court is being biased against them. So if we can adopt this so-called protection first uh, justice later approach, perhaps that can help uh, mitigate uh, uh, their skepticisms over the ICC. But at the same time, this is also about promoting responsible uh, sovereignty uh, through uh, r 2 p So uh, I hope I've answered your questions. Uh, but I'm happy okay, to, to answer some of the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raymond. And we have a question from Martin. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks. I just uh, thought there were no other hands up, so I might as well uh, chip in. Uh, thanks for, for the good question from from, uh, from Jens here um, in, in Sweden. I, I think the reason why there's not more uh, to find in ICC uh, documents from the Assembly of States parties is, of course, that um, the ICC convenes over 120 states, of which not all have the the same positive view, maybe, of RTP, and they would, you know, have a very hard time to to spell that out in greater detail. And I think that's also when you now did an exercise and tried to put RTP and ICC together in these three pillars, and you talked, for example, about Pillar Two and said the ICC could um, function through what ICC experts call positive complementarity. The ICC could function as a facilitator, as a generator, as an assistant to national systems. That would, you know, for maybe for scholars make a lot of sense and say, oh, that's ICC being in pillar two. But of course, 
the whole language of this positive complementarity is very contentious among ICC member states. So I think that's just that's just not agreeable. So I think that's why it is so limited, and it's easier for Fatou Ben Souda, who can of course sit and make her own speeches, to to speak about it. But a question I would have to Raymond about this is that. I just wonder with your justice later, whether that doesn't sort of then also defeat the purpose of, of, uh, of what, what you said earlier about at least some overlap that you also identify and that you acknowledge. Because justice later could, of course, also mean that in the conflict situation, then potential perpetrators have no reason to hold back, right? And they can go all in because there is no immediate danger of this going somewhere. I mean, maybe there's later something, but who knows if they win, if they win the conflict, there's, there's no nothing coming afterwards. And I think there's, of course, always this question about um, empirical evidence for the deterrent impact of the ICC. But uh, if you look at smaller situations such as Guinea, for example, or the former special advisor on the prevention of genocide, Juan Mendes said that also about Cote d'Ivoire, for example, that the ICC was able to play a role even before the crimes occurred because the prosecutor made an announcement to the state authorities that she was watching them or she would visit the state and would meet with parties to the potential conflict to make them aware this may have cost. There's, of course, other examples where that doesn't make any difference. But I, I just wonder whether you're not with your effort to keep them apart or not... Um, you know, what is it in English? You throw out the baby with the water, and there's just a lot of problems that come uh, with that for, for atrocity prevention. Thanks. Okay, uh, okay thank you, Marty, uh, for your questions. Uh, but of course, uh, talking about the court, the ICC as the world's first uh, permanent, independent, international. Uh, judicial institution. I think it would be a uh, kind of uh, absurd okay, for the court okay, not to intervene okay, in those ongoing conflicts. Or I mean, in other words, it would be actually doesn't it, it wouldn't actually make much sense for the court just to wait until all those conflict situations are done. Okay, but what I'm trying to, to argue or uh, what I'm trying to say here is the court's attempt to uh, provide in so-called in-conflict justice in terms of uh, intervening uh, when the conflict is still ongoing. Perhaps uh, what matters here is the so-called signaling effect. Right? So this is about uh, sending the message to those perpetrators or to those potential perpetrators that we are watching you and there are consequences uh, 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 for your wrong deeds uh, or for those commissions of atrocities, crimes. But uh, the thing is, uh, if we are relying too much on this so-called signaling effect or the so-called deterring effect of the court, actually, the thing is, the court's attempt to provide this in conflict justice would not actually help uh, mitigating uh, or help saving lives okay, for those people who are under the immediate threat. Okay, not to say uh, ending those uh, uh, precarious but uh, political situations or political crisis. As we can see, the reason why the Kenya situation opinion is uh, can be suggested as a sober success story. Uh, or say the effectiveness of this approach is because, as we can see, when uh, R2P prism is being applied in this situation, okay, the political crisis, I mean, I'm referring to the post electoral violence in the aftermath of the 2007 and 2008 presidential election. As we can see, when the R2P prism was applied, okay, the crisis uh, was quickly mitigated and thereby citizens, civilians being protected from further bloodshed. Of course, uh, we can argue okay, uh, at the moment, the so-called Ocampo 6, all those uh, suspects, uh, cases against those suspects were being dropped. Okay. But the problem, or the issue at stake here is not about the court's uh, uh, inappropriate intervention, but this is about 
according to the, the chief prosecutor, this is about the issue of uh, 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 inadequate witness protection. Uh, so this is about those witnesses being too afraid to, uh, to uh, yeah, too afraid okay, to, 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 to testify okay, in, in, in front of the court. So this is about another problem facing the court, like other than the court uh, doing inappropriate uh, judicial intervention. So, so yeah, I hope yeah, um, uh, I'll answer your question, but thank you. Thank you, um, Raymond. I think we had a question earlier from um, Ronan. I don't know if you still want to ask your question. Cool. Yep, sure do. Um, look, superb panel. I'm delighted to to have been able to to listen to uh, all of those presentations. Uh, this is a question, probably mostly for uh, Martin or uh, Luciana, but I, 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 I probably would also welcome Raymond's contribution as well. Um, so, from the point of view of ordinary Rohingya in Myanmar and and in the camps in Bangladesh, they'll they'll tell you that the ICJ's provisional measures order was the first small taste of justice that they have had not just in their lives but you know in the lives of their parents and grandparents so from their point of view achieving even that was a success uh, it's also arguable about whether or not the fact that the icj is requiring myanmar to report to it regularly about the steps it's taking not to commit genocide. There's, it could be argued that that has contributed to a safer situation. I mean, only marginally, I must say, but a safer situation for those Rohingya who are still within Myanmar. So my, my question then is this, is taking cases, genocide cases to the ICJ as, as the Gambia has, is that likely to be something that will be that we will see increasingly done in the future? Because it's a method that can be used to put some limits on states that are accused of genocide. Great question. Um, thank you for that. We'll go, um, if it's okay, to Luciano first, because I think he also has a question or point to raise. So we'll go to Luciano first. Thank you, Blake. Uh, and it, um, my question is, is related with, with one. Um, I think that um, with a disorder, with this particular reaction uh, by the court, uh, we could have hope and on, on uh, a future uh, with um, more um, provisional measures of this kind. But um, in, in in this particular case, we, we have all the elements. We have a jurisdiction of the court under Article 9, no reservation um, by the respondent state, and uh, the respondent state went to the court. And uh, it's important uh, uh, to stress uh, because the, there was a response uh, of uh, Myanmar, uh, there are the, the exception, the objections uh, now, and uh, there is a response uh, by the respondent state. It, it is difficult to uh, to see uh, the, the future in, in this case, but uh, I, I think that uh, it's a significant step uh, on the path of protection, uh, on the path of, of R2P, uh, in the sense uh, of the genocide convention. And my question for Martin is related because uh, Martin, you you have uh, characterized uh, the, this uh, this action the, of Gambia as a unilateral pillar three, and and I am wondering uh, if it's truly unilateral because uh, the collective dimension I think uh, is given by the court itself. So um, if uh, a state asks the court, uh, an organ of the United Nations, it, it is the international community acting uh, through the United Nations like uh, paragraph 139 of the outcome document reads. So um, it, it could be uh, like a state that the Article 35 of the United Nations Charter asked the Security Council to act. So. The, the, the collective dimension uh, is given by the United Nations. 
in this case, by the court. The court is different uh, of the political organs, but um, there is a, a sense of, of a collective dimension that is, in my opinion, is it, not truly unilateral. Thank you. I'll let you uh, respond to both of those questions, if you can, please, Martin. Yeah, sure. I'll try. Great, great questions. Um, yeah, I mean, Ronan, I think that's, of course, the, the $1 million question. I, I think uh, I, I wouldn't uh, keep my breath just now um, because, it, it, of course, the, the backstory to this case, I mean, I wasn't involved, but I'm sure if we had somebody here from... Um, the Global Center for Justice in New York or from, you know, the Global Center for RGP, Nadira and others who have worked on this, they would probably say, look, you know, the, uh, you can, you, I can't even start to tell you how much time we spent on finding a state who was willing to do this. Uh, and the Gambia was for sure not the first one they, they went to. So that, you know, just tells you something, at least up to that point, it was very difficult. And that is also not the first situation, of course, where this idea had come up. And, you know, Human Rights Watch has done that for other uh, country situations before, and if you go back in time, um, this, this whole Darfur genocide uh, business, for example, I mean, Sudan joined the Genocide Convention in 2003 and had no reservation on the ICJ clause, so somebody could have done that, for example, at the time, right? So I think, that, you know, there's lots of questions why this Bosnia judgment didn't stir any action in, after 2007. But I think part of the answer is that it's very costly to do such a case, right? I mean, in terms of politics, in terms of relations to that country, it is, uh, if you did this now with Ethiopia, for example, that would definitely be, you know, quite earth shaking probably for your regional group, even if you were joined by others to do that with somebody like Ethiopia. Um, so I think there are lots of other issues, of course, than the, than the legal uh, niceties here to consider. But I, I think it's worthwhile for us who, who study RTP and try to understand it to explore anyway what it would mean. And I find it very interesting to hear from you who has direct contact to Rohingya, how they perceive this, even though this is such a anti-victims court in a way, there's no standing for victims like at the ICC, that they consider this to be meaningful. And I think that that is then also maybe something for for example, for Simon Adams at the Global Center, when you look at the atrocity alerts that they, you know, when they when they make the recommendations, that they often write about accountability and the need for accountability, but then they most often write comma referral to other ICC or something with the ICC, and maybe all of us, you know, advocacy groups, scholars, need to think more about other mechanisms like the ICJ here, for example. And I think for Luciano, I mean, I of course term this now unilateral pillar three also just to raise the discussion a little bit uh, I just think it's 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 important especially in a situation like Myanmar where um, when when Ellen and I co-edited this issue now it's so frustrating to see all the things that don't work uh, in this situation to think about maybe to think try to think outside the box and pillar three is just linked to the UN and in many ways linked to the Security Council so that's why why I thought it's interesting to think about the ICJ because this is certainly not a pillar two situation. It's not assisting, right? It's about somebody calling out a country failing its responsibility and trying to bring in some measure of accountability. So that's, so that's just a way to, to make us think maybe in different ways about pillar three. Uh, there's obviously some you know other issues here also with the support from the OIC to the case and so on. But that was just to, to make it a bit more of a discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Martin, for that. Um, we'll now move back to uh, Raymond because he has his hand raised and also if he wants to respond to the question. Okay, thank you, Blake. Uh, in fact, I do have a question that I would like to ask if you don't mind. So in terms of uh, upholding uh, justice and accountability for the crimes committed against the Rohingya, I'm just wondering like, which pathway uh, tends to be uh, more desirable. Or, uh, are, are, we, are we talking about upholding justice and accountability in terms of, say, Myanmar's responsibility as, as a state? Or are we talking about individual criminal responsibility of those who say, uh, plan to participate those uh, crimes against the Rohingya people? Yeah, thank you. Okay, and we'll also take a question um, from Vilden, if that's okay.
yeah, okay. Are you there, Vilden? I see you're on the screen, but I don't know if you've still got, you've still got the microphone off. So if you're able to turn the microphone on and then ask your question. If you're not able to do that, then maybe type the question into the chat box if you're struggling to get. I don't know, we have you back. Can you hear okay. me? Yes. Yeah, OK, uh, uh, I had a question, actually. Um, I'm a PhD student, and I'm, I have been studying on uh, international criminal law and international criminal justice system. And uh, I, I was wondering where, where uh, the where Martin actually locates international criminal, criminal law and ICC and ICJ within the scope of R2P. Uh, I wonder where it includes it's under pillar two and three or three. If under pillar three, whether uh, he considers it as a peaceful or non-coercive coercive measure. Uh, that is my question. I hope it's clear. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. We'll take one final question um, from Fasilka before we move to the responses. Thank you to all the panelists. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, okay, excellent. I'm having some problems. I'm switching between Collaborate and YouTube. So I did follow the entire panel, although I was not all the time on Collaborate. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, especially Martin, um, what does he think about the possibility of actually resorting more often to various compromissory clauses that are, that are to be found in various uh, multilateral treaties, for example, Palermo Protocol dealing with trafficking in human beings, or even the UN Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, as a tool to actually implement R2P, not necessarily in the third pillar, because in the case of genocide, usually this is an ex post facto assessment of what went wrong. But for example, if the responsibility of a state party is invoked under the Palermo Protocol, um, tackling the human trafficking issue as a kind of early warning measure in order to stop uh, the um, spreading of this practice, which could eventually amount to a crime against humanity, this could also be seen as a tool under the second pillar of responsibility to protect. So I'm just wondering what would be your thoughts on this. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Um, we're really running out of time, so if I can ask the panelists to keep their responses as brief as possible, that would be fantastic. I don't know which one of you wants to respond first, maybe Martin. I think the, there was quite a few points raised for Martin, so I don't know if... Yeah, sure, 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 but I would be happy also for, for Luciano and, and, and Raymond to share their thoughts on, on these questions. I think they're relevant to, to all three of us. I mean, I, I think, Raymond, to, to your question, I, I think, um, of course, ideally, you know, um, all these transitional justice accountability efforts would have um, a strong of uh, domestic uh, ownership, but that's, of course, very difficult in the current situation. But I think that just underscores how important it is that the national unity government and other uh, opposition forces and protest um, venues uh, make a commitment to these, uh, to these accountability issues and transitional justice uh, mechanisms going forward, uh, because as, as of course many others have said before, this crisis has a lot to do with impunity. So it's very important that um, whoever hopefully um, comes to, uh, to power after this military uh, is, is embracing that. But I think that for now there's of course the need for international uh, interventions, and that's why we are talking about these international mechanisms. Um, for for Wilden's question, I, I think there's. Um, you know, all three pillars play a role. The, the ICC uh, is, I mean, Raymond can speak to that probably, you know, as, as well. I mean, I think the idea would be that pillar one, uh, that the ICC is reinforcing this notion, of course, of the state being uh, responsible for the prosecution of any such crimes. And therefore, the ICC has this inbuilt principle of complementarity that only allows for the ICC to become active if the state doesn't exercise its pillar one. Uh, pillar two I already spoke to could be the assistance to national jurisdictions, and pillar three can also play a role, and, 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 and some of it can be, of course, 
coercive when you think of a Security Council referral, but they of course have only happened twice so far, and as Raymond also said, often have their own baggage and are very difficult. But I think the ICC can actually play the whole spectrum um, of the RTP norm. I think the issues are a little, a little bit elsewhere, not, not structural, but more in the politics of it. And for Vasilka, I am happy that you are back, Vasilka. I saw you leaving and was wondering what that meant um, for our panel. But um, I think, you, you know, that's a it's a very good question. I think the, the problem is, again, the costs, the political costs of, of engaging another state at the ICJ. Um, but I think they, they, they definitely should be seen as options that might be uh, relevant already at an earlier stage, as you also said yourself, than uh, these post-facto um, efforts to bring justice to victims. So I think that that's definitely something that we as RTP scholars should look more into and, and talk with our focal points more about. Rosetta. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. Um, again, we're really running low on time. So if, um, we'll go for uh, Luciano first. If you can keep it as brief as possible, that would be fantastic. Thank you. OK, OK. Uh, for for, for the sake of the time, uh, I, I agree with Martin with, with the answer with the question of Raymond. And uh, to build on, uh, I think that the uh, ICC and the, and the ICJ uh, measures uh, in, in RTP situations uh, could be characterized the, um, as a pillar three, but uh, obviously peaceful measures, no, no coercive measures. And uh, to Basilica, uh, it, it is it's significant that the 2020 order, in the 2020 order, the court has relied on its judgment in, in the torture case, uh, uh, Belgium uh, against Senegal. So there is a link uh, for the characterization of, of uh, obligations erga omnes partes. Um, so uh, there is a link between this, this case and uh, the case, uh, a case uh, brought under the, the Turtle Convention. So um, I think that it is possible to, to read also the, those cases uh, through the RCP lens and that there is an opportunity uh, for uh, uh, think a, a, a more broad uh, framework of action for, for the court and not only limited to the genocide convention. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much for keeping that brief. And Raymond, if you have any final comments, but again, if you can, please keep them brief. Uh, no, the, actually, the only thing I would like to say is uh, thank you, Blake, for sharing this section, and I look forward to uh, continue our dialogues with other panelists on some other occasions. Thank you. Perfect. And again, I would also echo the thoughts of Raymond. I'd like to thank everyone for their papers, their presentations. I think they were fantastic. I also think the discussions were equally fantastic, very engaging, really interesting debates. So hopefully you'll have an opportunity to discuss this more together after today's panel. Um, but that concludes um, all the panels for the conference. It's been a pleasure. And I believe we now have the keynote, spe um, keynote speeches coming at 6 um, p.m. British summer time. So thank you again for your time. And hopefully we'll see you all again soon, hopefully in person. That would be nice. Um, but for now, thank you very much. All the best.
effective penalties are provided for persons found guilty of criminal conduct according to the convention and then um, also try persons charged with genocide in a competent tribunal and um, grant extradition when genocide charges are, are invoked. So I read that bit because um, we, we often um, speak about responsibility to protect um, as if it's an entity that stands on its own, it is not. Our report this year to the General Assembly speaks to the complementarity, but also um, how interlinked the, the prevention of genocide is to the responsibility to protect. And um, we, although we do not hope for the situation that was there uh, when the, um, the responsibility to protect and the prevention of genocide came into place as concepts. And I'm speaking about the situation of the aftermath of Rwanda and the aftermath of Srebrenica, that um, we do hope that um, member states um, can come together in the same spirit. We hope for the same spirit where the world stands together and says responsibility to protect is something that is so powerful and that is so needed. So um, this has not been very far uh, from being realized, as you may know. Uh, I'm sure you all know that uh, we now have a new resolution on the responsibility to protect. We saw member states coming together to say that, yes, we do need some kind of formality and uh, some um, clear way in which responsibility to protect doesn't get thrown over the agenda of the United Nations. So in, in helping um, states to fulfill their responsibility to, to protect, um, their citizens and also to prevent genocide. So we must keep advocating for the universal ratification of the convention and the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. That is not happening um, often enough. And um, I've often said that um, my predecessors did a pretty good job of, um, of translating the concept of prevention of genocide at the um, uh, international, regional, and national levels. And I see my role, having worked so closely with communities in the, the work that I've done in peace building, I see my role as translating that uh, concept of prevention of genocide and, of course, responsibility to protect two communities. So in practice, how does that work? It works by remembering how powerful responsibility to protect is as a concept, how and its power comes from the fact that it's universal, and that it is um, not time bound, and that it has been, it was consensually endorsed by world leaders at their greatest gathering. So, however, we must um, speak to the reality of the fact that um, of late, um, the overall conditions for responsibility to protect have uh, considerably worsened, and we've seen an increase of atrocity crimes. And um, as we think about this, we, we should also look at it from the perspective is that. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, we are failing in responsibility to protect. That just means that um, the, with the advent of mobile phones and cameras, that more cases are getting reported. But uh, it also means that um, it's um, there are very strong grounds um, to speak to the fact that um, not just atrocity crimes have increased, but also human rights uh, violations, which doesn't make it right, but uh, puts it into context, makes us understand that, that really that um, as we speak right now, uh, that uh, protection mandates are facing um, greater challenges, but that shouldn't stop us. In fact, that should make us think even more of what we need to do. And then, of course, we know that um, R2P has, to a great extent, um, been defined uh, by its shortcomings. And of course, Libya is often quoted um, in terms of, um, of the advantages of R R2P um, outweighing um, the, uh, the disadvantages, outweighing the advantages. But then we don't speak about the reality, um, which is a reality that I know um, of, of, of two things. One, um, I, I, most people in the world um, do not know, do not understand the reality of sitting in a space where you feel you have no option in the world except to get responsibility to protect, to step in for you. Um, most people do not know what it means to know that there is violence coming and not know who to tell. And um, most people um, do not know what it feels like um, for then that violence to be visited upon you and then for you to live next door to your perpetrator for the rest of your life. 
and when we speak about the potential of responsibility to protect them, if we, we, I must say and say categorically that we must move responsibility to protect from just being potential um, to something um, realistic. So I say so, um, remembering that responsibility to protect is a demand-driven concept. It, it, it came into being because it was demanded, because it had to work side by side with the increase in atrocity crimes that were then um, um, signified by Rwanda and uh, Srebrenica. So um, we must say that um, to date, um, there has been a lot of conceptual debates on, on, um, on, on responsibility to protect. And um, those conceptual debates are around how it's implemented and how it's not implemented. And um, that in as much as I, I, I strongly feel that um, we must keep um, speaking to the potential issues of, of responsibility to protect, we shouldn't get stuck in the mud of um, not moving, of not um, doing anything for those people who feel that um, something is going to happen to them and they have nobody to tell. So because if, if we stay there, then um, we may lose something that the world came together to produce that was so powerful and that um, can change so many people's lives and can save so many people's um, um, uh, lives. So um, how do we then do this in, in practice? Um, I think we do need to increase our data value and impact, um, the kind of data that comes from the ground. And I'm talking about data in terms of um, people who are actually practicing responsibility to protect, but they do not know what to call it. Yet they are practicing uh, responsibility to protect. And um, we have communities who take care of each other, who know what to do. Um, we've, we've done um, so much work in terms of early warning and the um, and early response. And so much of the work I've been doing uh, with communities in the past is to tell them that this response doesn't necessarily have to come from government. We can't ignore government. We must continue to work with governments. We must continue to work at the international stage on R2P. We must continue to work at the national stage on R2P. But at the community level, so important to continue um, working um, with, with them, getting communities to understand that they have power to protect. And at uh, the level um, of the space that we are speaking in right now, we have a duty to uh, philosophize what has, 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 um, has been happening on the ground, to theorize it, and to put it into practical um, terms um, in which people can recognize that what they've been doing is actually responsibility to protect. Um, but then the focus has always been on um, responsibility to protect at the national level. So uh, I know that uh, in, in terms of uh, its applicable um, universality, that it has no time limits and that, that it encompasses this broad set of measures and uh, that we always need the support of member states to support their populations from atrocity crimes. Um, and also in, in regard to the use of force when absolutely necessary. And I say so, uh, having again come from spaces where this is um, absolutely necessary. But then we need to um, speak about RTP. And again, I'm sorry that I missed so much of what happened in the morning and in the evening, um, depending on where you are, afternoon. Um, we do need to walk this journey um, again together. We need to speak about RTP in the, in the space of coming to terms with change of what has happened. Uh, in the space of the pandemic, what has changed, the inequalities and the nationalistic tendencies that we now see coming to the fore that were always there but are now magnified. We need to learn the lessons of the past in terms of the practice of community protections. What did communities do to protect each other? We have uh, very powerful concepts um, like on the African continent in regards to Ubuntu, for example, from South Africa. We call it Utu in Kiswahili, the same thing. That whole essence of you are because I am, and how then we we protect each other, and um, in in this journey um, that we need to take together on R2P, must link the global to the local, and um, must change then therefore the perceptions of our responsibility to protect through practical action because we need success stories, uh, otherwise we shall keep being defined from the perspective of of Libya and um, other places where it didn't quite work out well, and. We, we need to develop um, practical programs for, for community responsibility to protect. How does that look like? 
um, it looks like um, linking the national to the to, to the local. So when we are speaking about ratification of the Prevention of Genocide um, Convention, we, we um, the Convention, sorry, on the Prevention of Genocide, we are not speaking about something that national governments do and then put it away. We are speaking about something that national governments do, and then we trace what they've been able to do right up to the community level. We are speaking about um, measures to promote equality and to prevent discrimination. And um, because I come from um, the traditional space of um, human rights and conflict prevention, um, I see so many uh, spaces for intervention um, where we are talking about conflict prevention and reconciliation, not just atrocity prevention, because once you say atrocity prevention, many people then begin to think of, um, of legal ways, legal mechanisms. They don't see themselves in that space. And then um, as I finalize, um, I must say that uh, in all the places I've worked, and, and that includes uh, myself, that I find that people are unable to link what is happening to them to atrocities. So that, for example, in the Sahel today, um, people getting killed um, on a daily basis, but when you speak to them, they are not able to link what is happening to them to atrocities. They are not able to link what's happening to them to war crimes, um, to ethnic cleansing, to genocide, to crimes against humanity, but they're able to link what's happening to them to violence. Now, if R2P can translate what's happening to them into atrocity crimes in a way that they then are able to articulate their need for responsibility to protect, as we've seen in Myanmar, then it becomes a very, very strong um, call that cannot be ignored when communities, local communities are saying, we want responsibility to protect. So then um, we can therefore generate a practical learning on how local peace builders and human rights activists can ensure involvement in, in um, decision making on responsibility to protect and then work with responsibility to protect as a social capital and as a value system uh, where people recognize that what they are doing is responsibility to protect, where people understand that there are new ways of doing things that can be responsibility to protect, where we have the practice of cross-cultural responsibility to protect, where we have responsibility to protect in public spaces and policy areas, where we have leaders who are groomed and also who grow into spaces of, uh, and also who are already, who are working on that to be recognized, where we work with local authority councils, there are so many ideas in terms of what we can do with um, responsibility to protect. So I would just like to say um, that uh, we have to take into account um, the changed world right now. It would be foolhardy of us to continue working as if nothing has changed in the world. The pandemic has changed the world, that's for certain. And if we take into account the socioeconomic, cultural, and political context that may have contributed to the increase in atrocity crimes, then we shall then be able to find a solution that then speaks to the fact that responsibility to protect is a most needed force at the community level. Thank you very much. I would like to stop there. That's excellent. Thank you very much for that really insightful um, talk there. Um, I'm sure if there was an audience, we would be all clapping. But as I said yesterday, during our um, keynote, it's one of those things where we can't show our appreciation um, in the way that we'd like to. But thank you very much for, for giving that. I will move on um, to Dr. Karen Smith, um, the United Nations Secretary General Special Advisor on Responsibility to Protect. And if anyone does have any questions on the back of um, our first talk, please do post them in the chat. Um, there are three ways, remember, that you can get involved in this. You can post them here on the chat within Collaborate. Raise your hand if you want to ask a question during the Q&As. Post them on YouTube for all of those who are watching on YouTube at the moment or within Calatown as well. Um, but without further ado, I'll hand you over to Dr. Karen Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Just checking that you can hear me okay. We can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone, and I guess good morning or good afternoon for some of you. Um, I'd like to start by just thanking the chairs, Vasilka and Patrick, but of course also the organizing committee for inviting me to address you at the, on this final day of the conference. Um, and I'm impressed that there are some people who have made it through two days of conferencing and they're uh, still showing up in the evening. Um, I think fondly of the 2019 conference in Ljubljana, and I really regret that we cannot all meet in person this year. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next one where hopefully that will be possible again. 
Um, I just also wanted to start by saying that I think it's very apt that this conference is dedicated to the memory of Edward Luck, who, as Simon Adams outlined in his speech last night, made an invaluable contribution to our understanding of R2P through his brilliant mind and his capacity to understand the broader political and institutional framework in which R2P would have to operate. And while he is no longer with us, his work remains foundational and will continue to influence and inspire the way we think about R2P and global, global governance uh, more generally. I also have to say that I feel quite intimidated speaking at an event such as this one that is attended by R2P experts, as my usual audience uh, consists of diplomats, very few of whom have a thorough understanding of the principle. Uh, I also want to emphasize at the outset that, sadly, as this conference is happening, atrocities are occurring in different parts of the world as we speak. And as uh, Special Advisor Indirito has already said, this has led some critics to say that the principle of R2P has failed. And I'd like to very strongly contend that it's not a failure of the principle, but rather of its implementation, a lack of political will to engage in prevention, and to take collective action when required. At the same time, while the what some call lofty promise of 2005 has perhaps not been fulfilled to the extent that was envisioned, um, at the same time, I believe there has been considerable progress that has been made over the past now 16 years. Most importantly, I think it's now generally accepted that uh, not only individual states, but also the international community has a responsibility to protect vulnerable populations. And if we think about that, that that is really important. I think you know this is something that is not to be underestimated. And so how I see the remaining challenges and debates, uh, these, are, these are questions and, and controversies that relate to implementation. So questions about who, how, and when, rather than whether to fulfill the responsibility to protect. Often when we think about the support that RTP currently has, we tend to measure it by looking at, for example, voting patterns in the UN General Assembly. But by focusing only on government positions, which are often based on entrenched ideological positions, and in some cases, as we saw in the recent vote uh, on the resolution in the General Assembly, explained on procedural grounds, we really are overlooking the support for R2P by people on the ground, especially in states where atrocity crimes are occurring or are imminent. And we've all seen the vivid images of protesters in Myanmar holding up placards and calling for R2P. Beyond the political support shown by a large majority of UN member states for the principle, this is perhaps the most significant indication that R2P remains as important as ever. When most people think about the successes and failures of RTP, however, they tend to focus on the Security Council. And while the Council and Council action is undoubtedly a crucial part of the principle, we should also understand the development of RTP in a broader sense in terms of political support, institutionalization, and operationalization. And so while it remains essential to continue to engage the Security Council on this issue, greater involvement by other parts of the UN system is equally important. Uh, we simply cannot leave a task as important as atrocity prevention to 15 states. And we have seen other UN bodies taking action in the face of Security Council inertia. I don't have to um, you know, list them to you, but of course, both the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council have created investigative mechanisms, and both bodies hold great potential for taking further action with regards to R2P. Particularly in terms of prevent, uh, prevention and early warning, the UN's human rights bodies and mechanisms have a crucially important role to play. And of course, focusing on this requires somewhat of a shift in the framing of RTP from a primarily peace and security, Security Council New York issue, to a human rights Geneva issue. And there have been developments in this regard uh, very recently as well. Last year, we saw the passing of the first ever Human Rights Council resolution on RTP. Last month, we held the first Human Rights Council intersessional debate on RTP. And at the same time, progress is still being made in terms of institutionalization in New York. Uh, most of you will know that two weeks ago, a General Assembly resolution on RTP was passed that now places it on the permanent agenda of the General Assembly and calls for a mandated annual report. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be speaking at an event organized by the Global Center 
to launch a report produced by the Asia Pacific Center on RTP on the powers of the General Assembly in preventing and responding to atrocity crimes. Um, so again, I think there's much potential there that remains untapped, and I think that is a fascinating area for future research as well, looking at the potential for other UN bodies to become more involved in atrocity prevention and response. We should, of course, also not only focus on the UN system, but look at how RTP has been internalized and importantly operationalized by member states, regional organizations, and civil society. Uh, ben Willis's paper earlier today focused on the UK, and he mentioned that there's relatively little scholarship on how states have integrated atrocity prevention into their government structures and policies. And while some work exists on the U US, particularly on the UK, Again, I think there's huge potential for studies that focus on other states, particularly in distinguishing what states do and say at the UN uh, versus what they do at home. Now, because I'm amongst academics, I, I can say that, you know, I find that much academic work on R2P continues to focus on the reaction and response side of R2P. Uh, although I, I must say that the variety of papers presented at this conference have also somewhat dispelled this uh, assumption that I have. Uh, and while I by no means want to imply that considering and continue to consider and pay attention to the response side of RTP is not important, um, because when prevention fails, there must be response, I want to, in line with the work of the UN Office of Genocide Prevention and RTP, uh, which was the topic of this year's report, say a few things about prevention. And in that regard, I think we've also learned a number of lessons over the past 16 years. So. In terms of thinking about how far we've come with R2P, I think sometimes we overlook how much we've learned about atrocity prevention in particular. And the first is that atrocity crimes do not happen overnight and are therefore preventable. And we have developed tools like the Office's framework of analysis to identify the risk factors. At the same time, while we know that there are some common risk factors, we also know that there's no one size fits all approach when it comes to prevention and that preventive action must be carefully tailored to each individual situation. Second, the best outcomes are achieved when atrocity prevention is made a priority, as it makes early and concerted action more likely. So whether the issue being discussed is conflict prevention, development, or responding to global pandemics, atrocity prevention must form an essential part of the discussion, including considerations of how certain actions could potentially exacerbate the risk of atrocity crimes being committed. Because when the prevention of atrocity crimes is only one of several priorities that the international community is hoping to pursue in a particular situation, or it's not made a priority at all, prevention efforts can be sharply impaired. And the failure of the international community to protect the Rohingya in Myanmar serves as a stark reminder of this. Third, unity of purpose is essential to successful atrocity prevention. Successful prevention always involves multiple actors, including the UN, regional organizations, key states, and civil society organizations working together in a coherent fashion. Fourth, I only have five, so I'm almost there. Um, any state can make a difference. And, or in fact, anyone and any state can make a difference. A case in point is the example of a small state like the Gambia making a case against Myanmar at the International Court of Justice for violating the Genocide Convention. Fifth, women are essential actors in preventing and responding to atrocities. Evidence shows that the crucial role that women play in early warning at the grassroots level, as active agents of protection, and of course, as community builders, facilitators of intercommunal dialogue, and human rights defenders, which are all essential to building strong, resilient societies that are at lower risk of atrocity crimes. In conclusion, I thought I might take the opportunity to outline some issues that, in my view, require further research. And I should also qualify this by saying that this is by no means an exhaustive list. Um, and I've really been impressed with the range of topics that have been discussed over the past few days. Um, so just to highlight a few, the first, I've already mentioned the importance of the Geneva mechanisms, including the special procedures. And I think much more work is needed to flesh out the link between these mechanisms and R2P. And, and think about how atrocity prevention can be more explicitly integrated in the work um, that, of the special procedures, particularly in terms of early warning. The second is the impact of COVID-19. 
the pandemic clearly has serious implications for the responsibility to protect, not least because it has significantly increased the risk of already vulnerable populations. But really, I think we've just started to scratch the surface in terms of what this means for future thinking about atrocity prevention and, and response. The third is hate speech and incitement to violence. We know, of course, that it's a warning sign for the potential for atrocity crimes, but there are many areas that require further investigation. For example, under what circumstances is hate speech a trigger for atrocity crimes? What responsibility do actors, corporate actors, like social media companies have <coughs> sorry, um, to, to address online hate speech? How do we counter, counter gendered hate speech? And how does this re relate to an increased risk of atrocity crimes? <coughs> Excuse me. The fourth is displaced populations. How does RTP relate to the protection of refugees? And this was one of the topics we actually considered for this year's Secretary General's report. Um, and I was very happy to hear Chloe Gilgan's presentation about this earlier today. But again, I think that's an area that deserves further attention. Then there's the role of regional organizations. We all know that they're mentioned in paragraph 139 of the World Outcome Summit document. And we keep saying that they play an important role, but how exactly? And what is their relationship to the UN? I've also already mentioned the importance of research that focuses on how individual states have domesticated RTP and also how they're supporting efforts at the community level. I also want to add as a kind of side note that although I know it's not always straightforward and that in the academic world there's pressure to publish in peer-reviewed journals, I would like to encourage especially younger scholars to use your knowledge to influence policy debates to also produce policy-friendly versions of your academic papers and to share these with policymakers who are usually not in the habit of reading academic papers, largely because they don't have the time for this. Uh, and to give you one example, I had a conversation yesterday with the um, special advisor for the responsibility to protect of the Organization of American States. And I mentioned this conference to him and I said, oh, I noticed that there was a paper on designing you know, an RTP strategy for the OAS. And he said, yes, he wishes that the, the authors had contacted him and, you know, he'd be very interested in engaging with them on this issue. So I think sometimes there's a, you know, there's also a kind of a lack of communication between the two sides. Um, I know, of course, that many of you, especially those linked to the European Center for RTP, are very active in terms of providing briefings to the UK Foreign Office, for example. Um, but this is unfortunately not a general trend in other countries or, or at the UN. I think also much still needs to be done in terms of education, awareness raising about R2P, uh, addressing some of its misconceptions. And for those of us in positions at universities, I think you know, we should be using that opportunity to educate students. Um, I find that the average IR student still thinks that R2P is really the same thing as humanitarian intervention. Um, and I've also found in my work for the UN that there's a tremendous need and and requests for knowledge about RTP, especially from young people in countries with a history of conflict and atrocity crimes who are eager to understand how they can hold their governments accountable and prevent future atrocities. In conclusion, yesterday Simon talked about the situation in Myanmar, and this serves to remind us what RTP is really about and why it deserves our continued attention because I think sometimes it can get lost in academic discussions about norms, et cetera. Uh, while the 2005 World Summit Outcome Document placed the responsibility to protect firmly in the hands of states, we know that preventing and responding to atrocity crimes is a highly complex endeavor that requires collaboration from everyone who believes that no person should face the most heinous forms of human rights violations, based essentially not on what they have done, but who they are. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, um, Karen Smith. Uh, I will now open the floor to some questions um, if both of our speakers are happy uh, to take some for a little while. If at any point you need to leave for any time, please do let me know. I don't want to keep you more um, than, than um, necessary. We have, um, I think we've got one question in the chat there uh, and one coming up. Let me just Oh, it's a clapping. <laughs> Thank you, Cecilia. <laughs> um, so we have our first question from Fiona. Would you like to come in? 
Thank you, Patrick. I would like to thank both special advisors so much that it was really inspiring because as academics from time to time, we continue writing on R2P, but sometimes having difficulties to see immediate results. So it was very inspiring. Thank you. I have two quick questions to both special advisors if, it's, uh, if they would like to comment on it. The first relates to reference to R2P in resolutions. We see often a re reference to paragraph 138, but um, in terms of the international community's responsibility, we don't see any explicit references to paragraph 139. Is there a specific reason for this? Is it strategic or is it due to politicization or is it just like the reference is not there, but action practically reflects the idea? And my second question is, it actually the, um, relates to Ed, um, Aiden Heyer's previous argument that uh, he was citing in his work that the Security Council and especially P5 wanted to avoid the direct encounter of the special advisors, especially on our 2 p previously, they did not want to support it. Is there still such a resistance against the direct addressing of the special advisors in the current situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you don't mind, I will take a second question and then come back to our um, speakers. Uh, Vasilka, you have your hand up now. Thank you. Thank you to both uh, special advisors. This has been really insightful and very rich with information that we can then further uh, take on for our uh, continued work on R2P. So I have um, a few, few questions. They will be very brief, I hope. Um, first, the resolution, as uh, you rightly pointed out, both of you uh, mandated the um, annual report by the Secretary General. This is very important milestone indeed. But I'm wondering whether it comes also with additional financial support for the mandate of the office and the two special advisors, knowing that the UN is facing the acute financial crisis, liquidity crisis, and all of this. So I'm wondering whether this uh, new, uh, let's say, development also means more finances for your work. My second um, observation perhaps would be to your Karen's um, suggestion that more attention should be paid to the um, uh, special rapporteur, special advisors um, mandated by the Human Rights Council. But I would also, and here I have to make a disclosure, of course, now serving as a vice chair of the UN Human Rights Committee, I think more attention could be spent also to the uh, human rights treaty-based bodies. And the reason I'm saying this is because while special rapporteurs might be, you know, ha having a lot of things to focus on within a very uh, limited um, time period and so on, the treaty-based bodies are continuously monitoring the situation in states' parties. And the Human Rights Committee currently conducts this monitoring activity for 173 states' parties. And this monitoring does not mean this one-time occurrence in Geneva for the dialogue, but actually starts with the report, list of issues, replies to the list of issues, then the dialogue, then the concluding observation, and then the follow-up to how the states actually fulfill these recommendations. So I think it's a very important mechanism to be considered also in the sense of responsibility to protect. And um, also uh, you mentioned uh, the special um, or the focal point, um, R2P focal point for the Organization of American States, where we have indeed been in contact uh, with um, the, this um, focal point. And we did uh, with Patrick invite him to join us uh, at the conference. Unfortunately, however, we didn't notice that he managed uh, perhaps due to other obligations to be with us during these two days, but we certainly uh, do reach out to also regional organizations, uh, even encouraging them to nominate focal points. I personally have been uh, advocating for that with some of the European regional organizations. As we know, so far only our um, European Union has appointed part of the focal point, but perhaps there might be some improvement, improvements in this sphere also in the years to come. So I will stop here because I would have many other <laughs> questions and comments, but uh, I would appreciate your thoughts on this. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know in what order you would like to answer. Um, shall we go to Special Advisor Smith first? Karen Smith. 
Sure, I'll try to answer some of them. Maybe I'll start with the with the with the last one. So with Vasilka's point about, um, yeah, I'm 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 sorry if I hope I I didn't um, well I didn't mean that you as conference organizers didn't reach out uh, to to people. I was I was referring more to kind of academics. I think that sometimes perhaps don't think about the fact that you know you can email somebody who's in a policy position and say I'm writing a paper on this. And of course, you know we've all had that rejection where you know, you've had the email that says. I'm too busy. You've had no response to the email, of course. Um, but I think you know there's there's actually quite a bit of openness in terms of discussing discussing ideas that are potentially also of interest uh, to them. Uh, Vasilka, I, I completely agree with you in terms of the the kind of Geneva mechanisms. I think as a whole, so not just the special rapporteurs, but certainly also the treaty bodies, and of course also when we look at the work of the Human Rights Council. You know, there's been a lot of talk as uh, as well about including atrocity prevention more. Uh, officially in the work of the or in the in the um, UPR process as well, um, and so I think it's really just about looking at uh, you know how there's there's potential overlap and how there's there's a lot of complementarity potential complementarity between the work that we do in New York and that the work that happens in Geneva, um, and I think it's also just about you know the fact that we need more collaboration, so we should certainly speak uh, as well. Um, to Pinar's question, oh, sorry, Vasilka, you also asked a question about the whether the re resolution that mandates the annual report comes with additional financial support to the office. Unfortunately, the answer is no, and that was actually one of the one of the criteria for uh, for many states to support the resolution that it would not come with additional financial implications. So, yeah, sadly, we're not we're not getting more money to to produce the the annual report. Um, Maybe I'll stop there because uh, I think Special Advisor and Dorito might want to answer the, the other questions, but, but otherwise I'll come back and, and maybe also just add to that, to Pinar's questions. Sure, thank you. Uh, Special Advisor and Dorito, would you like to come in on that? Okay, thank you. I, I think that's... Um... In terms of the human rights mechanisms, um, having a human rights background, of course, it, um, I'm, I'm, I'm very... Um, um, I, I, what the word to use? Like, um, it, it's one of the areas that I feel that we can do quite a bit about in the the treaty bodies, and all these several procedures um, that mandate holders of the the Human Rights um, Security Council. They, they they can also contribute more to atrocity crimes prevention, and 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 not just in the sense of structural prevention, but also in contributing to early warning and and, and, and mobilization or, or early action. Um, the Universal uh, Periodic Review, Professor Karen has spoken about it, and uh, it, for me, presents very low fruits in terms of um, um, it provides um, so much material that can be mined for identifying atrocity prevention risks and mobilizing resources for atrocity crimes prevention. And, and uh, we can quite put it to better use than we will. We have so much uh, thinking around that. And um, in terms of um, the budget, um, as uh, Special Advisor Karen has said, uh, that uh, it came, the new resolution came without a budget and it was one of the conditions. But uh, that hasn't or will not stop us uh, from, from working on responsibility to protect. We've been working on responsibility to protect without a budget. We've, um, in the recent past, um, held workshops on responsibility to protect in Mozambique. We've held workshops uh, in Egypt and actually set up a network of women in um, responsibility to protect for the MENA region. So um, I think that the whole um, way we can approach it is um, a lot to do with the imagination, how we imagine things, but also within the reality of knowing that responsibility to protect is not something that stands on itself, that stands alone that is part of the work that we do in terms of preventing atrocities. And uh, for me, um, I see responsibility to protect being the, the, the linkage that um, to early warning. So early warning is a prevention, and then early response is responsibility to protect. So when, when that then becomes clearer, then uh, when it's articulated in a way that people then see and understand it, uh, then it becomes... Um, quite relevant to what we are working on. So um, I think, um, was there any other, is there a question we haven't answered? 
No, I think they've covered that quite well. We've just had another question come through on GatherTown, the other platform that we're using to get involved with this. Um, this question was from Aidan McGeer on GatherTown. He says, the question for um, Special Advisor Smith. Uh, in the face of the recently developed group, group of friends of the UN Charter and the quiet diplomacy that Simon Adams mentioned yesterday, he asks, how can we expect the inertia of R2P to still press for intervention when needed? What sort of changes or pressures can we see coming from the UN General Assembly and the Human Rights Council session to ensure prevention and when needed intervention? Um, so that's one question there. That's in the chat. Please look over. We also have another question here from Andrus. Um, would you like to come in on your question there? You have your hand up. Yes, thank you very much. Um, my Quest. So I, I have both a, a quick comment and, and a question. I think we have also been, been focusing on the negative aspects of, of R2P and how it is not coming to fruition, how it failed in, in certain states. However, when there's such a positive message from, from, from both speakers, it, it, it can be quite inspiring. So thank you very much for the enthusiasm that you are uh, both conveying to us. Uh, and my question is regarding the influence that scholars have on the practical uh, implementation of R2P, because I think as, as Ms. Uh, uh, Karen Smith has, has mentioned, there's some confusion among students on whether it's humanitarian intervention on R2P. But when we look at Myanmar, we see that we need intervention, we need R2P, we need co even coercive action by the Security Council, anything, just please help us, because this conflict is in danger of escalating to either uh, uh, a, a uh, to either include mass atrocities like cri like crime against humanity or even worse. So my question is, our categorization, our debates on the on, on, on the nuances, do they have any implications on the uh, um, execution of R two P in the field and whether it helps the populations, because I think that would be a large encouragement to the uh, researchers and, and academics on the field. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And um, Adrian Gallagher, you also have your hand up there. We'll take one final question in this round. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, thank you to um, both speakers for um, as others have said, insightful and encouraging talks. It was great to hear the local level being spoken about by Alice and future research agendas being identified by Karen, which I will had a PhD proposal today on hate speech, which reminds me that I have to go and read it. Um, I just, uh, regarding the annual reports and the R2P debates that are held in the General Assembly, I wondered how likely it is that a future report could be on uh, Pillar 3. And I raise this um, because for many years now, we've been told that the R2P tends to focus on use of force and doesn't focus as much on prevention. But obviously, that's changed a lot in the last seven years. Um, so I wondered whether you think that a discussion on Pillar 3 would be perhaps too controversial. Um, but linked to this as well, do you think that choosing a controversial topic, if, if we describe Pillar 3 as a controversial topic, do you think that a debate on Pillar 3 would actually harm or advance the R2P within the UN? Because I guess we would, some of us would hope that even though things may be controversial, that um, that is the purpose of the debate, that you hold the debate and tease out the differences and tease out the common ground. Um, anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question, um, Adrian. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> Adrian, sorry. Um, who would like to take uh, one of those questions first? Um, shall we turn to uh, Special Advisor Andrew to, um how, how would you answer those questions that were put? Um, the practical application of RTP, um, you know, I, I come from a country, I come from Kenya, and um, in 2007, 2008, uh, we had violence, and um, we, uh, I was in a group, um, a team of people that actually 
wrote um, uh, to the UN, and at that point, RTP was a relatively new um, concept, but we wrote and asked, can we get something on risk kind and of responsibility to protect being booked on our country? And so when I say that um, we come from spaces where uh, that, there's, it, that there's something about knowing um, that your country needs RTP, that there's a point you reach, um, like, for example, the people in Myanmar right now where they feel um, RTP is so important, um, that uh, it can and it does happen. So now um, in Kenya, um, and um, especially Advisor Smith has been sharing quite a number of documents in terms of um, where um, uh, RTP has worked in practice. But in Kenya, the first two pillars actually worked when the former Secretary General came to Kenya and um, he put an end to um, through this whole process to the violence. And we have many, many other uh, practical examples of R2P. There's a lot of focus on, 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 uh, on the third um, pillar, and which is on, on military intervention. And then um, the debate is necessary. Um, but that debate must also take into account not just, uh, for example, Libya, where things didn't turn out well, but must take into account places where R2P has not been used. So like, look at Syria today. Look at Myanmar, and because we should be thinking about um, those spaces as well, um, that uh, where action hasn't been authorized by the UN Security Council, and therefore that particular um, non-authorization came at such a severe price for, for the people on the ground. So that is something we need to study as well. So we, we need to um, not wait, of course, until the situation deteriorates to, to that point where use of force is necessary for the protection of populations. And that's the whole essence of um, responsibility as, as sovereignty. Um, but um, also when force is used, um, then the mandate should be very precisely defined and, and its impl implementation must be very closely um, monitored. And then um, there's also beyond force a responsibility to, to have um, a very clear picture on, on how to restore sovereignty because remember, if responsibility to protect is invoked in the first place, it's because the state wasn't able to protect its citizens. So therefore, um, the, the include, um, invoking, restoring that sovereignty, including that, that responsibility of a state to protect populations on its territory uh, from atrocity crimes after the intervention is absolutely important. So um, I emphasize um, again that the first two pillars are under discussed. Um, the first two pillars, there are not enough examples uh, situating the first two pillars within uh, what happens. Much of that is, of course, um, shrouded in, in peace building and, and peace building jargon. So that we talk about uh, the first two pillars, everybody talks about the peace process that Kofi Annan, for example, led in Kenya. They don't talk about the responsibility to protect um, process that uh, we led in Kenya. So, so yes, debate is absolutely necessary on the third pillar. And debate is absolutely necessary on um, where RTP could have been invoked and it wasn't invoked, and we can see the results today. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And um, Special Advisor Smith, would you like to comment on those questions? Yeah, thanks. I wanted to go back to I think um, I think we didn't answer Pinar's question. So the 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 first one, the first question you asked Pinar was about references to RTP and resolutions, and that they generally refer to. Uh, well, mostly pillar one, I think sometimes sometimes pillar two, but and why not pillar three? Well, I think, yeah, absolutely. The reason is a, is a political one. I mean, states are states are very, very careful of, of you know, um, uh, supporting resolutions that may have implications for for action uh, on their part. So I think, you know, that 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 is the main reason that everybody, you know, everybody supports even the even those who you know are against RTP uh, will probably support a resolution that states that. Uh, you know, we would like to remind State X that it is their responsibility to protect their population. You know, nobody nobody contests that. So it's a it's an easy kind of phrase, you know, to put in a resolution if you want to refer to RTP. With the, with the others, uh, with the other pillars, it becomes a little bit more more difficult. So you know, in terms of uh, negotiating, uh, whether it's in the Security Council or potentially in the in the General Assembly, I think that would be more difficult to to include that. Um, you had a second question, Pina, which I unfortunately didn't take down. So maybe you can ask it again, or we can communicate afterwards. Um, to Aiden's question about the 
basically in light of recent developments, what are the prospects for intervention um, in the case of, of atrocity crimes being committed? Well, I think, yeah, you know, we're in a difficult time in terms of states standing up and taking action uh, when they see human rights violations, the Security Council being able to reach consensus on this. But I still think that there are states who feel very strongly that, you know, they have they have a responsibility um, and that they have a moral responsibility of sorts um, that they need to live up to. And so I think that's not going to go away. So even though there are these new developments where there's this focus on quiet diplomacy, and I think that's not, you know, we shouldn't dismiss that as something which is bad. I mean, I'm a South African and, you know, so I'm kind of, that's, that's in my DNA, quiet diplomacy, uh, mediation, you know, so force is always a very, very last resort. And I think that's how it should be. There's nothing wrong with that. But I don't think the, the option of the use of force is going to entirely disappear. I do believe that there are states who, who will make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and I think there's also increase, increasing pressure on, on uh, calls from certain member states on others who, um, you know, say that they will vote against resolutions that might call for collective action to explain why they take those decisions and so to be held accountable in that sense you know in a situation like Myanmar we know what is going on so if you're voting against a resolution to take any action then can you tell us why and and you know how how you would do it otherwise so I wouldn't completely dismiss future discussions around intervention um I'm just this question about the influence of scholars I'm an academic myself so I'm hoping that through my role at the UN, I've had some, some influence, but I think generally speaking, uh, I mean, the work of academics is very important in terms of, you know, really helping us think through some of these very, very difficult questions. Um, and I'm, I've actually just recently read a PhD, which I'm not sure if I can talk about it because the viva hasn't happened, um, but, you know, which, which is really, really interesting because it, it, it sets out um, actually to, to make some policy recommendations, which I think is really interesting, but building on, you know, a um, very serious uh, kind of, uh, you know, intellectual history of ideas, essentially, and, and, and coming to this conclusion of, well, you know, these are the policy prescriptions that, that come out of this, and, and these are my conclusions. So I think that's very, very powerful. I think where the challenge lies is, is translating those ideas, um, you know, in a way that they are then accessible to policymakers. Um, and so, you know, while, of course, even in the work that we do at the UN, of course, you know, when reports, et cetera, are written, there's a lot of research that goes into that. And, of course, uh, you know, the work of academics is read as part of that. Um, but I think on a kind of day-to-day -day basis, and, you know, this is, a, this is a debate that we hear over and over again, the kind of theory, practice, uh, you know, divide. I really think that, you know, when you write a paper, keep in mind if you can produce a kind of one-page version that can send, uh, you know, to policymakers, send to someone who, who who has the time to quickly scan through that and say, okay, yeah, this is actually very useful. Um, Adrian, of course, always always to be counted on to ask the difficult questions. Uh, whether there's likely to be a future annual report on Pillar Three, um, I would say no. But I will explain why I say that. Um, I don't think there's going to be another report on Pillar 3. There has, there has been a report on Pillar 3, right? So we probably wouldn't have another report just on Pillar 3. Um, but of course, the discussion of Pillar 3, you know, might be included in future reports. That's, that's uh, you know, that, that is to be determined. What I would say is that because these reports are now mandated, um, it's likely that states will have more say in terms of the content of the report, so what they would like the Secretary General to report on. And so I think what we might see going forward is, uh, you know, past reports have, have been thematic in nature, or of course, you know, following the 2009 report, they've kind of laid out the, the different pillars uh, and elaborated on them, and that was followed by thematic reports, I think. What, what we might see in future, and of course this is still to be discussed, um, and it also depends on you know, the, the discussions with member states, that we might see re reports that actually report on the implementation of RTP by the UN and by member states. Um, and you know, that might 
well include a discussion of implementation that you know of might be structured in a way of pillar three or pillar one pillar two pillar three implementation so um, that would be my answer to that but i'm talking too much i'll stop now well, Joel, thank you very much um i thought that was really interesting what you said as well about uh translating academic scholarship into something accessible for policymakers. We have a um a publication workshop immediately after this keynote panel um uh, where maybe that will come up and that might be something for discussion how to do that and what um you know where where to focus that. But I'll leave that for that panel. Uh, we have one hand up in the audience at the moment from Rahel. Would you like to come in? Um thank you very much. Um both of the speakers emphasized on the role of education and academic intervention. But what I want to ask is uh, what is being done to encourage the foundation and development of institutions dedicated particularly to educating vulnerable populations on how uh, they can respond to mass atrocity crimes, on how they can hold governments, especially and perpetuate terrorists in general, accountable to engage in uh, accountable and also uh, on how they can engage in early preventative measures and rebuilding initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. There are two other questions in the audience, so I will um, go to Samuel Jarvis first and then to James Patterson. Hi, thank you very, very much, both of you, for the presentations. Uh, I just have a quick question really around um, the role um, that ARIA formula meetings, the informal meetings of the Security Council can play. Obviously, we've seen a kind of rise in those over the recent over recent years. We saw one over my, uh, regarding Myanmar and um, Cameroon. Um, I'd just be interested to hear if you think they have much of a role in terms of being a prevention, possible prevention tool. Are they useful? Um, are there things that could make them more useful? Just be really interested to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks. Thank you. And now, finally, to James Patterson. Yeah, yeah. Uh, th thanks again to the keynotes. They were really wonderful, uh, wonderful keynotes. Um, this might not be a very fair or easy question, but I'd really be interested in hearing your thoughts about where you see the RTP going in the future. Karen, you mentioned the problems with the pandemic that it's causing. So where do you see the RTP kind of in five, ten years' time, given the potential um, rise of China, and we've seen increasing move away from liberalism of, um, under the Trump administration, but in other states such as Hungary. So, um, where do you see the RTP? Do you, what? How do you see the RTP's future over the kind of mid term? Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for those questions. Three really good questions there. Um, <clears throat> shall I come back to special advisor and do two? How would you approach those questions? Um, thank you very much. The question on education, um, very, very important question, and there is quite a lot going on. We've been doing quite a bit. We have um, a partnership with the UNESCO, and UNESCO has this huge worldwide um, reach. We are still holding an international conference um, in, um, in the fall. And, uh, but beyond that, of there are lots of initiatives happening at, in, in many spaces. We have an African Scholars um, program going on right now on um, the prevention of, 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 of genocide and the responsibilities to protect. And we've started these discussions and we've started having all these meetings. We've also started working with a group of um, educators from Southeast Asia, and uh, it's been extremely useful, the kind of... Um, what we've been doing together, we've um, in the recent past actually even held um, a workshop with the Pakistan Higher Education Commission, and um, there's lots of things going on in the education sphere. But it's another field that personally I feel very strong about because um, we don't do enough to interrupt the circles of socialization through education in regards to atrocity prevention. Um, for the ARIA formula, we are actually preparing for one. Our office is preparing for one. And uh, I think that will um, then um, help to gauge better how it is for there. Uh, but um, the, the one we are preparing on is on hate speech. And uh, really, ARIA formulas, they, they raise the profile of an issue. They, they get it more spoken about. Um, they, they get member states involved um, with the work of the UN. So there is a synergy going on there 
around um, issues that then moves things to another level. Yeah, very, 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 very important. And um, so therefore, uh, I think the more, the better. And uh, I think in terms of moving forward, like what do we see of R2P, uh, and you specifically mentioned China, and what then does that mean um, for R2P going forward? I, I do think that um, if if we relate R2P to accountability, like, like this, there's a lot um, about R2P that is lost in what it's called and, um, and how then that translates into how it's implemented, how then it's seen as something that is so beyond the reach of so many people. It's seen as something that is owned by member states and that is owned by the UN and then that cannot move to other levels. So I, I, I do believe that the future, um, because of um, the fact that so many people are now more informed than they were before, there are so many ways of, of, of um, putting out information that the, the future it will be determined by how we activate accountability mechanisms um, at the regional level, at the national level, at the community level. And that um, the, 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 in terms of if interpretation of R2P, um, as part of uh, like a social contract um, between people and between um, you know um, the government and, and, and the people is is the way to go and it makes us feel very very strong. And when I'm speaking that way, I'm speaking about um, R to P from the space of even for example in China itself or in any other country in any in Kenya or in any other country that really um, how we then translate accountability. Um, how uh, we we close atrocity uh, prevention gaps is really the key thing that will determine um, the future of R2P. Um, not really um, the, the position of of, of of a member state or member states. So uh, going forward, um, if communities are empowered, then the future of R2P is in their hands. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, now, Special Advisor Smith, uh, would you like to address those questions? Thanks. Yeah, I think uh, I think they were they were very well answered. So I'll maybe just add a few things. And I actually remembered Pinar's second question. So if I'm correct, it was about um, whether there was a kind of perceived or an actual sort of Security Council resistance to having briefings by um, you know either of us special advisors. And I think the answer is yes. Um, because, of course, you know, when you have the special advisor on the prevention of genocide briefing the council, the word genocide is in the room. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's not something which all Security Council members feel comfortable with, with, with any given situation. And so it's something that, you know, the office keeps uh, kind of advocating and saying, you know, we, this is something we would like to do more. We would like to brief the council more, in, in, you know, because our mandate is essentially to make sure that atrocity prevention is always on the table when country situations are being discussed. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, this does not happen very often. And, and that perhaps leads me to the question about you know, ARIA formula meetings, which, which are in fact very useful. And so um, as Special Advisor Dorito has said, you know, they play an important agenda setting role. So it means that the issue is on the agenda. It might not be on the Security Council's official agenda, but it's on the agenda of Security Council members. Um, and so in that sense, it really is very important and people pay attention to that and question, you know, people, when I say people, you know, representatives of member states take notice about who attends the ARIA formula meetings, who says what at the ARIA formula meetings. And of course, they are often attended by members of the Security Council that who would not be happy to have that discussion in the formal Security Council setting. So it's often also a kind of, you know, a, a more informal uh, venue or forum to have discussions that would be perceived as being too sensitive for a formal Security Council discussion. So I absolutely think that they, they, are, they are very, very, very valuable indeed. Um, to Rahel's point about education, I just wanted to add to that, that you know, the office has also been working uh, quite a bit over the last few years with uh, engaging with civil society organizations, especially youth organizations, particularly, uh, and then through them reaching vulnerable uh, groups. You know, We'd also, we'd like to do more, but we're a very small office. So I think that somehow, you know, frustratingly sometimes, uh, you know, limits the amount of work we can do in terms of things like education, which we of course find uh, to be very important. Uh, and then just to James's point, um, 
James, I think you were not in the session this afternoon, but Kate Ferguson asked the same question to the panelists. Um, so maybe I'll steal some of their answers. Um, but no, I think, I think, you know, despite the sometimes negative view of R2P, which I think is somehow is, is often quite dominant in academia as well, I find. You know, there's this kind of doom and gloom around R2P and the future, um, which I personally don't experience to that extent at the UN. And again, if we look at just the vote in the General Assembly, the recent vote, I mean, there were only 14 states, or was it 15, I forget now, but that voted against the resolution, which shows you that there is still very strong support for the principle. Um, and so, you know, perhaps I'm a little bit biased, but I'd like to think that RTP is not going anywhere. And as a special advisor in Deritu has said, it's really about, you know, how all of us ensure that it's implemented, it's operationalized um, at the, especially at the grassroots level and, you know, continuing to work with member states. As we've also discussed, many of them are doing the work. Some of them are a little bit more sensitive to calling it R2P. So it's also, I think, you know, continuing to ensure that the wording is used so that we know this is what we're talking about. And so that when people in Myanmar call for R2P, they understand that it's something which is taken seriously by the international community. Um, so that would be my my answer, my quick answer to that, but I could go on for a long time. Oh, that's great. Thank you very, very much. Um, we have been so fortunate to have um, quite a lot of your time to ask questions today. Um, I just want to check, are there any final comments or questions from anyone in the audience um, for our two speakers, our two special advisors, um, before we come to a close? Um, yes. Um, oh, and, and my apologies, Pino. I have been awful at chat and forgetting about your second question. Um, Karen Smith has played a much better role than I have in that. Uh, would you like to come in again on that? Uh, no problem at all. It has been long two days, very enjoyable, very exciting. And I just wanted to thank you for getting back to my question. Much appreciated. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Um, if, if it's okay then with you, I will. Um, I've used my position as chair to ask one question. Um, across both of your um, talks, you you talked and you mentioned about communities, special advisor and director, you mentioned about that communities have power to protect. And special advisor Smith, you mentioned um, that anyone can change the world. Um, and, and you touched upon the role of the communities in that as well. So I think my question is, and I'm not, I'm not sure if there's a, an easy answer to this, what is how can communities, like we've seen in Myanmar, for example, but maybe not even in that situation, maybe about prevention, how can communities, people on the ground, work with the UN, perhaps your officers or, or elsewhere within the UN, to help prevent mass atrocities, including genocide? What are the practical things um, that communities can do to contribute to this responsibility to protect? Um, special advisor and uh, in, in too, would you like to come in on that first? Yes, I can. Um, I, I'll give a very practical example of um, a lived example. Um, when I was in, in Kenya, after the post election violence in 2007, 2008, um, we came together. Um, I worked for one of the commissions that was created by the Kofi Annan, Grasa Marshall, and the Benjamin Mukabed group. And to our purpose, like we were trying very hard to prevent violence in the next elections. There were quite a number of long-term um, agendas that were being addressed through commissions and all that on things like boundaries and land. But then there were short-term issues um, that were causing um, so much friction, including perpetrators next to, to their victims. And we came together as our commission, plus um, the, uh, which was the government commission, and um, 500, a network of 500 um, NGOs, and the UN, through UNDP at that particular time, and we formed a network. We called it the Wiyano Platform for, 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 for Peace. And that network, just um, what we did was we created uh, response mechanisms at the community level. We distributed funds. We told people to tell us what to just look through the window and tell us what they were seeing. And then the messages would come to a group of conflict analysts. And then those conflict analysts would determine the response. And so very essential partnership brought together 
such key partners. So there is a lot of since I joined the UN, um, I've been around now for around uh, six months. Um, of course, I'm amazed by the reach of the UN. Like the UN is in places like all over the world and um, in villages all over the world. And uh, how much uh, can be done just by working together. Like um, I spoke about UNESCO. Uh, we have um, an MOU, our office within UNHCR on, on refugees. So you can imagine the potential for the kind of things that we, we can do together, like preventing atrocities and, and, and working with um, communities in in, um, in in those kinds of, um, of, of refugee conditions. So like there's so much that can be done and uh, there's so much that's being done. But also there's also another element of the UN, again, as I was saying, that we, we speak a lot about uh, prevention of violence. Uh, we don't speak about prevention of atrocities yet people are preventing atrocities. We have huge departments preventing atrocities and language is not coming in. So these discussions are going on. We are speaking with colleagues and getting those kind of things to be done. But uh, finally, um, the other thing that I have found really powerful since I came on board was um, that we are working a lot with UNDP, especially and UN Women, to empower community-based organizations so that um, then they, they are the implementing agencies of their own ideas, and our work is to facilitate them and to ensure that they get their voices into decision-making rooms. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And special advisor, Karen Smith. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah, just very quickly, I mean, your, your question made me think about, you know, when I was reading for last year's report on, on the role of women in uh, the responsibility to protect, and how, you know, just to give an example, when it comes to early warning, you know, women are so in touch with what is happening in communities. They are able to see when things are changing. They're able to, you know, sense sometimes even that that things are moving in a, in a direction that could potentially be uh, a worrying. And so, you know, making use of, of, of the knowledge that women have in particular, and, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm using women as an example, but I think the same goes for grassroots communities. They know what's happening on the ground. They listen to what their neighbors are saying or, you know, they see suddenly why, why, are, why are these groups of young men meeting, you know, at, at a certain time in a certain place, uh, you know, potentially with weapons. These are all potentially early warning signs. So I think in that way, that's one example of, you know, the very important role that communities can play in, in early warning. And of course, there's the whole whole literature on, on um, civilian self-protection. But again, it reminds me of a meeting I had a couple of months ago with uh, young women activists from Myanmar, uh, you know, while really at the, when it, you know, at the beginning of the protests and, and they were under fire essentially. And of course they had ideas of what the international community could do. They were calling on the security council, but somebody asked them, you know, what do you need right now? And they said, well, we, we need helmets and we need shields. And so I, it's also sometimes those very basic things that people need to be able to protect themselves. But there again, I think what's important is that, you know, these communities and these community organizations need to be supported. So they need to be supported, not just by the UN, but by, by member states as well. So I think, you know, and part of part of fulfilling individual states' uh, responsibility to protect, and, and especially as part of Pillar 2, is really empowering communities and, and supporting them. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I mean, I know... Um, some of our audience might be more familiar than I am, especially about um, the, the role um, played by communities. But I think for a, for a general audience, I think it's really useful to have those insights there. Um, we just had one audience member put their, their hand up. Um, if you don't mind, very, very quickly, if you don't mind, um, I'll, I'll bring you in um, just to ask you a question uh, because we are coming to the end of the session. Uh, Bola, you had your hand up there. We can hear you. Oh, great. Fantastic. I thank you very much, uh, everyone, for the presentations. Uh, I just wanted to um, ask a question a bit related to Nigeria at the moment. Uh, I'm not sure whether um, uh, audience mem uh, members are aware that uh, the, the president of Nigeria's uh, tweet today was removed by 
by Twitter because of um, the, the sort of insight, insightful uh, statements they made regarding the potential of civil war. There is a lot of things going on in Nigeria at the moment, particularly um, uh, not only Boko Haram insurgency in the north, but particularly uh, in the southeast of Nigeria, where there is a brewing insurgency uh, um, and secessionist move movement going on uh, uh, with the Biafran people. And I, I was wondering whether there is a concern about what is going on, particularly in Nigeria, and what efforts are being made at the UN level to sort of uh, uh, stay on, on top of this issue before uh, it really escalates. Uh, and, uh, and how cooperative are the Nigerian um, um, officials? Uh, in terms of um, uh, um, stepping up uh, to 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 their responsibility to protect. Yes, yeah, uh, quite a specific question. Um, Concerning a specific instance, there. Um, I will I will come back to our special advisor and see if you can answer as as, as best you can on that. Um, but I understand it. if not, uh, very I understand. We've only said we'll keep you till half past seven UK time. So. Um, even if it's just a short response there. Uh, Special Advisor Smith, I don't know if you want to just quickly respond to that one. Well, I'm, I'll just be very quick because I think I'll, I'll leave this question to uh, Special Advisor in Derry to if she wants to respond because, of course, she, she worked in Nigeria as well, so she has a very good understanding of, of the situation um, and has been following it at the UN as well. And I, I mean, I just want to say that, of course, the situation in Nigeria is, is of concern. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a developing situation and I think it's quite a complex situation as well. Um, and so I don't know if she can say more, but, you know, it is, of course, something that the UN is paying attention to. It's, sometimes it's difficult for us to, to kind of, you know, give details about what exactly is, is happening at the moment and, you know, who, who's doing what. Um, but it is certainly something which is, is, is being looked at. So, of course. No, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Special Advisor Andrew, too. Um, to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think Special Advisor Karen. Uh, um, completely summarized um, uh, what what's going on in my mind there. When the was asked, that uh, we need more context on what's going on. Like for example, I didn't see the tweet and the and how it was deleted. So we would have to check into that. And uh, I know Nigeria quite well. Uh, I've um, lived and worked there for several years. And uh, it, it's um, Nigeria is a complex country because on the one hand we we have a country whose um, the GDP of of, of Lagos is. Um, actually much higher than the GDP of many countries, um, um, including Kenya, unless Kenya has caught up. And at the same time, then, of course, you have um, the issues to do with Boko Haram and, of course, the issues to do with the Southeast. So it's something that I would like to look into and maybe have a follow-up conversation with the person who has the question. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. I'd just like to take this opportunity now to say thank you very much and show our appreciation for both of our speakers, both special advisors, for joining us today um, in a relatively unprecedented panel, I'm aware. Um, I know that you do appear together on occasion, but to present as part of a panel as the, uh, such as this um, is, um, is, is quite unique. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm sure we'll all applaud. <laughs> and um, I'd just like to say, um, at the moment, we are going to move on to a publishing workshop. Um, the live stream will come to an end um, now, and we'll take a very short break um, and come back uh, to discuss publishing um, within uh, academia and perhaps pick up on, on some of the points that our special advisor Karen Smith said there. Thank you both of you um, for your time. Really engaging, uh, very interesting indeed. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Patrick. Okay, thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you very much, everyone.